What's up guys? It's yo boy Oma Sensei. Welcome to Star Wars Reborn as Anakin Skywalker Part 4. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. Within the Jedi Medical Center, John Doe was peacefully sleeping within his comatose state and was all alone, isolated from everything and everybody else that needs medical care. If someone who was Force-sensitive and is trained within the Force were to be here, they would notice something was off. A pull that indicated that something was using the energy within their area. But no one was here to witness this event. It was also not powerful enough to alert anyone of its presence. John Doe within his comatose state was actually starting to stir. Everything about him had been documented by the Jedi, from his appearance to medical abnormalities, and even any scaring he has, so they could better identify him in the future. That is if he escaped because for all reasons John Doe may very well be sent back to Tatooine for some form of execution. The more vocally bloodthirsty subjects of Tatooine would certainly want something like that, and the Senate would properly agree. Eyes opening, heavy breathing and feeling weak all over, John Doe leaps to his feet and scrambles around the room, while being confused at his restraints. They were limiting him, but it was not something he would usually be unable to get out of with some help from the Force. Breaking things as he tries to regain his bearings, he is slightly intoxicated with all the drugs pumped into his system. Where am I? John Doe thought to himself as he could see through his blurry vision, that the place he was currently within, had a lot of weird equipment. Looking towards another corner there was even a back to tank, something that was incredibly expensive to have. Not that the price all that mattered to John Doe, he could basically get away with having anything he wanted free of charge of course, thanks to his gifts. Stumbling around John Doe drags himself successfully outside of the facility, and is somehow unnoticed throughout the temple. It was as if he was coded in some sort of invisibility that cloaks him from the view of the Jedi. A long walk did John Doe have to go through as he was guided by an alluring voice spread throughout the Force, calling to him quietly and softly, as if it was his salvation. He began seeing things, hallucinations as of high on drugs because he was, and a combination of the effects from the self-imposed poisoning. Now he was stable enough to go towards his lord, his master, of whom had taken him in and cared for his well-being but also the cruelty he had been taught and become accustomed to. Master, he thought within himself, now exiting the Jedi Temple free from his current captors. He makes his way towards the Senate in his delirious stat, paying no mind to any bystanders he hurriedly pushes them over, while making his way restrained. Restricted as he is, it would seem that this didn't stop him from movement, and was quite skilled in maneuvering himself towards the Senate. Master, John Doe starts to scream out loud, but everyone out late at night keeps a distance from the madman. Master, John Doe repeatedly calls out and is stopped by some guards outside the Senate building. After a while Palpatine is informed of the disturbance, and is called over to see that his captured subordinate had how somehow escaped. To deal with him, Palpatine decides to bring him in as quietly as possible, before he creates even more of a ruckus, drawing attention towards him, and possibly connecting to himself. John Doe is brought before his master, Darth Sidious. Master, you have come for me. John Doe said while in restraints that had been reinforced and currently being held back by the Red Guard Palpatine had created. I see that you have come in quite the desperate state. Palpatine considered his options about what to do with the man. Master, I have successfully done what you have said. I have freed the hut known as Jabba. John Doe practically spits all over the floor with drool coming from his mouth. Through willpower alone and maybe perhaps the Force does he still stay conscious and sane enough to speak semi-coherently. I have heard of your supposed success and of your failure as well. Darth Sidious is reminded of this fact every time he looks at the pathetic worm on the floor. My lord, I am sorry that I was unable to fully do everything you had told me to do. John Doe continues. It is best I safely dispose of this garbage. After having considered his options he decided it would be best to be rid of him. But he usually doesn't take care of the dirty work himself, and would get someone else to do so. No, of course I would not punish you for such a flaw. I think no I believe it would be best for you to go on another mission. Palpatine decides that sending the man on a suicide mission would be for the best. Dead at the hands of another, and who better than the young Skywalker. He had started to become quite the nuisance to his plans. Not that they still weren't going his way, it was just he had become more petty, and started to develop a desire to take him as a potential apprentice for his replacement of Darth Tyrannus. Darth Tyrannus was after all not fully committed to the dark side, not fully committed to him, so it would only make sense to get rid of him as well. Given that the young Padawan had dealt with his agent before and had successfully apprehended him, Palpatine thinks it would be best to put the boy to the test. He wouldn't let his agent go without further empowering him a bit more to give him an edge against the opponent he had not been able to overcome. A special ritual to transform my agent into a walking suicide bomb, ready to go off at my command. Palpatine thought insidiously and laced with malicious intent decided it was time to put the boy's character to the test. Would Anakin kill his agent if forced into a position like that, or would he refrain and get himself and others harmed because of his hesitation. Because the Jedi would tell him to do so. Working twofold this would bring Anakin closer and closer to wanting to leave the Jedi Order and potentially easier to persuade the boy to join him. 
but for now it would take a lot of time to go so far. My agent, I think I have the right mission just for you. In his delirious state John Doe would be unable to recognize what Palpatine intends to do, and would follow anything he says. My lord, I would do anything for your forgiveness. He rambles after Palpatine's order. Palpatine's smile curls into a wicked grin reminiscent of a Cheshire cat that was looking upon its prey. Good, good. He taps his old fingers against the table he was sitting on, and looking out towards what would become his. No, it has already become all mine. The Jedi Temple had been alerted to their escape prisoner. It wasn't exactly chaos because the Jedi preach against it. But that didn't mean that the temple wasn't in a state on unrest, because of the potential danger. John Doe having escaped had given the Jedi another wake-up call. That would go unnoticed yet again. The droid attack on the temple didn't change them, so why would this? Especially when it was only one person, presumably steeped in the dark side, but still one person against the entirety of the Order. In fact, a Padawan was enough to apprehend him, then why wouldn't another be able to do the same? Of course this is flawed logic, given that the person who had done so was Anakin, and he is tears above them. But no one would say that was the reason. It was a very detrimental way of thinking, but that is what the Jedi are. Fundamentally flawed, Anakin. He had become aware of a visitor. In fact he was interested in the fact that he could in particular feel her presence amongst everyone else is much easier, because he would have to use at least a bit more concentration to do so. Smiling Anakin greet her back. Isla. She had just gotten back from a mission she had went on. You didn't tell me you were going. You also did not do so. Anakin replied. Pouting, she replies. Well. I didn't know and had to leave on short notice. How surprising that is the exact same for me. Anakin countered, but still had a smile on his face. So how did your mission go then? Well, I just had to rescue some people is all. The usual. She had some hints of pride within her voice. As if reading her thoughts Anakin says. Helped your people did you? Dumbfounded, she replied. How did you know? A magician never tells their secrets. Even if he didn't exactly know how he could read her thoughts so easily himself. Is that right? Isla now has a cheeky grin on her face. I think I could tell what you have been up to as well. And what is that then? Anakin decides to take her up on her challenge. If you manage to tell me anything of major importance I will reward with a favor, a singular favor. Now even more excited than before, she asks. Really? Yes. Anakin confirms. As if thinking she starts to dig deep into herself as she had noticed more and more the strange occurrences seen to enable and empower her more so than they did before. She was a decent force sensitive, but through her connection with Anakin, she had noticed an increase in capability. Even more so, she had learned to harness this unique foresight to see through the eyes of Anakin, and was able to do so much more with it. Like look into some memories or events of the past, of course memories or events that aren't heavily guarded by Anakin's mental defenses. Nonetheless she would be able to with time to be able to see even that, but she doesn't know that and neither does Anakin for now. All Isla knows is that she could see into bits and pieces of his past. Let's see here. Isla had her eyes closed. What is this? Something about some kind of treaty between the planets of Tatooine and Naboo through an alliance forged by marriage. I think you will have to try harder than that. That has become semi-public knowledge by this point in time. Anakin said, thinking it was unfair, because she didn't actually know of this, she threw it to the back of her mind trying to make sure she won this little competition. Isla thought the reward was too much to pass up on. Digging even deeper she tries to see something and is able to make out something weird. What is this? She thinks to herself before telling Anakin. Well something that had recently happened before I have come back was you were going through some type of surgery, and her face was starting to become furrowed. And you were in pain. Grimacing, she continued, in so much pain. But you continued going and I believe you can stop right there. Anakin breaks her out of her trance. How the hell could she see that? Anakin was very confused, but at the same time concerned for her well-being. Are you alright? Taking a breath she responds. Yes, I am fine. I am just a little confused as to what I had seen. She knows that it had to be Anakin's view, his perspective and feelings at the time of what was happening. Do you have something to tell me? She questions and looks him up and down then starts to notice something else. When did you become taller yet again? I have nothing in particular to say, and yes I have become taller. Anakin replied making sure to try and continue to redirect the line of conversation she had done so herself. You are growing very fast. Isla became distracted for a moment as she stared into his eyes before coming back down to earth. Wait a minute. Don't try to take away from my question. I would like to know what I saw. You have seen something I would have liked for you not to see. Anakin replied as he felt compelled to not lie as if he could trust her more for some reason. He obviously disliked telling people everything about him, and it wasn't just because he was so greedy he would even hoard himself. No, there are some valid reasons to do so, especially the fact that according to his theory of being the combination of two souls to make an entirely new one comes into play. Well, I have seen it now so you should just spill the beans. Isla said being concerned herself, not necessarily angry or upset. I guess it wouldn't hurt I will only talk about myself going through the secret genetic manipulation though. Anakin thought to himself considering his options. Alright, I will tell you of what you saw was. Now that I think about it, how the hell did she find that out? Considering that the Force was very well damn near capable of bending and shaping reality, 
according to its wishes or the wishes of its users, he shouldn't really be too surprised. I will look into this however. Anakin thought to himself as he then came clean to Isla about him going through an experimental genetic modification meant to make himself physically stronger. Of course there are other benefits to such a thing, but the most prominent was the physical aspect. He didn't want to go into the detail as such, because he worried she would try to stop him because of the pain it could cause. In fact he may very well be unable to have children as a result. How horrible. Isla said aware that he was not providing her with everything, but was actually a little happy he shared this with her. Thank you for trusting me. She smiled and did something quite bold. She embraced him. Surprised by the surprise hug, Anakin was a bit stumped because somehow even he didn't see this coming. His mind reading abilities had blanked out at this second as if the force did this on purpose, making sure to catch him off guard. All right, all right. Anakin pats her back and soothingly replies, sealing the next stage of the relationship that had been held back by Isla's indoctrination by the Jedi. It would seem however she has taken the next steps to embracing her emotions more, even if she was unsure herself what they were. The knighting ceremony was the ceremony in which a Jedi Padawan or apprentice was made into a full Jedi Knight. An ancient ritual, it was presided over by members of the Jedi High Council or of the other three councils, and led by the Grand Master. This ceremony could be repeated for a knight who achieved the rank of master. To go through with the knighting ceremony, first one would have to complete the trials. Today we have gathered here to grant upon these two Jedi their rightful promotions, their new positions as Jedi. The Jedi High Council had come together today to commemorate the achievements of two individuals. These two people had been recognized by the Jedi Council as having achieved something great on their last mission and would be granted a new status. One of these two was an individual known as Quinlan Vos, and the other was his young apprentice Isla Sakura who would be promoted to a Jedi Knight at the young age of 19. While her master Quinlan Vos would go from another Jedi Knight to a legitimate master. Jedi Knight Quinlan Vos, you have shown and demonstrated skill and wisdom beyond your position, and for this the Council have decided it is your time to become a master. The people who were present were Yoda, the Grand Master and three other members. These Jedi Masters being Plo Koon, Yaddle and Deba Balaba. The Grand Master Yoda decided to take center stand. Jedi Knight Vos, selfless actions continue have done. For this I believe, the Jedi believe ready you are to become a master. Yoda says granting him his new official title. Quinlan does the correct ceremonial response. Yoda moves on from Isla's teacher into herself. Padawan Sakura, many troubles come across you have. Many triumphs you have also had completed the trials the council believes. Your master believes. Overcome the dark you have shown completion of the trial of skill. Yoda continues. Completion of the trial of courage, trial of flesh, trial of the spirit and the trial of insight. For this Jedi Knight you shall be. Yoda finishes now granting Isla her new official and formal rank of Jedi Knight. After this event takes place everyone would go back to doing whatever they were doing with Isla going to Anakin. Those going. Who knows where and the other masters that officiated the mission go back to their council business. Or whatever business they had after this was done. Looks like I have been promoted to a Jedi Knight. Isla said to Anakin who was within the training room along with Ahsoka and Barris doing their own things. Barris was meditating herself while Ahsoka was having some fun with the droids, specifically training her very minimal lightsaber skills. Anakin smiles towards Isla. Congratulations, I am happy for your achievement. Thank you. Isla cutely smiled back. And while this was going on Barris within her corner was staring jealously at the two. Who does she think she is? I knew Anakin first. Obviously Barris was unaware of what emotion she was feeling. And all she knew was that it made her feel bitter. She was also much more detached now than before. And was more prone to accepting herself and her emotions. So she did not necessarily shun or shut this down. But she definitely will not try and project this feeling. Anakin will still notice though. He always does. Well, how could he not when has practically be using these abilities since he was a baby? It was becoming increasingly harder for him to control it. Because if he were to put it in gaming terminology, it had become passive, meaning there was no on and off switch. Barris had noticed they seemed much more intimate than they did before. As if something had changed in the relationship between the two, and she didn't like it because of the feeling she had. As for Ahsoka, she didn't really feel this way even if she too had noticed the change for she was only 7 turning 8. But that didn't mean she was ignorant. She knew a thing or two, and would always try and hog as much time as she could with Anakin. It was not like Anakin was turning her away or not giving her attention, but she had grown attached, something that the Jedi tried to prevent. But it will always happen. Not unless you are some kind of hermit. A knock was heard on the door before someone entered, that someone being Jedi Master Shakti. Well, what do we have here? Barris got up from her meditation, Ahsoka went towards Anakin, while Isla put a little bit of distance between herself and Anakin, because it could be misconstrued as inappropriate. Anakin was nonchalant as he couldn't care too much about being seen with anyone in a position that could be taken the wrong way. That wasn't his problem, but the problem of the person getting it wrong. Hello Master T. Anakin greeted and after he did so the others said their own greetings as well. Well, it seems that you have quite the varied group of friends here Skywalker. Shark said seeing the situation. I guess I do. Anakin replied. Moving away from that subject, Shark says. Anyway, I have come to inform you of some Something very special. Shark pauses to build some anticipation. And that would be. Anakin asks. Your promotion to a Jedi Knight of course. Shark T drops the bomb and the girls in the room all have their own reactions. Ahsoka is confused but also happy while Barris is a little bitter. While at the same time excited for Anakin and the most conflicted was Isla is while she is also excited or happy for him she is also thinking internally. I was just promoted to a knight and Anakin here is younger than me. 
and has only been on one mission. Seeing the expressions on everyone's faces, it would seem no one was expecting this. Shark T said, I kind of expected this. Anakin thought internally before saying, I don't believe I have completed all of the trials yet. Or at least I haven't been informed yet that I will become one right away. That is true, some on the council are apprehensive about allowing this. So a grueling test has been created just for you. Shark T responded, Your trials will be overseen, but most if not every council member possible. It will also be likely your masters, Qui-Gon Jinn and Mace Windu, will be involved. I could kind of guess that was going to happen. Anakin said, The date of this event should be sometime next month, and now that my message has been delivered, what have you all been up to? Shark T said as if she were trying to imply something. Master T, we were doing nothing at all, just discussing things about lightsaber techniques and the like. Isla scrambled to make an excuse up now that things had escalated again. Lightsaber techniques, is it? Shark questions. Nodding her head furiously, Isla confirms not realizing that Shark T had a teasing nature. Yes. You must practice a lot then I imagine very often with Skywalker yes. Shark T said. Of course, we go at it a lot of the time. After coming back from the mission I was assigned, we have practically been at it every day. The insinuation went right over Isla's head, and so did it for Ahsoka and Barris as well. Right, I thank you Master T for your time. Anakin decides to put an end to her teasing before anyone catches on. Trying to get me to leave now are you? Want to get back to your saber training, do you? Shark says suggestively once again going over everyone else's head other than Anakin. We do dash Isla tries to respond, but is cut off by Anakin as he once again tries to get Shark to leave politely. I think that is enough, don't you see there are children around? Anakin says to the confusion of the girls not including Shark. Okay, I can see that I am disturbing something, and it seems that Skywalker here seems to disagree with my presence. Shark plays up for some pity or sympathy so she could stay. Being the oldest, Isla assumes control over Anakin and allows her. Yes, you may stay. Well, I won't be too bothered by her stay, as long as she doesn't try anything funny. Anakin was aware that Shark T may try something suspicious, but didn't mind it too much considering her isolationist behavior. Surely, by being so closed off it affects her state of mind and ability to think, not to mention the emotional impact that could have in the end however there are always exceptions to the rule, and she clearly was one, so she may not need a close relationship with anyone. Padawan Skywalker, why don't you have a spa with me? I would like to test my skills against a form that I don't get to test all so often. Shark offers. Anakin takes her up on the offer. Sure, I don't mind proving that I am better at combat, leaving no room for any more back and forth banter he dives in using the perfected form by that Mace had created. Isla having seen this fight would go on to continue watching, while Ahsoka would go back to her corner and practice her basics, because Anakin was adamant in her becoming perfect in even that. While Barris having mostly nothing to do went back to meditation. Barris did secretly think to herself however, yes, score, with Master T here to distract Anakin, would he and Isla no longer be close to each other? She took her victory, no matter how small it was. Today we have gathered here to test whether or not Padawan Skywalker has the capacity to become a Jedi Knight, when in an official setting, it was here that Qui-Gon and Mace were not able to determine whether he would pass or not. No matter what they would say or report it was now up to the other masters on the council. Can't be biased now could they? An audience had actually been accrued due to some of the infamy Anakin has built within the temple and outside of it as well. There were many interested parties here to see the progress of a very great prodigy, strange in his development, his methods and intellect, great enough to help build a business and forethought, to help a slave rebellion, that somehow put him on the throne. Many people look at Anakin and see someone of either great talent or great fortune and luck. In fact, all of the council members that could be present were present. Of course Qui-Gon and Mace were here to not only fully confirm their own judgments and put to rest their own reservations, but also participate in the test. Everyone gathered here today have requested to see what the Jedi are capable of through the efforts and exploits of one of our recently joined members. The youngest and perhaps most talented is to perform some trials today to evaluate his performance. A Jedi announcer said, not one of the masters themselves or anyone well known. This was done because of the entertainment for their guests. But it would also become an example of what the Jedi are capable of. Some of what was pushed for here today was slightly manipulated through Palpatine, because of his interest in the young Skywalker. But he also wanted to see his progress in other things as well. Just how well does the supposed chosen one perform? Others within the Senate had also taken this opportunity to see a person of great interest within their current political climate. Some of their motives were either between benevolent or downright malevolent. Being broadcasted to everyone, Palpatine wanted for the world to see the power someone whom is force sensitive could possess. But he also wanted to put pressure on the child. This was in hopes that it would make him slip up and resort to using the dark side of the force unintentionally. From what Palpatine currently understands is that the boy is learning under two masters Mace Windu and Qui-Gon, unorthodox in practice, but this only opened up even greater opportunities for Palpatine. If only Anakin was actually a child, one without experience, without maturity or even without the simple knowledge that he possessed of Palpatine's insidiousness. Among the spectators other than including the usual Jedi Masters and Palpatine, there was Isla, Ahsoka and Barriss seated within their own group. Looking all around people would also be able to spot many, many Jedi spread throughout this event. Another factor to account among the crowd was that some business moguls and other political figures were here to watch the event. Why did this have to become a spectacle? Anakin was against such a display, especially when it didn't really help him gain anything. In in fact he was seething inside that Sidious had done this because now he would be unable to receive any money. The more greedy side of himself wanted every metaphorical cent. But it would be impossible to monetize for himself as anything made from the viewing will either go towards the Senate and or the Jedi. Equally split halfway at least between the two. 
What this event would lead to supposedly was the Republic gaining even greater trust with the Senate and Jedi. But it would only have the opposite effect for the Jedi. While temporarily the Jedi may get a boost in reputation, others may start to see and maybe even fear the power the Jedi wield. But the Order would not see this. This is exactly what Palpatine is hoping and has planned for. Ladies, gentlemen and all those in between, I introduce to you our star for this event. The Jedi announcer introduces, Anakin Skywalker, Jedi Padawan. The crowd doesn't burst into cheers, except those who are young within the audience, and those who were very close to Anakin. Most of the older Jedi are more indoctrinated or just overall, not that interested in this event, only applauded on instinct with some clapping. Other political and economical figures followed suit in a more calm approach to the topic. And now for our first event, the announcer said, the trial of skill. Now that everything had been set up and Anakin had been introduced to the crowd to whoever within the Republic was watching, they could officially start. And now for our first event, the announcer said, the trial of skill. The trial of skill was one of the oldest trials in the battery of tests preferred by the Order. While the test did consist of numerous displays of lightsaber technique, the main thing that the Battlemaster looked for when judging a potential knight was their ability to avoid distraction through self-discipline. Walking into the setup arena, Anakin is now being shown to the galaxy. Everyone had become quiet as to hear what the announcer had to say. The Jedi do not usually do this and in fact do not conduct trials like this altogether. The announcer continued to give some trivia. Before its formalization, the trial was made up of acrobatic feats, while using the force to levitate objects in the midst of storms. A three-part assessment addressing physical, mental, and combat challenges will take place. The standard physical challenges included a test of climbing, heights, endurance, escape, and leaping. The mental challenges which followed tested skill with levitation, a second endurance test, duress, and reflection. Anakin would then go on to complete the physical and mental challenges easily, given that there was not much opposing forces against him. The last part of the trial required a student to face off against some form of adversary, though the individual or individuals they faced varied in species or allegiance, and could be made of flesh and blood or a clever simulacrum created from archived data. The tests of conflict, dueling, and of the calm mind pitted Padawans against droids, other students, the Temple Battlemaster, or even the Grandmaster, and outlast their attacks. What a performance. Young Padawan Skywalker was easily able to pass through the first two parts of the trial of skills, but now he will have to compete against another Jedi. The Jedi announcer said then continued, will he be going against the Batmaster? Will he go up against the Grandmaster himself? Yoda speaks up here taking over from their announcer. Padawan Skywalker face an opponent you must. Two main opponents you will today face, but first are the Padawans you will go against. Anakin was given a training lightsaber because he was to face off multiple supposed enemies that are younger than him, those of whom would have been considered his peers. But even though their ages are around the same or are exactly so, that doesn't mean they were a match for him. So a one-on-one -on -one duel would be considered unfair. After having everyone lined up, Anakin was on the opposing side. The other Padawans were in their own corner as well before the fight would begin, among them included some random Padawans not well known within his memory. Begin. Yoda called having needed to be the overseer of this fight. The fight didn't last very long because Anakin was able to easily outskill them. But considering they were just normal Jedi students it makes sense. Defeated your peers you had. Face a battle master now you must. Yoda said as his first opponent made himself known by jumping down into the arena. It was Jedi Master Sindralik. Padawan Skywalker, I do hope you impress me. Sindralik said. Anakin replies, I do hope so as well. Having known all of the candidates that he would face, at the top of the list was Sindralik, the current battle master. Anakin had learned a thing or two when it came to saber combat from him. He had succeeded Dooku who was known to be an excellent duelist, so this fight should be fun. This time Anakin was not using a practice saber and neither was Sindralik. Both ignited their sabers getting ready to engage each other. No order was given to begin and they went at it. Anakin was using the signature style Mace had passed on to him, since no doubt others could learn a thing or two if they watched closely. Dralig was instructed by Yoda himself, and would make a formidable opponent. They exchanged their first strikes testing the waters. Dralig's movements were fast, very fast that with each blow, Anakin would have had trouble keeping up with if he wasn't prepared, or had the abilities to overcome his opponent. Anakin had wanted to put on a display since, even though he wouldn't be making any direct money from this, he would Atlas do so indirectly. Dralig had developed his own unique style of lightsaber combat calling upon the force to enhance his speed, and relying on unconventional and unpredictable movements. Dralig had mastered all seven forms of lightsaber combat, and his understanding and knowledge of each form was outstanding enough that he was considered the most prolific lightsaber instructor in the temple, second only to Yoda himself. This didn't pose too much of a problem for Anakin, as he too had trained extensively with other forms. In fact a special eighth form had been in the works, but it is incomplete for now. The duel between the two lasts for a while because while Anakin overall is stronger, the Battlemaster still has more experience than him, thus making the battle go longer. Still Anakin wanted to test out the seventh form even when he won't taunt his opponent. After a while, Yoda called out. That is enough. The battle had finished, or more like had ended in a draw between the two, and Anakin's next opponent will test him. Dralig steps outside the arena and who is up next is not known to the crowd. But Anakin can see the future to a much greater capacity, even since learning or more like copying the unique Shatterpoint's ability Mace had. It was Yoda himself. Opponent I will be, test your skill for myself I will see. Yoda said as everyone was roaring with excitement at seeing the illustrious Grandmaster in combat. Anakin does a respectful bow, knowing that while he may be able to kill Yoda, if he wanted he would be unable to beat him into submission. It is always harder to knock out your foe than to kill them, because control is not a factor in situations like that. Yoda's diminutive frame should not be taken at face value. The Force can still allow those even though they are older in their years, to become 
strong enough to defeat those who may have more energy, and are younger than them. A green lightsaber is emitted from Yoda, while Anakin ignites his blue lightsaber again not intending to use both just yet. Again, no signal was given, and the two were at it with Yoda being very nimble jumping and exchanging blows with Anakin. But if one was able to see they would identify that Yoda would most of the time lose out in those moments. Anakin's strength and speed was greater, and even though Yoda was more skilled and experienced, he couldn't win against Anakin in a duel like this. So Yoda changed up the way he fights Anakin by resorting to keeping his distance as much as possible. Within these battles neither participant is meant to use force abilities like telekinesis, but empowering your own body is allowed. Another strike is exchanged between the two, and this duel becomes another prolonged fight between the two. After a while, Anakin had been defeated, but the duel between the two nearly ended in a draw. This only showed Anakin that he wasn't quite prepared or ready yet, when it came to things like this. But he knew with time he would only get better. Well, what an amazing display of skill. The announcer voiced the thought of everyone within the crowd and possibly the public, not that most of them even knew anything when it came to lightsaber combat. Within the arena, Anakin was bowing towards Yoda as a sign of respect. Master Yoda, I think that I could have had you there. Chuckling a bit Yoda replied, nearly you did. While everyone was finished with their own thoughts and the crowd had died down, the next trial would begin. Anakin did not need to complete the trial of courage, as he has already shown such qualities before. With him leaving the temple ages ago to help the slave on Tatrine, that showed his courage even if it went against the wishes of the order. Or one would only need to look at how he performed on Tatrine, facing off against a dark side user and successfully capturing him. Unfortunately, they had not seen their prisoner since, but the Jedi were on the hunt for John Doe. The trial of the flesh was the most trying test given at the temple, involving the apprentice overcoming great physical pain, hardship, or loss. The test sometimes resulted in death or dismemberment. Throughout history, the trial was known to involve bloodshed of some form. The announcer did start it again. The trial of flesh. Not everyone was aware of what exactly this was, but going off of the name itself, they should be able to tell what it involves. What have the Jedi prepared for me here? Anakin would not be going through having his hand chopped off to complete this trial. He saw a trend with the High Council deciding to use the trials of the old Jedi Order here, and given that it didn't go against them or their code to do so, they accepted this proposition. This means that now Anakin has to deal with the consequences knowing full well they may never do something like this again. The young Padawan Skywalker must now pass this test. But I am sure from everyone's expressions that most are unaware of what this exactly entails. I am also sure those who are watching from a device would also be unaware of this trial. The announcer said. Deciding to give a brief history lesson the announcer continued. At the height of the Piasty era, the Order subjected its apprentices to bursts of energy applied directly to the skin, known as the burning. While this type of torture was abandoned by the Order, battle scars were accepted as passage during the new Sith Wars. Today, Skywalker will have to go through the burning just as those of old have gone through. These bastards are quite sadistic aren't they? Anakin thought to himself, fuming but not all too worried about it, considering he has gotten used to pain before. An example being how he went through those surgeries with no drug to help him and only his willpower. Today we will not go to the same extent those of the old did, but it will be to a similar consequences. The announcer continued, The burning was the name given to a form of torture that consisted of the repeated use of a blaster, set at a low power level to slowly sear the flesh of an individual's body down to the bone. So the process began, but given that Anakin has such high natural defenses against most weaponry because of his nano suit, he had to deactivate it for a while. What they had designed would be used to specifically burn him alive in a sense, not unlike what happened to the original Vader, but here it would only be an intense heat meant to knock him unconscious. If Anakin is able to pass this test, he would be one step closer to becoming a knight. Having gained our initial understanding of the device, Anakin decides he will not be turning his nano suit off as it could help him. No one knows of his suit's full capabilities, so he would use it to his utmost advantage to kind of cheat the system. Who likes pain after all? But he would at least have to act it out. Having been put into the microwave he means heating capsule, Anakin starts to feel the heat as everyone else who wanted to tune in watch him burn. What great entertainment. Anakin thought to himself. The crowd watched in anticipation and some of the more sadistic of people enjoyed the show. Not knowing that Anakin didn't feel any pain at all, and was quite cozy and comfortable. He didn't want to worry anyone about what he was going through, but started to yell out loud, Son of a monkey. Anakin shouted while lacing his voice in pain, while simultaneously trying to keep it PG friendly, while thinking, who would let their children watch this better safe than sorry, don't want to traumatize anyone, mother fathers. Anakin once again shouted, Melon's beard. When nearing the end, Anakin decided to throw something out there that most wouldn't think too much about. Yeah, a wizard Ari, he said with an accent, but doing so with some fake pain. Anakin could also guess as to what Palpatine was thinking, something along the lines of, yes, yes. The Jedi are creating the doom, or something like that. After everything was over, most people were not that worried, but the girls that Anakin frequented with were very worried for his safety. They didn't know about the full capacities of his nano suit even if they know about. Sighing internally, Anakin thinks to himself, well, I can just reassure them later. Not that he cared all too much about how exactly they would feel, given those feelings weren't his, but it would be remiss of him to ignore them. Great. Our young hero seems to be doing just fine meaning that the next trial will begin. The announcer said and it would seem as if it was starting to turn into some sort of sport. Most of the politicians and business moguls were quite amazed at having to see the capabilities a Jedi, no a force sensitive could have. In particular they were amazed at Anakin, 
but there was not much they could do now, most probably not even afterwards as well. The trial of the spirit, the announcer hypes up the crowd and those watching, the money they were making was quite a lot through ad revenues and the like, the trial of the spirit, to pass the trial of the spirit apprentices had to look deep within their souls on a quest of self-discovery. This test was designed to pit a potential knight against their most dangerous enemy, the darkness within themselves. While Anakin had known of his darkness but he had not really been confronted about it, he considered this as a sign that he has control over it. On Ireland he was faced with both sides of the extreme versions of himself, the one totally dedicated to the light and the other totally dedicated to the dark. This process would be personal, so they would not be able to broadcast something like this. Anakin would not like to do so, but thankfully he would just be entering a meditative state of being to complete this trial. That is what or how it is usually done anyway. I am afraid to inform the crowd that while the trial of the spirit is being done, there would not be much action to see. The announcer continued. In fact it could take a few hours to complete depending on the Padawan in question. So for now, I will hand over what will be happening next to the Jedi around here to see their opinions and the opinions of others within the crowd about what has taken place. The announcer said, Of course we will not be doing just interviews, but we'll be setting up various shows to entertain the people as our protagonist of this event goes through his fourth trial. The announcer finished here. The ultra-personal details of the test, it is one that not even the High Council dare dictate. A Padawan must write the script for what will transpire on the journey. Because of the dangers of such deep meditation, a master was always present to help guide a student back after they push them past, where they least desired to go in their thoughts. The worst that could happen following a failed trial is awakening from meditation screaming and mentally broken. Anakin was seated within the spotlight, but for now the cameras would not be on him, or at least would not be focusing on him as he is supposed to meditate. While meditating, instead of coming across any hidden devils within, what he instead discovers is a weird link, a connection between himself and Isla. He is otherwise quickly drawn away from this however because of another pull from within towards another direction. This leads to him discovering shatter points within himself, showing multiple versions or timelines of events that could happen, and one of them showed him being attacked. The figure that was revealed to him was of the dark side, that much he could make out. His features however were lacking, and he could only see that it was a male of some kind, everything about him was twisted to the extreme. Well, I guess the events going to take place within the next hour or so will be interesting. Anakin thought to himself. Meanwhile within the crowd of spectators, the three girls of whom had become close to Anakin during his stay here as a Jedi, were conversing amongst each other. People within the backdrop were also discussing various things. The business moguls, the politicians and even the Jedi from young and old seemed to be having a good time. When will Arnie be finished? Ahsoka said to the other two within their small group. Well, at this rate he could be going on for another hour simply because he has to do meditation. Isla spoke having the authority over the three due to the age and rank difference. I think he will finish faster. Barris responds to no one in particular, but what she was really doing was directing this towards Isla in an attempt to prove she supports Anakin more than she does. Chardish, but it does get her point across. Isla is not unaware of her supposed competition, but she doesn't think she would have any, considering she was obviously the better choice of course. But why would these two Jedi, whom are known to be against stuff like this even show this kind of behavior? They don't? But it is subtle enough that an exchange happens between the two, while Ahsoka is none the wiser. While the three were having their conversation, moving over to another two people who were also discussing some things. These two being the Jedi Masters Qui-Gon Jinn and Mace Windu. What do you think? Mace asked. What do I think of what? Qui-Gon answered with a question. How has a young apprentice been doing so far? Mace answered back with a clarified answer. Humming to himself before continuing, Qui-Gon says. His performance so far has been very good, excellent if not perfect in his approach. Qui-Gon says thoughtfully, he was almost a match against Master Yoda, the boy is definitely something. Mace speaks about Anakin's lightsaber prowess. You have taught him well, Master Windu. Qui-Gon compliments. Well, I believe we have both taught him well. Mace replies. Qui-Gon just nods at this comment before continuing. Going back to the topic of whether or not I believe Anakin has done a good job, I would say yes. In my opinion he could still work on a few things, but it would seem that he has mostly surpassed us. Mace also thinks the same way and responds. Yes, that is a good summary of how I feel about the subject. Again, as these two Jedi Masters were having their own talk about the current event, so too was Palpatine stewing within his own thoughts. His own plans, actions and his current predicament of having to entertain those around him. Stupid politicians and corporations trying to come in on my scheme. Palpatine had been here for the entire event cataloging Anakin's progress, and was pleasantly surprised by the boy's talents. He will most definitely make a good Sith apprentice. Palpatine thought to himself as he was staring rather intensely at the meditative form of Anakin. Every now and then he would be bothered, but within the force he was trying to work his way in, to see if he could gather any readings on the boy's current progress within the trial of the spirit. He was looking for a way to infiltrate and maybe influence the boy some more. He has already created enough reason as is. Why not try and create more? Palpatine doesn't second guess his decisions, and would likely go through with his plan to fully take Anakin under his metaphor wings. Supreme Chancellor, I was hoping to meet with you, and someone was talking to him as he needed his full concentration on another task. Palpatine needed to multitask doing multiple things at once. Also given that the Jedi are there he would be unable to make any progress at all, as he could alert them to his presence. Not that they would be capable in actually finding him, given his ability to maneuver around them for so long. Yes, yes, I am sorry to inform you, but I am currently very busy right now. Now, if you may leave me alone, Palpatine answered in his best diplomatic voice. Oh why well of course Supreme Chancellor, I would never interfere with your business. 
The random stranger said interpreting correctly that Palpatine wanted to be left alone right now. Approximately 15 minutes had passed by, and everyone was still relatively engaged in the event. Most were by now off doing their own things waiting for Anakin to awaken from his slumber. But what everyone didn't know, was that he was done already. In fact he hadn't even started because he never needed to. But it was not like anyone else would know of this. He was supposed to basically record what had happened and then pass it down to someone to evaluate his performance. Such a basic method of grading. But it at least respects an individual's privacy. Okay, it did not really respect it when a person was forced to recall and even explain in detail what had happened to them to someone above their position. At least the Jedi tried, I guess. Anakin's experience on Island would account for this trial. But he didn't know how to explain to them what had happened. He could lie, just as he was going to do now. But he had wanted to, at least at that time keep it a secret because it involved other things. He wasn't thinking at the time of this consequence because he got greedy yet again, which lead to his current problem. At least it was not as if he wouldn't be able to fabricate something for the Jedi High Council. Anakin pretends to exit his meditative state, and everyone is confused, because the projected timeline was meant to be around at least an hour's time. He begins writing on the given notebook about some fabricated force vision event, and he stole the original's vision. In doing so he wouldn't really be lying when he says it is his vision. After this, the next trial would now begin. Ladies, folks, gentlemen and everything in between we have finally arrived towards the final event. The finale. The announcer says. The fifth trial known as the trial of insight. The announcer continued. The trial of insight was the last test offered as part of the trials of knighthood. Installed in the trials program after noting that, while a Jedi could take down a Sith, they could be undone by common thieves. This test helped a Jedi to see what was really in front of their eyes through use of the Force. Young Padawan Skywalker will have to see through illusions, evaluating an individual's true persona. The announcer was still speaking. To complete the test, Padawans were forbidden from reviewing any of the possible puzzles in the Jedi archives. Such an advantage would make the test moot. Through the Jedi of old, the trial might require a Padawan to analyze and decipher the high riddles of Dwarty, Ordico broken text and scattered files. Sometimes, a field of stones would be laid out on the trial's chamber floor, and a Padawan would be forced to locate the single grain of sand amongst it. The announcer finished with, Today, for the entertainment and amusement of the people, Padawan Skywalker will complete all versions of this trial. Anakin was faced against the first test where he would have to analyze and decipher a puzzle, but not one of the high riddles of Borgi. But through the combined effort of a Jedi High Council, and a few other Jedi Masters was a suitable puzzle created. After having completed this Anakin would move on to the next test, which would require him to decode some broken text scattered within some files. He would also go on to complete this within a speedy time frame, while simultaneously still keeping the audience interested, especially because the last test would determine if he could advance in rank, and become the youngest Jedi Knight within the Jedi Order's history. The announcer was continuing his job quite well. Now our hero will have to enter his final test, where a field of stones have been laid out before him. Amongst this entire field he is to locate the single grain of sand amongst them. Anakin thought to himself, these old Jedi trial methods are something else, in fact why do the current Jedi even keep the tradition of the trials? For Anakin, the Jedi High Council had wanted to scour through the records to create something to test him, and they decided to modify the methods of old. Considering everything about Anakin, his traits, his abilities and his genius above his peers and even those older than him, they had to do something. The Jedi couldn't ignore his fast rise. Now to finish this boring situation, let's wait until the mysterious attacker appears. Within the Force, Anakin knew his time was nearing when he would learn the identity of the attacker within his vision. A minute had passed and he had already identified the grain of sand, but he was intentionally waiting for what is to happen next. Knowing that the time was right, Anakin stepped forward in the direction of the grain of sand. Out of nowhere a devouring darkness bursts through one side of the room going directly towards him. But Anakin dodges to see the monstrosity. It's John Doe Anakin thought to himself as he was barely able to make out the thing's force signature. After the transform John Doe made his entrance, the room erupted into chaos, and the broadcast was meant to be cut off, but Palpatine had his own plans in place. Some other people similar in their transformed state followed after John Doe attacking anyone they could see. It would seem that John Doe was the only one with some semblance of sanity left. The Jedi had things mostly under control, but it would seem that people were being blocked off from getting close to him. Palpatine sure does know how to make it dramatic. Anakin thought to himself, it's K Y W A L K E R Tilda John Doe's voice had become more ghoulish and demonic, suiting his now new appearance. I don't think I ever actually called you by your actual name. While everything was chaotic, Anakin could take this time to speak to the guy. I believe John Doe may be more appropriate for your situation now more than ever. It's K Y W A L K E R Tilda John Doe just continued in his sluggish voice before leaping towards him with his red lightsaber ignited and fully ready to burn him. Anakin takes a few steps back to dodge the blow before igniting his very own lightsabers, and with only one activated given he wants to take a more defensive position for now. Anakin and John Doe continued to go back and forth as the chaos around them continued. Sadly it did not seem like John Doe was willing to go at it in a willing battle. But it matters not because Anakin has taken his opponent down before, so he should be able to do so again. It just might be a bit harder because last time John Doe was weaker. Not only that, but Anakin had the advantage because he was hidden. This time he has no such luxury. But if he had to retreat he would willingly go. There is no reason to risk his life in a battle to the death with a clearly twisted individual, no doubt just a puppet for Palpatine to execute his plans. John Doe was quite reckless in his attack. You did this to me. He was starting to blame Anakin for what had happened to him. Technically he is true considering that he could have just offed him, but that wouldn't have served his plans. Raving start mad, John Doe continued his relentless aggressive assault on Anakin. 
but was unable to really do anything much. But he was slowly burning up himself. Anakin could feel this as well. John Doe was dying from the inside out, and it wasn't because of the poison. It was because of whatever Sidious had done to him to give him such a boost in power. Drove and droves of mutated aberrant freaks of nature continued to pour into the area as the crowd was slowly being evacuated along with other Jedi, ensuring their safety while Anakin was trapped within. At least they are trying. Anakin thought to himself doing two things simultaneously. One keeping an eye on his surroundings, what the others are doing, their progress in eliminating the ghouls, and on himself currently facing off what would seem to be the boss. Are you even paying attention to me? A rather vicious strike landed on Anakin's lightsaber, but he parried the blow. His constant defensive and rather nonchalant attitude seemed to be pissing off the beast even more. This fueled the dark side within John Doe even more, which accelerated his deterioration, but strengthened his physical capabilities, making it harder and harder to be defensive about the situation. But, John was not the only one being empowered, so too was Anakin because of the use of form Vi. Relying on one's own emotions to fuel their power, but also on those you are against veritably turning themselves against themselves. Well, an amalgamation of the person they are fighting and the emotions that fuel them back into their chaos. Continue to attack me, and it will be your undoing. Anakin said to his opponent as they continued to exchange blows with Anakin winning all of them. No, I must avenge myself and absolve myself of my sins. John continued in his mutated ghoulish voice. So be it. Anakin had decided to not speak anymore. He had already given the other person a chance. But it would seem he was unable to see the great Mount Tai. Wait, I just turned into a young master right there. Not that Anakin wasn't, because technically he is. They continued to go at it for what would seem like hours on hours. But really what only had been going on was exchanged within a minute or so. This is what happens in very stressful situations. Adrenaline kicks in to increase chances of survival. But there was something about John that didn't scream survival. In fact, his entire twisted self cried out for help, whilst at the same time repulsed the very thing that was trying to help him. Anakin wasn't so kind to do so, but was willing to try and subdue him, and that is why he was taking a while. He never intended to kill the man, but if he is forced to he very well may well execute the man. Die. His screeching was becoming louder, loud enough to overturn any other noise within their immediate proximity. This had an impact on Anakin as even though he is protected his nano suit wasn't built with the idea he would be attacked with sound, specifically force-enhanced sounds, and it could only do so much. Now temporarily slightly deafened, Anakin had to rely on his other senses. His eyes were quite the tool when it came to this considering all the other abilities he can switch between. But his eyes are also limited. The human eye can do a lot especially when it came to men because of evolutionary differences. Human males' kinetic vision was much greater. Of course nature was unbiased when it came to gender and gave women their due diligence as well. They got to see more colors, or had an easier time differentiating such things. Die, die, die. John continued to try and disorient Anakin, but now that he had caught onto this tactic, he applied countermeasures and decided enough was enough. What Anakin happened to forget in this moment however was that everyone was still being broadcasted. Some if not most would call this an oversight, but Sidious had done this on purpose, sowing the seeds of doubt. Anakin going in for the metaphorical kill, does not kill John, but decides to chop off his arms and legs, not too unlike what the original Anakin would have gone through, screaming and moaning in pain. One could hear it in his voice. I curse you, Anakin Skywalker. The dark side of the force was congregating on the man, but Anakin decides that would be too dangerous to just leave the man alone. You are cursed. To hell you shall go. The devil shall be your name. He gives his final hurrah as he breaths his last breath. But there was still chaos going on around him, and Anakin did not have any time to ponder on John's declaration. I name you the devil. John Doe had a small surprise up his sleeve that transmitted a thought explosion through the force to everyone nearby, meaning only himself. The dark side of the force however, had tried to act upon John's words, and tried to attach onto Anakin burrowing its way into his mind. Damn it, why I got to deal with this now. Just like that, Anakin's lights were knocked out, he had gone unconscious. Isla was concerned, she could feel it. The malicious and very corrupting presence of the dark side and it was currently felt from where she felt Anakin was. Infinitely worried she began her mad dash trying to cut her way through those of whom were in her way. She saw it, or saw something as Anakin had put an end to the monstrosity's life. A parasite of some kind was launched towards Anakin and latched onto him. Isla. Barris. The brave youngling she was had come right from behind Isla. She had grown to become more adept than any her age or even around her age, all thanks to training with Anakin. Surprisingly enough Ahsoka also seemed to hold her own against the beasts. But she obviously didn't have the training the other two older girls had and struggled a bit more. If anything people should be surprised about how she managed to get the slip on the Jedi mentors trying to gather the younglings away from the area. Especially those who were very young like Ahsoka. Wait for me, Ahsoka said. In times of crisis it would seem the teamwork of the three was quite advanced and under immense pressure. Isla was showing great leadership skills in this situation. The group had finally managed to make their way towards Anakin, who was now lying on the ground unconscious, but was covered in his nano suit as a defensive measure. Usually it wouldn't activate when he went unconscious like this, but preventative measures were put in place, just in case. Is he okay? Isla was not one for medical anything, and had to rely on Barris's expertise. Barris was doing some basic diagnosis through the force. He is fine. He is just unconscious, and from I can tell some sort of parasite has latched onto him. Arnie will stay asleep for now. Despite not knowing the situation really at hand, it would seem that Ahsoka had some level of intelligence above her pairs. Yes, Anakin will need to get some rest to recover. Isla said to them while thinking internally, I need to get 
the masters involved, they might know something about this parasite. Within the medical bay of the Jedi Temple. Damn what a dream or was it nightmare? Anakin awoke to find himself in a familiar environment, and with his enhanced mental capabilities was easily able to know exactly where he was. Even if he didn't have this he could always rely on the force, despite how unreliable it could be sometimes. You will not break my will. Anakin thought with conviction and decided to speak it aloud. You will not break my will. The force responded in a way that said it was both sorry and taunting him. Trying to lure him towards the dark path he was shown when attacked by the parasite. Deciding that he was done being here because he has had enough of being within environments like this within his past life. Don't get him wrong, he enjoys the benefits of science and medicine but that doesn't mean he had to like it. It would seem I could not escape ending up in a situation like this again. Anakin thought to himself as he started to move towards the exit before he was stopped, exclaiming two men enter alongside another woman. Why, would you look at that? The prodigal student awakens. The speaker here was Mace. The people he was with was Qui-Gon and the Jedi Consular Dr. Rignema. Yes, it would seem so, Anakin says as his nano suit was dematerializing and was gone before anyone would see it. Not that it had mattered anymore. Anakin was easily able to piece together what had happened and the consequences of such an event. His nano suit was now exposed to everyone. At least no one knows what its abilities are. Where did you think you were going? Dr. Rig asked with a reprimanding tone. Nowhere in particular, I just wanted to go back towards my room. Anakin replied, I think not. I would like to run a few more diagnostics on you to make sure you are okay. Dr. Rig replied in a tone that left no room for argument. Okay, Anakin replies not really sure where her overprotectiveness came from. Anakin, we have much to discuss. But first I think I should congratulate you. Qui-Gon said to Anakin as he was forced to take a seat for the doctor. I am assuming this means I am unofficially a Jedi Knight now. Anakin asked. Correct. Mace replied. I am to be officiated then. Anakin asks another question. That is also the correct assumption. Mace answers before continuing. Before that we would like to ask you of your experiences. Specifically that that event that lead up to your unconsciousness and the effects it had on you. Anakin then went on ahead to explain many things about various subjects, including what had happened to him, but with extreme caution on what he should reveal. For now he had come to the conclusion, as did the other Jedi High Council had decided that he had a clean bill of health. As far as the Force was concerned, but Dr. Rig was insistent on him staying, because she was absolutely infatuated with whatever technology he had created. A parasite, created with the soul and intent purpose to try and infiltrate and corrupt another person into the lull of the dark side. Thankfully it was Anakin that had been infected, in fact he was the intended target, but no one else knew that. Not even Anakin himself because it did set off like a bomb, and would have affected anyone else if they were close enough when John Doe died. Anakin after a few days had decided to go to the training room that had by now become his own, officially as it would seem the council felt a bit guilty, and decided that he could have full ownership over this room in particular. It wasn't like they didn't have plenty of other areas to train their Jedi in, or anyone else could go to, and in fact the room Anakin had basically made a secondary home base on Coruscant, didn't even have the best facilities. Practically everything there had been upgraded by Anakin himself, so of course they saw no problem in handing it over, not like they were ever especially attached to it anyway. Of course just because he owned the room now, doesn't mean he would keep it forever or anything like that. If he left it would go back to the Jedi. Hello everyone. Anakin came in trying to lift whatever the mood he had felt from within the room. Everyone's eyes lit up, Isla, Ahsoka, Barris, and even Shark was here for him. At least that was what Anakin had narcissistically thought to himself. Isla was the first to embrace him, followed by Ahsoka, then also followed by the embarrassed and somewhat hesitant Barris. But after seeing her rival attach herself on Anakin, she also pounced. At this point Anakin was thinking to himself, how did I get myself into this trouble? Master Shark T just had to make a smart comment to cover for her relief at seeing he was fine. Well, it would seem that all that saber practice really has these girls attached to you. She obviously meant more than that. Anakin was still surprised none of the girls had caught on by now. He could forgive Ahsoka's innocence. But for Barris and Isla, how could they not know? Unless they were feigning ignorance that is. I am alright, Anakin said trying to soothe their current emotional states before continuing. I think that everyone should just relax. I was completely fine. What I think everyone should worry about now is nothing. Anakin then continued. It would look like everyone has some free time because some classes were cancelled for a few days, and that those here at the temple also got a stay of leave for a bit. I am sure that we could put our time to better use, than just sulking over my apparent injuries. Which were none by the way. Anakin continued to reassure them given they were silent, and still were holding onto to him tightly. I am slightly concerned however that not even Master T is even stopping this kind of behavior. Isn't this like against the Jedi Code or something? Anakin thought to himself. Whatever not my problem. Having completed the trials, the council have deemed you fit for the promotion from a Padawan to a Knight. Your masters have posed the question, and your capabilities have answered this for us. Thus you are now officially a Jedi Knight. Mace said, directed towards Anakin. Anakin was officially receiving his new rank of Jedi Knight from the Council. The people who were present was of course the Grandmaster himself, Yoda and all of the other Council members, plus Qui-Gon was allowed to see the process himself. Nothing else was exchanged from within the room, considering this process was only done for Anakin. Now an official Jedi Knight Anakin has a lot more freedoms from what the Jedi usually have, but that doesn't mean that they wouldn't still keep a close eye on him. In fact, gaining more freedom may increase their interest in seeing his progress. Come with us you will. Yoda says to Anakin before he leaves. Is there something you need? Anakin asks. Discuss within the council conference room we will. Joining us will be Jedi Knight Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yoda continued. Anakin followed after Yoda as the other council members went on their own way. And the only ones who were left was Mason Shakti. The mission to Zanama Sekhet. 
A mission that both the original Anakin and Obi-Wan went on together following the trail left behind by another Jedi, whom had mysteriously disappeared. It was currently three years after the event of the invasion, and Anakin was currently biologically 12, while physically he looked much older. Anakin was joined by Obi-Wan on the ship he had acquired from Maul, the Scimitar. Being extremely useful why wouldn't he use this ship? But he knew to keep it on the low, at least for now. He has plans on this next mission to use it. The Scimitar will not be the Scimitar any longer and he plans to create something entirely new out of its bits and pieces, its technology will be used to become incredibly powerful in its new version. The next mission they were assigned took them to the living planet of Zanama Sekhet in an attempt to find a Jedi Knight, Virgu, who had recently vanished during a mission there. Unbeknownst to them, Will of Tarkin and Wraith Siena had followed them to exploit Zanama Sekhet's ability to quickly fuse organic and manufactured technology into starfighters. Well, unbeknownst to Obi-Wan they were after the Zanama Sekhet's abilities. Anakin had in fact wanted to exploit the planet as well but not to the extent they had wanted and given Wraith even under his orders, still went against him mattered. He would have to punish the man for his transgression. Wraith has probably gone against his wishes because he wanted to rebel against him. He did after all stop him, or more specifically Tuckin from getting the Death Star blueprints. For Anakin's new ship he would need to get sea partners. On the planet the colonists sold sea partners which bonded with their hosts, and allowed the planet to customize a starship for the individual. Sea partners were small thorn covered organisms that originated within the Tampasi, from the tree-like borers of the living planet Zanama Sekhet. As Sekhet's self-proclaimed children cells in my body, the seed partners would be introduced to a spacer, who desired to possess one of Sekhet's living ships. If the seed partners, according to their own desire, attached themselves to the spacer, a ship would be produced by those partners, working with a team of Ferran designers, Lingesi forges, and giant-like Jantari shapers. Seed partners attached themselves to a spacer using a spike, which produced an uncomfortable adhesion, but no wound. Three seed partners per spacer was the normal outcome of this election process. Anakin had a feeling that he would have way more, and in fact was guessing he would have more than the original Anakin had. It would be over 15, at least he hoped it would be. Anakin and Obi-Wan had arrived, and Anakin got straight to work in negotiating with the people here. He also had secret brought along another ship for Obi-Wan to go back on, given that he was not needed here anymore. He got all of the information about what had happened to the Jedi Knight and had left, but Anakin stayed so he could create the ship he wanted. Due to Zanama Sekhet's distant location, the only way to reach the planet was by a specially chartered and sanctioned voyage. Upon arrival, the customer, almost always an extremely wealthy individual, was shown to his accommodations. After paying Sekhet's exceptionally high price, sometimes exceeding 4 billion credits, the customer was led to a large chamber. Its walls were covered with little spike balls, or seeds, that the Ferrans called seed partners. The seed partners would then choose whether or not to join the customer and become their ship. However, this choosing normally involved every single seed partner breaking loose from the chamber walls to literally bury the customer in a spectacular cascade. The people were surprised that Anakin had over 20 of the seed partners attach themselves on him. He was just happy that he had more, as this would allow him to gain a greater amount more of benefits. The ship could become so much more with his own ideas and modifications. Once the dust cleared, the customer would find that a select few seed partners had chosen them, usually expressed by clinging irremovably to their boats. After a day or two, the Therans would remove the seat partners, and the customer would be taken before the designer to visualize the designs for their ship. Another few more days, the customer would be led to a massive ravine, filled with forging pits and natural cathedral, kilometers wide, bordered and canopied by colossal borrowers, where the ship would be made. In this factory valley Lingesi forges would use fire and lightning to cook and pop the seeds, forming them next into disc-like shapes. The seeds, still perfectly well in their new transmutations as seed discs were collected and transported via carapods to a shaping warehouse constructed of lamina. Special translucent fruits containing thick sparkling fluids that is churned by a screw-like organ at the core would be harvested, their globular substances used to mold the seed discs into the flesh and structure of the ship by Jantari shapers. Customers were required to sit within pre-made frames, as the Jantari placed into position the seed discs and pre-manufactured expensive, state-of-the-art engines molding the ships around them. Organo form circuits, engines of Hauchal design, ideally Type 7 engines from its line of silver-class light starships, and hyperdrive core units were merged with the living ship. Globs of fruit juice were used as connection fluid to merge the seed discs, which now sprouted sinuous, questing pseudopods and organoform circuitry together. While the Jantari shaped and merged the seed discs around the customer, the seeds telepathically asked the customer about final design decisions. The customer, in turn, was required to shape the ship's final design, acquiescing to Sekhet's whispered will as well, while directing the seed's input in these last stages of design and production. The customer was also asked to stay with the ship for at least a few days after her birth, as she was being fitted and finished with non Sekhet and instrumentation to align her with Republic standards to comfort her in her early life. Strange indeed that the ship would be referred to as a she, but Anakin wasn't complaining, and had in fact liked to imagine it as female, rather than a male. Finished with transponders, communication and control panels, couches and miscellaneous accoutrements, the living ship's interior boasted smooth, iridescent lines of green and blue and red, gleaming like a coat of ruby and emerald mineral enamel, yet not just dead brilliance, but a pulsing quality of light, that signified youth and life. Of course, Anakin had made sure to involve the scimitar in the designing process, to give it armaments and a special installed countermeasure, that provides it with invisibility. How could he miss up on this chance? 
but most of everything else within the scimitar was scraped. Why? Because his brand new ship named Jabitha is just that much better. Glowing faintly from within, and pools of deep sea luminosity, seemed to come and go under its shiny green skin, with the sentient ship now ready to fly. However, the pilot or pilots, upon departure, had to swear an oath of utmost secrecy towards an armor second. If the oath was ever broken, the bond between the owner and ship would break, and the ship would quickly die. Anakin disliked this idea, and disliked that his ship could be controlled by another being even if that being was a planet. Having procured his own living ship, he hastily left the planet knowing full well that everyone who has a ship like him will unfortunately have their ships die. Anakin was able to prevent his own from dying off because of the Force, thus making him the only person to ever have one. After the planet utilizing its massive hyperdrive engines with 300 kilometer high field guides, broke from its Gardaji rift orbit in the galaxy's Tinjo arm. Just after he had left, all remaining ships off-world perished. Except for his of course, he had wrestled for complete control, and now had his very own upgraded version of the ship. Generally the planet didn't like creating for its customers, ships with firing capacity. But because it was Anakin involved, he was easily able to implement it, whether the planet liked it or not. Probably not the best idea to make enemies with an entire planet. Anakin thought to himself, it does not matter anyway because Zanama second activated its planetary hyperdrive vanishing for the unknown regions. Sienna and Tarkin returned to the Republic with nothing in their hands, thus making Anakin decide to cut ties with them. He didn't need them anymore anyway, he had the wealth and everything else needed to continue expanding into the galaxy for his business. Anakin using Jabitha, had arrived back on Tatooine under the cover of night, and went down towards a specialized entrance bay going towards a semi-living machine underneath. The Matrix Anakin had created would help him further increase and stabilize his control over the ship. He then went on to upgrade Jabitha even further, with the help of his medical droids, and access to those special blue stones. That would allow someone to use the Force, and the non-organic version of midi-chlorians the ship became so much more. It became truly living, not unlike the TARDIS or any other living ship type deal from various sci-fi based franchises. Telepathically connected to him this was Anakin's first chance to experience being connected like this and considering in the future, the sense will become like this. He would experience a change in his connection with them, it would become more natural. At least going off of this experience, he would say that this is close to what would happen once the droids got their own forms outside of their machine selves. Papa. A mental thought was transmitted to Anakin as the process of transformation was complete. Yes, Jabitha. Anakin answered, am I going to be alright now? Jabitha questioned through their bond being connected to each other through more than just the Force, because abilities like telepathy isn't just a Force-sensitive thing. Other species had access to a rather large set of traits that they had evolved with. The Force wasn't the only source of power but it was definitely the greatest, most widespread, most influential and prominent among everything. Yes, Anakin said, we have to go now, you can't stay here, or in fact you will stay here. Jabitha had become so much more than what she originally was. Instead of having the same coloring she had before she had that, but her exterior wasn't made of green, but was painted a special black metallic coloring. Her shape was still the same, given Anakin didn't need or want to change this. I don't want to stay here. I want to stay with Papa. A mental yell was called through their bond in a childish feminine voice. I am afraid that would put you at risk. You will need to take some time to adjust to your new life, your new abilities. Anakin had after all used a similar process to his living droids, the difference here being she was both based on technology and organic materials, thus giving her the ability to live for a long time separate from the problem of the droids. But I want to be with Papa. Jabitha replied. Anakin knew that it would be impossible to do so, but then started to think. Well, she does have the same capabilities the scimitar had. He was referring to its ability to go invisible, meaning that it had something similar to what he has with his nano suit. Combine that with the fact it could use force abilities, it shouldn't be any problem for it to come with him. There was really no problem at more the more he though about it and he would be remiss if he said he also wanted to separate. The connection between the both of them went both ways, and he was intensely aware of Jabitha's thoughts and feelings, not to unlike his connection to Isla he had recently discovered. All right, I guess I could take you with me, but we will be unable to have much fun, considering I will be staying within the Jedi Temple. He is cut off from his reply, as Jabitha squealed in joy. Thank you, Papa. Jabitha was in an extremely good mood, sighing within Anakin thinks to himself. Well, no one would be able to recognize this incredibly rare, no unique spaceship anyway but it is better if she is not seen. Another year had finally passed, and if Anakin was to take a look at the date, it would be the seventh year of the Great Resynchronization, or thinking about it from his future knowledge be known as 28 BBY. It was the year that the Senate elections for the next Supreme Chancellor were to be held, but we all know that there would only be one candidate. This was also the year that Barisofi, a young Jedi, would be able to complete the initiate trials to become a Padawan to gain a master of her own. It is also the year that Queen Amidala, otherwise known as Padme Naberi, would step down from her position. Padme by stepping down had been able to escape this betrothal treaty, and because of the delays within the Republic and Jedi still being against this, it didn't go through. That didn't mean Padme was against Anakin in particular, but was against the decision that would have been forced on her. He was also upset as well, if only by a little because they were also trying to force him, but now neither himself or Padme would need to worry about the treaty anymore. Anakin was currently within his training room, as he could actually at this point call it so, and Barris, Ahsoka and Isla would come here frequently. Ani, do you think I would do well? Barris asked him. All of the girls had gotten used to using his nickname that everyone seemed to agree on. It was not like they were able to know it was originally from his mother. 
Given how the Force works in mysterious ways however, it would seem that may have slightly influenced them to use it. But that is just a theory. Why would the Force do that? Or it could be that one of them somehow did some basic research on him, and decided to try and be more intimate with him, which resulted in them all using it. Do well with what exactly? Anakin knew what she was referring to, but deciding to coax what she was talking about. You know, passing the trials. Barris continued while looking at Anakin with a certain look that could be what was called the puppy dog eyes. I think you will do just fine. Anakin knows that she wanted more from him, but again he wouldn't say anything about it. After a few seconds of staring, Barris decides to ask about what is on her mind but in a much more subtle way. I have heard that you aren't taking on any apprentice, and don't wish to do so for a while now. Yes, that is correct. He responds knowing where this was going. Well, I was wondering about whether you have changed your mind or not. Barris said still not completely saying what she wanted. I don't know. Anakin replied with a vague answer in a somewhat mysterious tone. Mustering up some courage Barris finally asks. Can you be my master? She blurts out with some embarrassment. Asking someone to be your master. I am sure that the Jedi wouldn't allow such favoritism. Anakin said to Barris but didn't really mean what he was saying, and was just testing her resolve. Of course, you would be a great master. Have you not already taught me a lot already? Barris responded dodging his comment on the Jedi. He hums a bit before saying, I could take you as my apprentice, but if you wish to do so it would only be so long before I would want for you to graduate from under me. Anakin then continues, I can't be having my apprentice not become great and do so slowly. I will do anything for you I mean this opportunity. Barris quickly covers up her slip. There are other things to consider as well, like how you shall address me. While we would still be friends and all, by becoming your master the relationship between us would change. Anakin continued, Are you alright with this? Yes. Barris was firm in her belief that there would be no other who could teach her. He had been doing so for the past few years, helping her in the areas she had wanted to progress down towards, and helping her develop her strengths and even fill in her weaknesses. There is no one else that I would have. Barris says to Anakin, I think you are getting ahead of yourself a little. Don't you have something else you have to do first? Anakin says not giving his answer just yet. What is that? She frowns. To complete your trials of course. Anakin supplies. Exclaiming, she replies, of course. I forgot, don't worry, from what I have seen you will easily be able to pass them. Let the force guide you when making your saber as well. Just a little tip for when you begin the construction of your lightsaber. Anakin says as he feels that he is done for the day within the training room. After having gone on that mission for his new ship, with the birth and development of Jabitha, Anakin had to take a little bit of time to make sure she didn't do anything crazy. Thankfully Jabitha was very resourceful when she got into situations that may have lead to her discovery. When he went back to the council to explain his side of the story of why he had stayed behind, they were fine with it. Considering they were interested in going there as well, it would seem some of the members wanted a ship like that. He just explained to them that all of those ships had died because of an attack against the planet which resulted in the deaths of the living ships. They gave him some time off before they would send him off for another mission. They did ask however about what had happened to his ship, and how he had come back. He replied that the living ship made for him was born, and had enough energy to get him towards another planet, before he purchased a ride back to Coruscant. He explained that was why it took so long for him. Anyways, it was a new year, and the council had finally called him in to participate in another mission, one that would lead him down the path to discovering a Sith holocron. Anakin would have to recover from the planet Kodai the ancient Sith holocron of King Aedas. This time he was not joined by Obi-Wan, as the first mission he was sent on was only reassure the council's doubts about his capabilities. Even though they had tested him and he was successful, they had thought that because he was too fast in becoming a knight, and only having completed one mission as a Padawan, another mission with another person, would help them be secure with their decision. This time however after proving that he didn't need the extra help they had assigned him this mission alone. Once going towards this planet and landing, he would meet with the mad Sith historian, Merc Lundy, whom had once tried to claim the Sith holocron. With Lundy accompanying him, the two found that Lundy's pupil, Norval, a dark side fanatic, had found and taken the holocron for himself. Anakin, after facing and killing the deranged student, was able to recover the holocron only to learn that the quest to reclaim it had exacted a heavy toll on Lundy's body. Anakin decided to spend some of his time during the last moments of Lundy's life at his side as the old Quermian professor expressed regret for his fanatical pursuit of the holocron years ago. With the dangerous artifact at last secured, Anakin should have returned the holocron to the Jedi High Council for safekeeping within the vaults of the Jedi Temple at Coruscant, but he didn't want to. He would keep it to himself to discover what other dark side abilities and powers he could gain access to. Aedas was both a monarch and a god to his people, and during the end of his reign Aedas was given the title of Safari, the perfect being, bestowed upon him by the Force according to legend. A fist combatant and a respected, though inflexible ruler Aedas was still feared millennia after his death. He preyed on the timid, enslaved those he considered to be foolish, executed idealists, and was highly derisive of the weak his essence recorded in a holocron would refuse to pass on its teachings to anyone it did not deem worthy. Anakin would be sure to take advantage of this fact, and make sure that the special consciousness left behind in this holocron would give up all its information. He couldn't do this through blunt force however, and would need to play his cards right. Though his holocron was generally reluctant to pass on instruction, it did have the extraordinary power to affect the minds of people in its presence when activated. Anakin intended to learn everything he could and he did which resulted in him finally perfecting his mind reading technique. Well, it was perfected in that he would not damage the minds of those he read their memories from, meaning it would work on people who were not Force-sensitive. He can now read people's memories without mind-breaking them. For Force-sensitives however it would take some time to get used to it. Another thing he would come to learn from that holocron was the manipulation of emotions, of which he had already developed himself. 
but it would seem that the holocron had some information of its own relating to such an ability. Considering the holocron itself could affect people's minds when activated, it would only make sense that Anakin would finally have a way to advance this trait. King Ada was also known to be quite physically imposing, but the combat aspects didn't matter to Anakin, knowing he could perfectly recreate whatever style he was using. Its effectiveness was limited because Ada was more of a brute force style, rather than refinement of one's skill. Anyway, I have been away from the temple for a small while. Anakin thought to himself as he was ready to return on Jabitha. He had taken some time to digest and refine his own abilities, after accessing the Sith Holocron. He would be keeping this for himself and putting it within his own Force-sensitive training institute in the future along with any other Holocron he finds. Anakin strongly felt that Jabitha did not want him to be on any other ship than herself. He readily complied, given she was much more capable than any other ship. It could access the Force itself and use it. What more did he need to add? Let's go back to Coruscant. Anakin mentally told Jabitha, okay? Jabitha was always excited to be driven by Anakin. Not that he need to be a pilot because she was fully capable of doing so herself. It was just because of the bond between the two. It was much better for her to become connected with him as originally her hyperspace rating would be a maximum of 0.4, which was quite high. With Anakin however it would become even faster reaching the 0.1 rating. This was only possible because of the energy field known as the Force, otherwise Anakin would only be able to pilot her at a maximum of 0.4. Back on Coruscant. After having come to Coruscant, Anakin explained to the Council that the Sith Holocron was destroyed in the process of trying to retrieve it. He told them about Lundy and how he had died, along with the student who had tried to take the ancient Sith artifact for himself. He was annoyed he had to continuously report to them about things. But that was how the hierarchy structure worked within the Jedi. In fact this was what it was like everywhere else as well, and in general, it had always been like this. I guess I have still not grown used to being under the command of someone else yet. Anakin thought to himself. He also doesn't think that he would ever get used to it either. For now Anakin would have to take up his duties as a stand-in teacher once again, till he gets another mission. But that was perfectly alright with him. The children were learning quite a lot from him, and he was actually starting to enjoy taking on the teacher role more and more. Some of the things he had been teaching them over the years, would set them up on a better path than what they would have originally gone down. When it came to emotions he would allow them to seek him out for some help, kind of like becoming a father of sorts. Ironic that his other persona as Vader also meant father. The role of a parent was to ensure that your children grew up well and adjusted to the world, the galaxy. But that didn't mean it was easy. It may not be the hardest job to do, but these children only had other Jedi to look up to. And Anakin decided to give them another figure. Himself. Of course he didn't want anyone to live up to the expectations of the Chosen One, but for them to know that even though he is held as such, he also faces problems and hardships. They took his words to heart, given that most younglings within the temple absolutely idolize him. Given he wanted them in his new order or organization of Force Sensitives individuals in the future, it was a great start to their conversion. He doesn't want some unstable individuals joining him, and wants people who are mentally within the right frame of mind. He had also been secretly teaching them about the Grey Code of the Force. Why? When this could lead to him being reprimanded, because the children held him in such high esteem that they wouldn't ever tell anyone else except those who are in the know, all going according to the plan. Anakin thought to himself, it may take a few more years before any big changes are found because they are still young, and most of those who are older and the Padawans, are not really within his access. He won't be able to save them all from their fate, but he will save those who are deserving, an example being Plo Koon, while some who must die would be Kayadi Mundi. There was another mission that Anakin would be sent on, but it would seem that the timeline was stuffed up a bit, because this was supposed to happen a year ago. It would seem the butterfly effect was starting to happen, but it didn't matter too much, given he could see the future himself anyway. Well, he could see multiple variables that would influence events that are to take place. Any decisions and actions made would do so, and any difference from how events usually took place from within his memories, would be different more and more as time went on. The mission to Dalina. This time Anakin would be going on another mission where he was to go to the planet Dalina, so that he could collect an ancient Jedi holocron from a dig site. This dig site was called the Dalina Excavation, and upon arriving on Dalina, Anakin encountered a female Togruta archaeologist named Clatrif. She was glad that he had arrived so he could take the holocron away due to the fact that it was causing problems. She explained that the local pirates wanted to get it, and she had to hire local guards to keep them at bay. Anakin had again traveled here with Jabitha, and had some droids with him as well. Some droids were ordered to stay outside to keep watch, whilst he and Clatriff went inside the facility to obtain the holocron. After they went inside, just as planned his droids noticed that the pirates had arrived, Anakin and Clatriff went out to meet them, and were introduced to the Crypto Riders and their leader Hudso Shaku who knew that the holocron was something important due to off-worlders wanting to get it. Anakin went on to state that he didn't want any trouble, but was willing to defend himself and others if need be. He activated his lightsaber, whereupon Shaku ordered his pirates to attack him. Because he found the laser sword to be more valuable than the things that they dug up, he quickly disarmed the pirates, and quickly got to disabling and immobilizing his opponents. With Shaku knocked unconscious and the pirates' weapons destroyed, they surrendered to him, which would later have them become imprisoned. Anakin having retrieved what he wanted, well, what the Jedi wanted began his journey once again back to Coruscant. He had no need to steal this holocron for himself, as everything within the Jedi Temple would become his anyway, and be transported to his very own order in the future. The current Jedi Order won't last very long, 
and when it crumbles, Anakin intends to plunder everything he could from the temple, the holocrons included. So there was no need to lie or hide away any Jedi holocron he comes across as basically everything he doesn't have now will become his in the future. He has patience, but not so much so that he would wait an eternity. There was also nothing else much to do on Dalinar. So there was no need to extend his stay more so than he needed. There are much more things of much more importance to him elsewhere. More specifically the development of Tatooine and the system itself, he was planning to expand his region of influence. Sooner or later he would have a large region of space that would be called Skywalker Space, something akin to Hut Space. He had to consider his next target carefully, looking at location, resources, population, culture, and military might compared to his own, so he could safely assume control. He needed to also fabricate reasons to do so. Politics are also still important for this aspect, and he would need to become quite the elusive shadow to overcome this problem. He would so with his Vader persona, and what better way than to use a droid, just as he had done before, so he could be at two places at once. Now it is time for me to choose a target, Anakin thought to himself. Barris had many reasons and an extreme amount of feelings. When it came to becoming Anakin's first Padawan learner, among them were how she felt, but there were actually solid reasons for her desire. One being that he has been teaching her for a long time now. A lot of what she had learnt, how she has developed was the results of her own effort and talents. But Anakin played a vital role so she could achieve it. Another reason was familiarity. She was slightly afraid of getting a master other than Anakin. That would be bad. All goes against what she has learnt so far. Anakin had talked about how there was a lot of Jedi who wouldn't make great masters for Padawans. Teaching would not be their strong suit. Again, another reason is because she wanted to become stronger faster. She wanted to develop just like Anakin, hoping that somehow he had some type of secret to growing up faster. She knew that his development was not normal, and should have been the result of something to do with either the Force, or through genetic and biological manipulation. In fact he could have done both. But none of that mattered to her, she would still want to stay with him. Considering that she would even leave the Order, of which is supposed to be her home, it says a lot about what she was willing to do for him. Within the personalized training room, Barris approached Anakin, whom had recently come back from another mission. Arnie. She asked Anakin. Yes. Anakin replied, I have decided that if you will have me, I want to become your apprentice. Barris musters up the courage and states what she wants. And what helped you finalize your decision? Anakin asked before answering her statement. Barris gave a sufficient answer. For one, I think you would train me to the best of your capabilities, and train me to the best of my capabilities as well. Second, I have known you for a long while now. And you know me which makes it easier for you to plan how my training will go. Barris continued. My third reason is the resources. The resources you have access to from what I could tell are above those of the other Jedi. I am excluding other, more personal reasons, but that is the gist of it. Those are some good reasons. Anakin said before continuing. I think I will be present when you pass the trials. How does that sound? Yes. Barris exclaimed outwardly, and her hopes swelled at the prospect that Anakin was coming to the trials. You won't regret taking me as your Padawan learner, I promise. I am sure I won't. Anakin answered with a smile on his face at her excitement. Now, I believe that you should go back to practicing some more. Of course. Barris moved over towards the training droids, while Isla was now taking the opportunity to approach him. Isla had grown more and more attached to him, and strangely he had as well. He had investigated the source of their connection, and went over what this could be, because it was not a simple force bond between the two. No, it was much more and there was only thing that this could be. After identification he determined it was some type of force diet, of which he had no idea how it had developed. But he had a few theories. One such being that because of the way he had been reborn to its interaction with the Force, plus other factors like him being more than just one soul, but two in one. He also was confused because from what he knew this type of bond would exist from birth, but here there was no such thing. He had been using and interacting with the Force for the entirety of his new life, and had not been able to identify it. Another thing could be he wouldn't know about it until he meet Isla physically, but even then he didn't feel this bond at that time. Not because he was blind to it, but because there was none. Something had to have happened which would lead to this, and one of the reasons is probably due to the nature of who he is now. The chosen one should not really have an equal within the force, and a force died means that the one you are connected with would be equal in power to him, but clearly she wasn't. Anyway he had been growing and would reach his maximum projected height within the next year or so. He was currently two meters tall. Hey Arnie. Isla called out to him as she came closer. Yeah. Anakin responded. Isla doesn't reply and just goes in for a hug, something of which she had been doing more and more, as she became more bold in her actions. So bold in fact that she didn't mind Barris and Ahsoka seeing her affections for him. He didn't mind either, but he wanted to find a way to stop such a bond from being created unintentionally, because it might have some negative effects. What if he connected with another man? How would he feel then? He knows that is was supposed to be some rip-off soulmate type ability, and he would most definitely would only want to do so with women. After the extended embrace she stops after doing so and asks him, So you are going to take Barris as your apprentice then? I have been thinking about it, and I think it wouldn't be a bad idea. Anakin responded, What about you? Do you wish to have a Padawan of your own? Isla responds, No. She then thinks to herself, I don't want one because they would take up my time away from you. After having discovered the connection and delving deeper into it, Anakin had discovered many features, and one that was especially helpful was the telepathic link between the two. Of course Isla started to use and abuse this as much as possible to be in his mind as much as she could. That doesn't mean she didn't respect his personal space or anything. It just meant she would talk with him mentally as much as she could. If he was out on a mission she would do so even more often. I 
I see, he responded verbally rather than mentally. If he had to describe the relationship between the two of them, he would say it was like being on the verge of becoming a couple, but he had other things to do first. In fact, he respected that the Jedi didn't allow relationships, but he felt this was up to him and another party. If it was going to go that far, he would acquiesce. The only thing is that because of his inherent traits pronounced by his experimentation, he would want to be together with more than one woman. He desired many not only physically but also mentally and spiritually. It is a part of who he is, and he wouldn't have it any other way. Because it would be going against his internal nature. When thinking about the Force Dyad, he also wanted to find a way to recreate the effects, and use it on another woman as well. Not only unintentionally with Isla but intentionally as well. For now however, he would continue to not fully engage with Isla for the sole reason that he was still trying to find out how they had become connected. He had one reason of how fully explained, it was because she was old enough to do so, and probably had enough compatibility with his own force energy and soul to do so. Even though it was an accident it is still legitimate. When asking the force for an answer all it did was show him the event that took place, and this lead to him discovering why it had happened. He still wanted to find out how to stop this if necessary, but it would seem that there is no method to stop it, but the force gave an answer, that answer being that he could control it. What are you thinking about? Isla voiced within his head while looking at him. Nothing much. He replied on instinct mentally. He really only liked to talk physically not because it was more comfortable or anything like that, but because it is strange that you see two people talking to each other without talking. It is not often the Jedi use telepathy to talk with other, and is not really practiced as well. Reading another's thoughts or emotions is instinctive because of a higher midi-chlorians count making one force sensitive, but that doesn't mean you can actually communicate with someone mentally. Psychic abilities like this are uncommon. When do you go through with your next operation? Isla asked with some concern being transmitted through the bond. It will be sometime next year. Anakin responded mentally again. You will keep your promise of allowing me to be there. Isla asks. Sighing, Anakin replies. I will. Anakin had to keep to his promises now, and it was not like she was going to expose him or anything. He had believed her, especially since he confirmed what type of bond they now shared. It only became stronger with time. Ahsoka having finished her classes for the day, came to the training room and saw Anakin and Isla just staring at each other. They are doing it again. She had noticed it along with many others, but they didn't decide to comment on the weirdness of it. Arnie. Isla. Ahsoka called out running towards and attaching herself to Anakin. Smiling Anakin pat her head. Hello Ahsoka. You two were doing it again. Ahsoka said which sobered up Isla in her bliss of mentally communicating with Anakin. Her bright smile on her face calming down a bit. We were. Isla always tries to play dumb in these situations. Yes. I saw the both of you. Arnie. When will you allow me to do what you two do? Ahsoka questions, genuinely curious about what the two were doing. Maybe sometime in the future. Not now. Anakin responds. Pouting. Ahsoka replies. How unfair. Tatooine had been greatly refurbished. Redecorated and designed to better allow those of various species live comfortably on the planet while opening up various avenues for the people to achieve greatness. When it came to local businesses they had started to spiral into vast expanses within the various city outposts around the sandy planet. Social welfare had to be set up properly to provide for those who were downtrodden, and it was not like Anakin had a need for the money anyway. When it came to the economy, some regulations had to be set in place, but mostly allowed a free market. Of course he didn't want capitalism to rule above everything else, because some greedy people could abuse the system. Laws were erected and some localized governmental systems were implemented, like the police to tax collection and all that. Why would Anakin collect taxes? Because the government needed some way to provide the people with everything they needed. His own wealth saved up from Skywalker Industries is only meant to act as a buffer before the planet needs to create its own internalized systems to stop it from collapsing from the inside. Instead of terraforming the entirety of the planet, Anakin had settled on creating domes that would act as buffers between the dangerous and unkind environment of Tatooine and the safety and security of civilization. Now onto the culture. Culture was a huge part of any civilization and the developments or traditions and other such special things attached to a people's culture is important to their development. Religion was also under the category of culture, but Anakin saw nothing too outstanding among supposed religions, except the wild propaganda made by his droids and secretly distributed to the populace. It was one thing for his droids to worship him as a god in mortal form, but another for the people here to do so as well. But very, very surprisingly it worked. Not that Anakin did not see the possible result of this coming to fruition through his predictive powers. No, it was surprising because his use of shadow points allowed him to see multiple possible special events that could happen, which allowed him to also see the possibility of something like that happening. If he had a number on how this, it would measure at around 0.34% probability of taking off. It had done so anyway, and it was not like he was all that against people believing that he was some sort of god. It wasn't that far off from the truth after all. Taking into consideration that the forces of cosmic proportion and the fact he was basically conceived from midichlorians and all. Other aspects of Tatrine's developing culture other than its new religious foundations was how the people valued freedom above all else which Anakin would reflect within the laws. Of course, they are not so free that they would allow absolutely any and everything, but it is the aspect that a being may have their own free will. They can make their own decisions and would have no master. Again, Anakin was not against this. But what was strangely contradictory was that the people elevated himself and his mother to positions of power that could be dubbed as the rulers of the people, but they disliked having to be told what to do. But there is a clear distinction, a difference was what was agreed upon by everyone, and in general common sense is taken into account most of the time. No silly laws were created, and instead of what happens within most governments, there are mandates that would allow the people and those in charge to either revise or even get rid of a law, 
that serves no purpose anymore. Redundancy breeds stagnation. Another aspect Anakin had to take into account other than the economy, law, culture, the environment and the development of the city's enclosed ecosystems, the government and so much more. Education was important and institutions have been set up properly by now for the education of both developing life forms and those who are considered adults. One thing that Anakin was starting to see he might have trouble with was the land itself, meaning he would need to continuously use numerous amounts of resources, whether natural or artificial, to create more housing or land for businesses to develop. Other infrastructure and structures like schools or medical centers, everything had to be taken into account, and he did not have enough land for the projected increase of people coming to take up residency. So, he started to look to the stars and other systems to see if there would be any other place he could safely secure for himself, to expand his territories but also for his people as well. A place that was so close but Anakin considered as off-limits was Geonosis. Believe it or not, but the amount of space between Tatooine and Geonosis was incredibly close. They were practically neighbor systems. Unfortunately, he does not want to draw too much unnecessary eyes onto himself. Tatooine may be on the outer ends, but that doesn't mean others aren't already interested in what was going on. He looked over the star map and was able to determine there were four other choices that are on the trade routes, otherwise known as the hyperspace lanes connected to Tatooine. The Urbana system was quite bare bones and would not benefit him or his people. So it was not a good option for the immediate terms, but it would be good to take that route to expand even further into the outer rims. The only interesting thing about it was an asteroid belt, and from what he could tell is useless in for now. There was the Wotemuk, a forested world located in the Wotemuk system, a part of the Arcanist sector in the slice portion of the outer rim territories. It was situated on the Trueless trade route hyperlane, which linked it to the Seferun and Tadu systems. There are two things that Anakin would be interested in about this system and planet, if he were to have designs against it. The land or the planet itself where he could house more of his people and set up another world to add this his expanding empire. Then there was a special tree, called Greel Trees, a type of tree native to Pi 3 and Pi IV, the only planets with the proper ecosystem to support the fastidious trees. The Crimson Timber Greel Wood was in great demand as a luxury item, meaning it was very expensive. Unfortunately these trees were only planted about 10-14 years ago, meaning that they may have developed really well but they might not have gone to their best. Time is important when it comes to stuff like agriculture. The next star system connecting to the hyperlane of Tatu system was Utarun, a terrestrial planet located in the Utarun system, a part of the Arcanus sector in the slice portion of the Outer Rim territories. Utarun originally served as a minor agri-world situated on the super hyper route known as the Corellian Run. When that hyperspace route changed its course at some point between 11,000 and 4,000 years ago, give or take a few years, and as a result no longer ran through Utarun, the world remained on the old Corellian run, but became abandoned. The benefits here would be both land and land that is really good. When it comes to the development of the agriculture industries, massive store of food would be great, and they would not need to import too much food anymore. Tatrime may have newly set up chambers meant specifically to grow food, but it was limited. With this a lot of the food problems, or more specifically a lot of the food expenditure would be solved. The last however was quite a failure of a system. Anderwil was an outer rim planet in the Anderwil system of the Arcanist sector, located on the Treeless Trade route. There was nothing but failed industries that tried to start up here, and Anakin would not bother with this. Not right now when he could go towards Yatarun, where he could develop it to a much greater extent. In fact on Yatarun it had only been settled on recently by some Rodians, meaning the planet was basically not under the control of anyone, making it all the more easier to seize for himself. The great thing about it even more is that he has no need to fabricate a reason to take it over. Anakin had decided to take over a droid, and put on the extra Vader suit he had created on Tatooine. He had two, one that is stored on Coruscant, while the other is on Tatooine, because he doesn't want to have to travel back and forth all the time. He may be indisposed and can only work through our unliving droid. General Vader, it is a surprise to see you here. His mother Shmai spoke to him as he approached her throne within Skywalker Palace. Vader replies in his modulated voice. I am here to discuss some things about the current state of our government. How kind of you to grace us with your presence. Shmai says with some caution. She knew that even though this figure is supposedly her savior and she fully believes it, and even has a strange trust in him, but that didn't mean her logically mind was unable to reassert itself. You need not worry. I am only here to speak about the expansion of this new state. Vader says. Expansion. I am aware that we do not have the necessary resources to further stabilize our growing population. You have another solution. Shmai asked Vader. There were other people within the throne room. But most of the time Shmai isn't always present and has time off to do her own things. This was only thanks to how well the droids were made. And because of their capabilities, it relieved pressure from the council, elected officials, and from Shmai. There were only the advisors present however and Shmai was only using the artificial intelligence intelligence installed within the palace. Yes, I have found a suitable solution. Vader answered. Tell us some more. Jiro asks Vader from beside Shmai within her own seat on the side of her. There is another system known as Anderwil, along with its main planet also named Anderwil, where we could expand greatly, Vader said. You wish to go and take over another star system? Shmai asked with some slight hesitation in her voice before continuing. I am against the subjugation of other people, she says firmly. What I want to do is not to subjugate, but to take over another planet that is uncolonized. By going over and taking this system, 
we can better facilitate ways to help your people, and could also elevate the people who live there as well, Vader states. We will not be going over there with the intentions of war, and even if we did, the amount of people there cannot even classify them as a proper society. It is basically only filled with a small amount of tribal sizes colonies, Vader continued. Colonies that have only recently started and are left to their own, by proposing to those newly settled there and bringing them under the banner of the Skywalker Empire, we would avoid what you are saying. Vader further continued. The subjugation of the people there, explaining his case seemed to convince Jura, but Shmai was still hesitant. Who currently lives there? Rodians, there are no other sentient species that live on Anduil, Vader replied. Are you sure that they would sign whatever treaty you are to purpose? Shmai further questioned. Yes, they would have no problems with it, and may even welcome the protection of another government. In fact, I guarantee that they would want this given that they would receive the same benefits as the people of Tatooine do, Vader said. They will be after all a part of the expanding Skywalker territories, Vader continued. After more discussion, Shmai in the end capitulated to Vader's suggestion, and the other officials were brought in on the idea and readily agreed. Why would they be against this when it practically helps everyone involved from those in high positions of power, and the people who are at their lowest? As representatives, this decision is currently their best bet in ensuring the stability of their growing empire. It would also bring in other revenues that include the economy of agriculture, given that this planet is perfect for it. It is settled then. Shmai finished the session as Vader got Grievous involved to begin taking some of the battle droids to Anduil, just in case of aggressive behaviors. A mysterious distress signal from the supposedly dead world of Carnelian IV, that specifically called for Jedi intercession. Anakin was tasked to go and look into what was happening there. Not too long after arriving, he came to be aware of life on the planet as a sky battle raged over him. As one of the combatant airships began to fall, Anakin had saved its two-person crew by delaying the crash. The two survivors, Kalara and Mother Pran, who identified themselves as open, knew nothing about what a Jedi was. Forced to take cover when a closed airship, which was damaged and falling Anakin had then saved its pilot, Greca, from falling to his death. Due to the historical feud between their factions, Greca and Pran tried to murder each other forcing him to destroy their weapons and to escort them to safety. Anakin had just brought them all on board onto another ship that needed some repairs, keeping Jabitha a secret given he does not know these people. To facilitate their journey, they used the intact parts of each of their airships to form a new one in order to fly to their destination. During the conversations that ensued, Anakin mentioned his purpose on the planet, to find the person who had sent the Jedi distress signal, which alerted Pran and Greca to the location of the scavenger. During the journey, Kalara told him about the mysterious kites, before noticing that he was good at fixing things, as he made an adjustment to his lightsaber. Kalara and Pran then had him repair a bag of droid brains, and, seeing his usefulness, they tried to abduct him when a horde of fishes attacked the ship. Reading their minds safely he was able to determine where they would have wanted to take him. He knocked the two ladies out, while leaving Greca conscious, given he had not done anything against him. One of the open's fortresses is where he went towards as the two ladies were locked up for now. There was only some droids that he decided were now his, and decided to call in Jabitha to store them in after doing some quick mandatory repairs. Pairs. There was some conflict, but this was something that Anakin couldn't handle himself considering it was planet-wide, so he repaired a communications unit, and called the Republic for aid. Soon enough, a task force arrived and forced the natives to cease hostilities. Everyone went their own way. But Anakin wasn't done just yet, and had recruited one of the two women, Kalara, who was quite attractive. Mother Pran though was someone he didn't want considering what she would have done to him. Anakin was next sent to Balok to monitor the overbearing Jedi Knight Jurisk Bath, and his timid Padawan, Orana Jinsler, in their negotiation mission between the Corporate Alliance and the Balok. Unbeknownst to the Jedi but not to Anakin, Kim Mandoriana, on behalf of Darth Sidious, had planned for the negotiation to work splendidly in Gaur's favor, gaining him enough prestige to go ahead with his pet project, Outbound Flight. Anakin was sent to observe the self-proclaimed Jedi Master Balth on this extra-galactic venture, at least until the Outbound Flight's last stop within the known galaxy. The hard-headed and arrogant Balth would not listen to Anakin, and was satisfied when he disembarked the venture on Outbound Flight's last stop, Roxley. The original liked the way Balth did things, his leadership and all. But that didn't mean he did as well. Anakin couldn't let these people die, especially not the timid Padawan, Lorana Jinsler. At first it was Obi-Wan who had gone to there and negotiated, and had a conversation with the Jedi on board. But he had failed around two years ago. Now it was Anakin's turn and with having his droids already on board, he will be able to intercept whatever is going to happen next. What he specifically wants to do is let those who need to die, die and save the rest. That was exactly what he did. What was especially important was Orana Jinsler, because she would become his first member of the new organization he was building for Force Sensitives. An experiment of sorts. She would come under his command where for now she would be kept on the planet of Tatooine under the care of his mother. She easily accepted even though she was timid, in fact it was her personality that made it all the easier to have her under his command. The people on the project easily also capitulated, and decided to become a part of his people. The rest were hopeless, the Jedi that went aboard and whatever other people that were not all that good. There was a screening process. Of course he didn't want the Jedi on board because that would be dangerous, he would be unable to convince them. And his first subject, Lorana, is already a stretch. So he had to send those who were good safely back to the temple on Coruscant. He did all of this before they became ambushed. After his mission for the outbound flight project, Anakin had some time off as there was nothing else for him to do. Most of the missions he was meant to go on with Obi-Wan as his apprentice didn't happen. Some missions he did on his own while some he was accompanied by others. Not a lot of missions were helpful to him, and were only helpful to either the Republic or Jedi. But he benefited every now and then. It was a new year again and thing had been progressing. He had also decided to take Barris as his first apprentice, because why not? 
This also lead to her learning a great deal from him, and within a few years, possibly before the Battle of Geonosis, would he have her become a knight. Not that any of that really mattered, but he couldn't have her under him all the time. He was currently 14 years of age, meaning that he could finally take on the next implant to do with the Sky Seed. The Catalepsian node is the sixth of the 19 Sky Seed organs that would be implanted into him. This organ is implanted into the back of the cerebrum, just above the brainstem. When deprived of sleep for a long period of time, the Catalepsian node would cut in upon detecting a rise in his stress and fatigue hormones. This allows Anakin to consciously switch off sections of the brain sequentially, while remaining awake and alert. This ability comes at a price, as prolonged use of this ability can be hazardous, possibly inducing hallucinations or even psychosis. This implant bears a resemblance to an ancient scientific theory, as to how cetaceans known as botlinus dolphins sleep, shutting off sections of their brain while remaining awake and alert through the active use of the other sections. Yet he cannot go too long without actual rest even with all the upgrades he had been doing to himself, whether that be through the Force or otherwise. Anakin started to think about his progress with the Anderwil system, which had successfully come under the Skywalker banner, and it had been doing well. Droids are quite the useful resource. Then another had passed by with not much development, except when it came to himself, which again allowed him to introduce even more of the implants that the Kaminans had worked on for him. In what would have been known as 26 BBY in an alternate future, Anakin would go through yet another surgery to include even more implants designed with the sole purpose of increasing his capabilities. He had also finally become his full height towering above a lot of others, and it was quite the weird contrast when comparing himself to the girls around himself. Two meters is a very tall height. The Priomna is the seventh of the 19 Sky Seed organs that were implanted into Anakin. The Priomna is essentially a second or prestimage spliced into the human digestive system above the original stomach that allows Anakin to eat otherwise poisonous or completely indigestible materials. The Priomna is capable of biochemically analyzing ingested materials, and neutralizing most known biochemical and inorganic toxins, and many others that remain unknown, save for their toxic effects. Deadly poisons are either neutralized or isolated from the digestive tract by the Priomna. The Priomna can also be isolated from the rest of the digestive tract to deal with particularly toxic substances, that Anakin and may simply vomit back up later. Often these extracted toxins are rerouted, and then molecularly stored in the Betcher's gland for future usage. Then there was the Omophagia, the eighth of the 19 genetically engineered sky seed organs that were implanted into Anakin. The Omophagia is implanted into the spinal cord, and then wired into the central nervous system so that it is directly attached to the cerebral cortex and to the stomach. It allows him to gain a part of an individual person's or creature's memory, by eating its flesh. This special organ is implanted between the thoracic vertebrae and the stomach wall, and is designed to absorb information and any DNA, RNA or protein sequences related to experience or memory. In fact within his previous world stuff like this was sort of real, but obviously not capable to the extent this implant was capable of, and the only reason this was possible, was because of the force and the original creator being obsessed with evolution of the human race. This implant thus allows him to literally learn by eating. Four new nerve bundles are also implanted connecting the spine and the stomach wall. The omophagia transmits the gained information to Anakin's brain as a set of memories or experiences. This enables him to gain information in a survival or tactical sense, simply by eating an animal indigenous to an alien world, and then experiencing some of what that creature did before its death. By some estimations by the Kaminans though is that it is possible over time, mutations in this implant sky seed could give some or even himself an unnatural craving for blood or flesh. That is of course it mutates in a way that is detrimental. Next is the multi-lung the ninth of the 19 genetically engineered sky seed organs that were implanted into Anakin. The multi-lung is a third lung implanted into his pulmonary and circulatory systems in the chest cavity, that is able to absorb oxygen from environments usually too poor in oxygen to allow normal human respiratory functioning. Breathing is accomplished through a sphincter implanted into the trachea, allowing all three lungs to be used at full capacity. In toxic environments, a similar muscle closes off the normal lungs. Thus oxygen is absorbed exclusively by the multi-lung, which then filters out the poisonous or toxic elements. The multi-lung has highly efficient toxin dispersal systems, quite the set of capabilities and the only way he could have everything implanted into himself was if there was enough space to do so. Otherwise it would be impossible, and that was what the Sith who designed this had forethought for. In this design some implants must be done first like the first three, the secondary heart, a smodular and biscopy, meant to regulate the growth hormones of his body. He didn't stop there however, as he could do even more and implant even more, as long as he recovered fast enough from the operations that had taken place, and within one month, he could implant even more. Six more were to come, but were not introduced simultaneously like some other phases could be. The oculub is the tenth of the 19 genetically engineered sky seed organs that were implanted into Anakin. This implant sits at the base of the brain, after being implanted along the optic nerve and connected to the retina and provides hormonal and genetic stimuli, which enable his eyes to respond to the optic therapy that he must undergo. These procedures, in turn, allowed him to make adjustments to the growth patterns of the eyes and their light receptive retinal cells. The result is that Anakin having visual acuity that is far superior to that of baseline humans, and they can see in low light conditions and near darkness almost as well as in bright daylight. He didn't really need this implant too much considering his nanosuit's capability.
capabilities. But it definitely helped immensely. The next implant is the Lyman's ear, the 11th of the 19 genetically engineered sky seed organs that were implanted into Anakin. Not only does this implant's improved inner ear structure make our Anakin immune to dizziness or motion sickness, but it also allows him to consciously filter out and greatly enhance certain sounds over the capabilities of normal human hearing. This works great in tandem with his already semi-mechanized body through the nano suit, further increasing the ranges that he can tap into. The Lyman's ear completely replaces one of his original ears, and in fact Anakin had decided that replacing one ear wasn't enough and did so with the other as well. It is externally indistinguishable from a normal human ear in size and shape. It was named after one of the people who had helped the original Sith creator make this design. The next implant was the Sussan membrane, the 12th of the 19 genetically engineered organs created from his specific sky seed. That can be implanted into a normal human but was used to transform him into a superhuman. Initially implanted within the cranium, this membrane eventually merges with the recipient's cerebrum, becoming a full part of his neural architecture. The organ's functions are ineffective without follow-up chemical therapy and training, but with sufficient practice and instruction, Anakin can use this implant to enter a state of suspended animation consciously or as an automatic reaction to extreme trauma, keeping them alive for years, even if he has suffered otherwise mortal wounds. Only the appropriate chemical therapy or hypnotic autosuggestion would be able to revive him from this state. Another that was called the melanochrome is the 13th of the 19 genetically engineered sky seed organs that were implanted into Anakin. This hormonal implant is attached to the human lymphatic system and controls the amount of melanin within his skin. Exposure to high levels of sunlight will result in the his skin naturally darkening to compensate. But he was not exposed to such levels and remained his original skin color. It also protects him from other forms of electromagnetic radiation. In fact, he had gotten even paler than he was before because of all the natural protections he already has against various background radiation from his nano suit. Different levels of radiation cause variations of skin color and different due to mutations in the melanochrome organ specific genetic cellular structure, in particular Anakin's sky seed variant, didn't result in much of a change within his skin color, expect become more pale. It did, however, change his eye color slowly and steadily which he took as some form of reaction between the Force and his natural genetics coming together in a way to better represent who he is. Now instead of the blue eyes he was born with, they had changed into a violet color. In fact as time went on and on his original blonde hair started to turn more curly, and a darker shade of blonde, which he then began comparing his new looks to the Targaryens from a series of books and a TV series from his previous life. He just didn't have the silvery white hair. He had the features that made him look like them. Of course this brought further attention to himself, but most still didn't ask him about it. Some tests were done that was why, which he manipulated to just make sure it only showed up with results, that it was some delayed genetic mutation. Delayed albinism that was dormant before some unknown factor triggered the specific genetics which lead to this result. So he didn't have to worry about others questioning his new looks. The allitic kidney is the 14th of the 19 genetically engineered sky seed organs that was implanted within Anakin. The organ is implanted within the abdominal cavity, and it becomes a part of the excretory system, an emergency detoxification organ that allows survival to exposure through the respiration, tactile contact or ingestion of poisons, toxins and gases that are too powerful for even his rugged immune system to normally process without this organ's help. Not that Anakin in particular would be needing this considering everything, but it was a part of the normal upgrades and genetic manipulation, and he didn't want to upset the delicate balance within the creator design. However, this detoxification process could render him unconscious once it begins, so it can be very dangerous if required during combat. Under normal circumstances, the elytic kidney also acts as a regulatory organ for Anakin's physiology, maintaining the efficient action of the advanced circulatory system, and the proper functioning of his other organs implanted or natural. The last implant of the year, the neuroglobus, is the 15th of the 19 genetically engineered sky seed organs implanted into himself. The organ is implanted within the upper nasal passage and after it is functioning, chewing, tasting or smelling a substance allows biochemical testing for toxicity and nutritional content essentially determining if the substance is edible or poisonous. The organ would also allow Anakin to identify extremely subtle odors with the same fidelity as the average canine bred for tracking, allowing him to even track his quarry by smell or taste alone. The 14th and 15th were able to be introduced together, and Anakin had that done at the same time. In total the amount of time it took spanned across a few months, not that his healing factor didn't speed up the process. The healing factor and his nanosuit covered up for any of the surgical scars before they healed just as they had always done. There was a mission that Anakin was interested in because it involved a force sensitive he wanted to persuade in joining him. Lorana wasn't the only person he wanted to experiment with when it came to testing their respective loyalties. Neither was Rinala who had been working for his Vader persona. Anakin was later sent on a mission to find out what had happened to the consular class cruiser, the Radiant X, which was carrying the Jedi at Rex, and Allison salts back to Coruscant to be punished for falling to the dark side. He discovered that while on their flight, a large group of Minox had fed on energy from the ship's electrical couplings, causing the ship to plummet into the gravity well in the Hoth system, and crash landed on an asteroid known as the Poison Moon. The distress signal was sent even as Seltz killed everyone on the ship. Rex managed to escape Seltz and befriend a group of Minox. When Anakin had found Seltz on the bridge of the ship, she insisted that it was Rex who did it. Anakin sent out some droids to go and find 
found Rex, leaving himself with Seltz. When his droids found Rex, Rex had the droids send a message back to him about Seltz, and that she was framing him. Anakin knew of this already, and had waited for Seltz's temptation. In the meantime, Seltz tried to convince him to leave the Order, but instead of accepting he managed to convince her to join him. Seltz having accepted rather easily was set to Tatooine, just as he had done so with Lorana, further increasing the amount of Force-sensitive people within his in-progress organization. He went back to Coruscant with Rex, but kept it a secret that she had joined under him. Why would he alert people of this woman anyway? This would take up the number of four sensitives within his new organization to a total amount of three. One Sith-based Renala, one Jedi-based Lorana and one Dark Jedi-based Alice and Seltz. There was one special mission that Anakin wanted to be a part of in the year of 25 BBY, otherwise known within the Great Resynchronization Calendar as the 10th year where Anakin is 16 or turning 16. This mission involved the life and death of one of the Jedi Masters on the High Council, Yaddle. Later, that same year, Anakin along with Yoda and Yaddle, was sent on a negotiation mission to Marwan to settle a devastating gang war, in which three criminal organizations fought one another. These gangs, led by Decker the Hutt, Fianatala, and the mysterious Striker, caused the remainder of the population to take refuge underground. During the mission, Skywalker was nearly kidnapped, but had went undercover and followed Striker's men. Anakin revealed himself to put an end to this menace, and sadly for Granta, none of this was going to work, because he had nothing he wanted. Striker, revealed to be Granta Omega, tried tempting him to leave the Jedi Order and come with him, offering many things. When Granta saw that Anakin would not yield, he tried to get him confined and arrange a meeting with himself and Yaddle. Unbeknownst to her and the rest of the Jedi, the chaotic planet was a trap set for the Jedi by Omega. He released a fatal chemical weapon that killed Yaddle when she absorbed it through the Force. Well, she had nearly done so herself, but Anakin making use of his new implants and the Force absorbed it instead of her. This led to him of course being poisoned, but it didn't kill him because of his enhanced capabilities. Anakin had inadvertently saved the capital city of Nartan. The weapon was intended by its vengeful maker to kill Anakin, but it failed because it wouldn't have done anything to him. Anakin immediately after contacted Master Yoda to help bring Yaddle away, where afterwards Anakin managed to bring peace to Marlin. More work done by Space Jesus. Anakin thought to himself, saving Yaddle was a priority because there were not a lot of whatever species she was a part of that existed within the galaxy, apart from Yoda, Yaddle and Grogu, whom he had the pleasure of meeting. In fact from what Anakin could remember and had researched within the galaxy, the only known of this weirdly powerful species he knew of was only Yoda, Yaddle and Grogu. The species, its origins shrouded in mystery, was rarely seen, with only a few members known to the wider galaxy. All known members of the species active in the galaxy were Force users, and affiliated with the Jedi. At least that was from the canon timeline, and from the Legends timeline. There were a few others, but that was extremely limited in information as well. While there were three that was canon present, he had only heard about others from history, Vandatoka, Otagam Minch, where they were all from eras long past. Meaning that there was technically only three living members of this enigmatic and very confusing species. Anakin had transformed, and those who were close to him obviously became extremely interested in what had happened to him. Even more hilarious was the fact that he was so tall, that the girls were only below his waist in height, referring specifically to Ahsoka and Barris. But for Isla and Shark, these two were actually tall enough to be above his waist, and actually at least reach his lower chest. If he got any taller he would become afraid of squishing these girls going off of by how tall he is. But he shouldn't really worry about this, since he has full control over his strength, and they can increase their own endurance through the Force. While he was 2.1 meters in comparison to how tall he is, Isla's 1.1 1.72 meters and sharks 1.78 meters of height was about an average range for both of their species. While for himself, he could be considered a monstrous genetically gifted individual among his species of humans. Not that his was all that natural per se, but that doesn't really matter now does it? He would dislike getting any taller as well, as while height was not all important, it would cause an imbalance with his relationship with any of the girls. Anakin remembered the time that the girls had asked him about the change, as even though he carried the same features he always had, the difference was still noticeable. His hair becoming a curly and dark shade of blonde hair, while his eyes going from its bright blue to a bright violet color, is certainly different enough to warrant a reaction. Arnie! Can you tell me just how your hair color and eye color have changed so much? Isla asked Anakin as Ahsoka and Barris were just as interested in this fact. Anakin had already been confronted about this by many others as well. So he faked a test to absolve people's worries, and confirm that he was alright in every sense of the word. You have seen the test results haven't you? Anakin asked himself. We have but I believe there is more to your change than simply a dormant genetic variable. Barris added from her own expertise. Barris herself was getting better and better under Anakin's tutelage, was able to increase her own expertise, knowledge of science and medicine to better accommodate and facilitate her interests. You want the truth do you? Anakin asked. The three girls within the room nodded. Ahsoka included because she had grown up and was starting to understand the world more and more herself. Anakin had helped them all in regards to the development and protection of their minds, and he knows he could trust them especially since a force bond had been developing as well, which is a result of their time together and the closeness they share with each other. Obviously, for now his bond with Isla is a bit more special, but that doesn't mean the other two should be excluded. While Isla had been in the know, Ahsoka and Barris didn't know why he was different from the average human, excluding his status as the chosen one of course. Well I believe it is better if I just transfer some information over to the two of you. What Informat Dash Barris was about to ask, but Anakin just formed a telepathic link with her and Ahsoka, letting them 
instantly know about what he had been doing. Anakin had seen that Ahsoka developed enough maturity to also be able to handle such information and allow the transfer of such for her. While Barris has become and been his first student, his first apprentice, she also was mature enough and he trusted her enough to reveal this to her. He was slowly and surely revealing to the three about what he has been doing. Of course, he doesn't tell them everything as he is a greedy person himself. He knows the value of information and as such keeps a lot to himself. But that doesn't mean he can just keep for himself the entirety of however long he is to live. That would burden anyone. But he understands that secrets are only powerful because they are secret. What is this? Ahsoka asks because she doesn't have a mind for stuff like this. She may be strong within the Force, but her talents do not lie within this area or field. It is something that I had inadvertently discovered and have been for a few years now been using for myself to increase my physical capabilities overall. Anakin answered her question. Barris says something next. From what this tells me it is extremely painful. Her voice quivered Q bit when going over the information she was given. How could you do this to yourself? I will not question what everyone here does for themselves. Because it is not my right to tell you what to do, all I ask of you all is your support. Anakin replies, Isla hadn't said anything, but had quickly embraced him, and considering his size, she couldn't actually fully wrap her arms around him. Ahsoka was quick to follow after Isla's actions, because she also had nothing more to say, but to assure Anakin, that she was with him through physical affection. Barris was the last one to do so as she was not used to things like this even with a lot of time spent with him. I am glad the three of you, even though you may not like my actions, you respect that it is of my choice. Anakin stated as he also embraced them one by one. After a while they had all discussed things with Anakin, and while Ahsoka for now would be left out of going to his secret spot to conduct his transformations, Isla and Barris had made it adamant that they would remain by his side. Anakin believed it wouldn't be appropriate for Ahsoka to see that type of stuff, at least not at her current age just yet. Strangely enough Anakin was starting to feel a special sensation through his force bond with Barris, and it emitting a similar vibe like the one he has with Isla. He had been trying to see if he could sever the connection between himself and Isla, not because he wanted to in particular, but because he wanted to increase his control and to see whether or not he could do so. But there had not been any luck. But he was starting to notice a unique feeling when it came to it. Such a feeling was starting to be emitted from Barris. This told him that it may be time for another connection to form with another girl that he is close with, and would most probably elevate their relationship with each other. Another thing to factor is that it had also happened with another, which is why he was so clear in knowing that it was going to happen with Barris as well. He had created another force died with Shark T. Something that Isla and Shark T were able to notice from each other was their bond to him allowed them to know who else he is bonded with. This increased Isla's insecurities for a while before Anakin had assured her of her place within his heart. While Shark was of no help really, and while he had come to accept that she would share a special relationship with himself, and Isla had accepted this as well, it didn't mean Shark was ready for the secrets he kept. Why? Because she has been so deeply indoctrinated by the Jedi, it would be hard to change her mind. Given their newfound connection however it would make it easier to do so. When it came to the relationship between Isla and Shark T, is that she had come to know of the bond, but didn't talk about it much. She did however take some sadistic pleasure in messing with Isla, by saying quite some scandalous things. Even though she had accepted it, it also didn't mean she was going to delve into it even when the Force would tell her to do so. Shark had been keeping her distance from Anakin as much as possible for fear of becoming attached. Something that old Jedi for some reason resented, especially more so for Shark who is quite the isolating person. Not that it was really by her choice, given that was just the way her entire demeanor and look scared off those of whom would have befriended her. Not that Anakin cared all that much for this. But it did matter to her, and because of this, she would try to keep her distance, but still be strangely drawn to him. If she resisted well enough it was Anakin whom was drawn to her because that was just the way the bond worked. The more she fought it the harder it became. It can be related to how the force works, while the light side is an ocean where you flow with the tide, while the dark side is you becoming a whirlpool, that tries to create their own flow against the currents. That's why it was so corrupting, and that is why Shakti became more and more deeply infatuated with him, simply because she resisted. It goes to show that Anakin could see that he somehow had compatibilities with many women, something he thought was impossible for what a dyad is. He also knows that it would only work on other force-sensitive individuals as well. Strangely enough he had an idea that maybe, just maybe it may work on Padme. That was only if he created a way to have her access the force, and he was not to that point yet. But he had a lot of theories on how this may be done. The year is the 10th year according to the Great Resynchronization's calendar. He is 16, and he could finally begin the final process of transforming himself into the complete design, according to the Sith of Old's information. The Kaminans had delivered on their promise, and it would seem that he would have to continue and finally start the synthetic human project. Anakin was joined underneath the Jedi Temple by both Isla and Barris because of their concern. Obviously he had made an effort to conceal any pain he felt, and was successful in doing so because he thought it would be not nice for them to experience what he felt as well. You may begin, Anakin told one of his hidden medical droids beneath. At first when brought here they were afraid, the first time for Isla certainly brought up her trauma from the past, but she had powered through it for him. He was especially touched by this, and was just about ready to take the next step with her. Given he has had some time for his body to develop he is excited to do so. When it came to Barris she had less trouble dealing with it, because she didn't have any related trauma but it was certainly hard for her as well. Most of the time he just shielded them from very dark and corrupting energies underneath, but a lot of the time the two actively came here to meditate on the Force. It seemed that they still remained unaffected by the dark side despite this, and kept their alignments to the light through the Force. Anakin assumed this was a combination of their connection to him and their own willpower, 
The last four implants weren't the last of the design, and there was even a few extra after that, but the information on these was not enough, and would take an even longer time to uncover what these actually were. These last four also couldn't be introduced at the same time, not unlike a few others before, so he would have to take his time with this, and through the next few weeks, he would have multiple intense sessions of surgery. Thankfully by now the Jedi Council had given up in trying to forcefully get him to do things for them, as he had slowly grown tired of doing things that didn't benefit him. Not that he was against helping others, no, it was that he felt believed and even logically, was able to see through his mental processes he could do so much better. The Mucronoid is the 16th of the 19 Sky Seed organs to be implanted within Anakin. This organ is implanted within the central nervous system, and responds to specific chemical stimuli in the environment, which would cause Anakin to secrete a waxy protein substance, similar to mucus through his balls, that seals his skin. The gland's operations must first be activated by an external chemical treatment, usually self-administered, before it will activate. He would be cocooned in this way before entering suspended animation, and the process can even protect him from the harshness of the vacuum and other extremes of temperature, particularly deeply frigid environments. Not that he really needed this when taken into consideration his nano suit, but it was a nice feature nonetheless to increase his survivability in any environment. The Betcher's gland is the 17th of the 19 genetically engineered sky seed organs that are implanted into Anakin, consisting of two glands that are implanted into multiple locations inside his mouth, including the inside of the lower lip, in the salivary glands or in the hard palate. These two glands working in tandem, transform saliva into a corrosive, blinding acid when consciously triggered. This would allow Anakin to spit a wad of corrosive acid, with the effect of blinding, wounding or even killing an enemy outright. These implants more common uses to aid in the digestion of unusually difficult or impossible things to digest, such as cellulose. It is possible that if any new Sky Seed variants were created it could lose functionality. Or at least that was what was projected by the Kaminan scientists. And when he got a look at this stuff himself he had agreed. This is a useful thing however, even though he will not really need to spying function in a fight. But it increases his options. What was most important is the ability to eat more types of things if need be. He was still a living creature after all, and still needed to eat. The progenoid glands, also known as the Sky Seed are the 18th of the 19 genetically engineered sky seed organs implanted Anakin. One is implanted in the neck and another in the chest. The organs hormonally respond to the presence of the other sky seed implants in the body by creating germ cells with DNA, identical to that of those implants through a process very similar to cellular mitosis. These germ cells grow and are stored in the progenoid organs, much like sperm cells or egg cells are stored in the teeth and ovaries of normal men and women. When properly cultured, these germ cells can be gestated into each of the 19 sky seed organs needed to create another just like him. This means he could practically have children know this special method in a sense, because they would inherit his sky seed variant. If Anakin was create another sky seed variant from another being or person, it would turn out differently and their mutations would be different from his own. This was created not just by the original creator, but also by the Kaminans and himself, because it was impossible to continuously create more of his special cells through any other process. The Kaminans just didn't have the correct capabilities of being able to clone his cells. This was in part because of the force and the way it acts when it comes to cloning force-sensitive people. Mature progenoid organs can be removed, and new sky seed implants artificially culture from them. This is the only way new implants can be created, so Anakin and the Kaminans depend upon this implant and Anakin in particular to create others. Through projections, five years after implantation, the progenoid gland in the neck would contain mature sky seed, and may be removed, and its germ cells harvested, while the larger chest progenoid is not considered ready for harvesting, until 10 standard years have passed. The harvesting can be done as he is still alive, but they would also be able to do so if he were to die. But he wouldn't die now would he? The harvesting is normally done after someone dies, by design by a medic steeped in sky seed knowledge, who carries a special attachment on the mobile medical field kit he carries on his arm, known as a Narthesium. This attachment is called a redactor, and it is specifically used to extract both progenoid glands from the body of his slain body, so that his sky seed can be used to replace another's loss. Anakin had to create himself another method of which he could transfer his special cells, and was successful in doing so, because he found that if he wanted to have his synths have the same implants as him, he would need to do so. The Kaminans weren't of any help in this endeavor as they saw no proper reason, which would have angered him, if he didn't already know the way the Kaminans worked. The Black Carapace, also known as the Interface, is the last and one of the most important of all the 19 Sky Seed organ implants for Anakin. This neuroactive black organic fibrous material is implanted directly under the skin of his torso. Points are then cut through the carapace by one of his controlled medical droids, using surgical tools that allow him to directly interface his central nervous system with his power armor cybernetic systems. That is right, power armor. While through the nano suit Anakin could already use an interface and it had been combined with him, if he wanted to complete the design and become the best he could, he would continue with the process. After a few solar hours, the material hardens in invasive synthetic fiber bundles that will serve as connection points for neurons grow inward and interlink with the Anakin's now newborn central nervous system. Note that Anakin needs the black carapace to use his power armor to its maximum capabilities, but the armor itself does not need this implant in order to function. Anakin had to look at himself and think up a way to recreate his entire suit, specifically his Vader suit. He wanted to make this his power armor, and he would only use the best of the best resources to do so. Also, when it came to the Kaminans, while they were good at genetic manipulation and other such things to do with medicine, it was Anakin here that had to fill the gap for this last implant. They were totally incapable of finding a way to fully create something perfect, and while Anakin's armor would be extremely powerful, 
It didn't mean his synth army would not have something nearly as strong. Again, resources are extremely important, and Anakin, even though having expanded his territories, was unable to really increase his rare resources stockpile. He would use the very best to make sure it becomes something capable of fully protecting him. But in case it does fail, he could rely on his nano suit. Coruscant, Jedi Temple, Anakin's room. Most of the year had gone by, and he had completed most of what he had wanted to do to himself, and now could start looking forward to other things. Anakin had put off the development of the obscure improvements for the Sky Seed implants till next year, where he would be 17. These next implants would be known as the Primus implants, separate from the rest of the originals. Because of this, Anakin would also postpone the development of the synths by another year before the completion of much more and better upgraded version of this template. Given that he had to wait on that end, he started to go through his memories to see if there was any force-related abilities that could allow one to interact with or change and manipulate one's own genetic structure. The Eye of the Small. Anakin had remembered something. Art of the Small was a radical and advanced force method of melding oneself with the force. Under meditation, a force user's presence shrinks to a microscopic size. While in this state, the user could operate molecules in any way they wanted, turning them into something completely different. The Art of the Small used to be a challenging altar-based force ability among the new Jedi Order, which was expected to take talented Jedi Knights a year or two in order to become an expert, meaning this technique had not been created just yet, and Anakin had the chance to begin making use of this extremely powerful technique. Well, it was created and maybe even named, but no one else knew of this. Through shrinking the force presence to that of a single atom, it allowed for an unprecedented degree of stealth as well as allowing for a perception of the universe on a molecular scale. Using telekinesis in this meditative state allows Jedi to eliminate toxins and cure certain ailments in others as well as in themselves by constructing healthy proteins and rebuilding cells. Years back that had happened with the disappearance of Verger on the planet that helped him create his own living vessel called Jabitha. She was important. Important because she was the one to create this technique and even name it. She would first have to create this technique under the insane pressure put upon her by the Yuzen Vom, who had captured her to help them in their future battles against the Republic. Anakin had other plans for this technique however, that he would use for himself and use on others. He wanted to analyze his own cells and the cells of other alien species, so he could change, manipulate and transform himself into gaining special abilities of other species. Something of importance to him was Yoda's species, specifically their long lifespan and he was wondering if he could give this for himself to allow him to live up to thousands of years of age. Not only for himself, but also for his mother and future lovers in the future. Not only Yoda's, but imagine if he could reverse engineer the genetics and the Force abilities of the Force wielder species. You know, the Mortis gods and their immortality and special connection to the Force. He also had to be cautious in transforming himself when he does go through with it. He knows that doing so would be dangerous, much more so than with the Sky Seed transformation, and would be so because of the things he had already done to his body. For now he was looking into other avenues for himself and for the betterment of his people. The galaxy at large is mostly populated by humans and near-human species, meaning most of his population would be so as well. That doesn't mean he wouldn't do things for other species as well. It just means that if he wanted to affect the most amount of lives possible, he would have to start with humans. Something he was designing without the aid of the Kaminans was a specialized bioengineered chromosome that would be introduced into humans. An artificial 24th chromosome, which integrates itself with the subject's existing DNA. The purpose of the new chromosome was to transform individuals into superhumans with enhanced strength, agility, and endurance. There were other effects as well. But the gist of what it would do is act as something that would take away the normal degradation of one's genetic structure to a number of factors, meaning genetic diseases would become non-existent. People would become smarter because the bioengineered chromosome would introduce and have humans naturally produce a new neurochemical that would replace the old one with something new. It would send signals faster throughout the body and brain, increasing intelligence through thought processing speed. It also increases the healing factor of a human's body to make them able to exhibit strength that the human body hides within itself, meaning with a strength and healing factor, it would allow a human to burst out with more physical force. Other benefits also include upgrading the other internal organs to increase their efficiency and all, and imagining the 24th chromosome in combination with the sky seed implants, Anakin can't help wanting to speed up the process. He would undoubtedly become stronger, but it would benefit others as well, which is something he has always been passionate about ever since reincarnating that is. He is still a selfish person after all, but if he could increase the human lifespan and eliminate genetic disorders and cancers from taking human life, why wouldn't he? Anakin was not sent on every mission the original went on with Obi-Wan, and in fact it was himself that was persuading the High Council to allow him on some of those missions. He has to take advantage of his knowledge of the future and his new abilities to see further into the future as well. Using it he can change events, and he has which has lead to positive results when it comes to life. A specific mission he wanted to go on and was allowed to take over was special because there was a human scientist who is extremely intelligent. Anakin was sent on a rescue mission in the Usil system to TY-44, one of the moons of the planet Tifidor. However, he had other plans, and instead of going there exactly he traveled to the planet called Banker. It is here that he was here for an important person that could help him. 
Anakin would have been put under the influence of a drug called the Zone of Self-Containment and taken prisoner by the insane and fanatical scientist Jenna Zen Arbor. That was if he didn't have any foreknowledge and didn't use the Force properly to predict this was going to happen. Even then his upgrades to his body simply didn't allow for him to be controlled, and he was easily able to dispel the effects of the drug. Jenna Zen Arbor was a human female, and a deranged scientist from the planet of Mosium. Throughout her career, she had numerous confrontations with the Qui-Gon Jinn, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and Anakin Skywalker. In the future, during the Clone Wars, she would have been a leading scientist working for the Confederacy of Independent Systems. When the war would end, she would then be drafted into working for the new Galactic Empire. Since Anakin is here though, he will take this opportunity to lure her into his own command. She is a valuable asset after all. At the beginning of her career, Jenna Zan Arbor was a famed scientist and the head of Arbor Industries. She was known for saving a planet from a pandemic after creating a vaccine for a deadly virus. Zan Arbor was also known to help planets with little technology, such as molasses and overcome their burdens. However, nobody knew that she actually started the problems in the first place to gain credits and improve her reputation. He doesn't care for this behavior all too much as long as he could control her to a certain extent. From what he understands about her, she wanted to be recognized for her work, even if it was her fault to begin with. She certainly was gifted, and he didn't mind giving her a pedestal to stand on. Fame is a rather fickle thing, and was easily to manipulate using the media, especially since Skywalker Industries is the parent company to one of his subsidiaries that works within the entertainment industry, Jenna Zan Arbor. Anakin spoke as he confronted the woman who was in her 40s, but still looked extremely good looking despite this. Why hello, handsome. Jenna practically purrs in response looking him up and down. Great, she is a cougar. Anakin thought to himself before responding. I have come here with a specific purpose in mind and would like to recruit you. Jenna was especially drawn to his looks, his features were quite handsome, and had filled in nicely, while through the Skyseed process, he had transformed into a great specimen. His dark blonde hair along with his now violet eyes, certainly are special features that would draw anyone in. But what was probably the most defining trait that lured her in was his height, because that was not natural for a normal human. This signaled to her that this person in front of her may dabble within the sciences just like her. Oh, you wish to have me? Jenna asked then continued. It looks like we both have the same goal then. What goal is that? Anakin asked. I want you, of course. Jenna wanted to capture and experiment on him. At least that was what he was able to read from her surface thoughts. Maybe I should have appeared as Vader instead, but then I would have less pull of sway. This woman is not normal, and it is better to tempt her with my body. Anakin thought to himself, you want me in what way? I just want you. All of you. How delicious you would be. Jenna said before continuing, if you have some sort of deal that could appeal to me, I would surely accept. I know you like your reputation. Anakin stated and then continued after pausing. I also know that you like your credits. Where is this going? Jenna questioned. This is going in a direction that you would no doubt like. I am also aware that you like anything that has to do with the Force, and those who are capable of using it. Anakin continued. I have had an interest you are correct. Jenna replied. Well, if you couldn't tell I am a Force sensitive and not only that, I could provide you with everything you could ever want. The only condition is you work under me and stay loyal. Anakin gave his offer. That is an offer I couldn't refuse. But I want something more. Jenna replies. I want you. I am afraid that I am not something that can be used as a bargain. Anakin replied. You are quite the specimen, and I believe I would be able to discover many interesting things from your body. Jenna said. I am sure you can. But if you want to discover why I am like this, you would have to accept my offer. Anakin continued. I accept. Jenna answered. The two would then go on to finalize everything with Anakin, giving her what she wanted, a rather sizable amount of credits paid to her, and a position within his research department on Tatooine. Despite her flaws, she was still someone who had a conscience, and would not take things too far when it came to doing things. She had already done so once before, and she terribly regretted it. Jenna would then meet up with Renala who was also a part of this department, and the two would get along splendidly. Not. Anakin had trouble with these two getting along, since their personalities tended to have them clash. But because they were both intelligent and were extremely useful to him, all he did was made sure to better accommodate them. It is not like he doesn't know what these two women were like and what they wanted. After the mission that gave him the opportunity to get Jenna onto his side, which as a result would save thousands, millions if not billions of lives, due to the terrible things she would have created in the future. Due to this it would forever change the direction of some events making it so that those who would cause destruction and chaos would be reduced. An all in all good decision. There was something he was interested in however, which was the Valley of the Dark Lords, originally known as the Valley of the Sleeping Kings, was a valley and burial ground of the Sith Lords of Korriban. Originally constructed by the planet's natives as a burial ground for their kings, the exiles of the Jedi Order who came to be known as the Dark Lord of the Sith added their own tombs to the valley. Along with several prominent tombs, the valley was home to the ancient Sith Great Temple and the Sith Academy, which loomed over the valley for several millennia. Unfortunately this place had already been plundered of everything that was useful, or would have been useful by the time Anakin would have gotten there, way before his rebirth, for now he would put off his plans of going there. What he had to do next was finally introduce the actual final implants of his superhuman transformation. He obviously didn't have everything he wanted to do just yet, and was starting to work on the 24th chromosome. Combining everything together should make he incredibly powerful. Another thing was when it came to his synths, he had to wait for his progenoid implant to mature and develop, before he could get to work on making more people like him. The Kaminans have his advanced cellular genetics, 
but they needed the specialized cells that are within the implanted glands. That was the projected problem from the original creator, and even from the Kaminans themselves, when they looked over the contents. There are not enough resources for everything he wanted, and it would seem that since the ancient times there was not enough to complete the design as well. The things he had to collect were quite varied, but thankfully technology was advanced enough, and he had the minimal amount to create these genetic transformations. Underneath the Jedi Temple on Coruscant Anakin was once again doing an operation. Barris and Ayla were of course present for the surgery, just as they had been there for the others, and he was grateful for their concern. He was also not concerned at all about them coming to know of this information because in the future, there would be much bigger secrets to reveal, and he was willing to do so in the future. For now though he thinks this is enough. The medical droids then began the next surgeries which would take place over the course of a few weeks, because his healing factor has gotten that strong. It would only get better as more time passes. What Anakin had decided to call this more advanced version of Sky Seed was the Primrose Sky Seed. This type is also much more genetically stable than the previous version, meaning there would be less mutations for himself and his future people. He couldn't wait for his living droids to get proper working biological bodies, capable of withholding the midi chlorians he wishes for them to keep. The sinew coils are an implant that Anakin's sinews are reinforced with geometallic core cables that can contract with incredible force, magnifying his strength as well as giving his body another layer of defense. He would become capable of crushing another's skull within his hand without the aid of the force, break flak armor to finders, or even bite through a metal cable, should the need arise. This implant had no requirements beforehand, but on average the Kaminans had given him a time frame of which would be perfect to implant this. It would have to come sometime after the 19th implant within the original design. Mac and the sinew cause the 20th of them all. The Magnificat is a small, thumbnail-sized lobe that is inserted into the brain's cortex. The Magnificat secretes hormones that increase the body's growth functions, whilst also intensifying the function of its other transhuman implants, especially those of the Biscopianthius modular. As a result, Anakin would become even taller by an entire fort, and physically stronger than their standard counterparts. Anakin would become even greater in size than what he is now, which is certainly not something that he really wanted, because as his size increases, so does the amount of area there is to land a hit on him. He would start to lose some of his nimbleness in doing this, not because he is unable to control himself, but because becoming a giant inherently makes you easier to hit. He has no control over how much more he would grow however, so he might be getting even taller than what he is now. The projected height and measurement he had done himself was around 2.4 to 2.6 meters tall. Compared to an average human they would only reach around his abdominal area. The Magnificent is meant to be implanted when he was younger however, so it is entirely possible he will not reach the full-on height that he could if it had been done earlier. Really Anakin would in general stay around 7 foot tall, because he had done some level of control over the hormones that the implants modify. In truth, the Magnificat is but half of a true dual valve mortis gland, otherwise known as the so-called God Maker. This in theory would make Anakin immortal, but from the original design, the creator did not have enough information, materials, and was lacking. When it came to discovering the secrets of immortality, it would seem that everyone wants eternal life, well, maybe everyone. If Anakin had a phase for this implant, it would be the fourth in between the Biscopi and the Hemastamon. I have been doing research my Self into what this so-called Immortus gland is, and the Kaminans know nothing about it. Anakin was weary about the Kaminans or anyone else really getting their hands on a blueprint to become immortal. The last of the mysterious implants was called the Belisarian Furnace, a dormant organ that connects to both both of Anakin's hearts. The one he was born with and the one he had created. In times of extreme stress, or should his body undergo violent, damaging trauma, it expels great blurts of self-synthesized chemicals, a hyper cocktail that simulates the biological action of combat stems, while also aiding in the rapid regrowth of tissue, bone and muscle. The gland then falls dormant again, and takes some time to metabolically build itself up once more for the next usage. Of course for Anakin, yet again it was different when taking into account the various other benefits granted to him through the falls, and his nanosuit further increasing his natural regeneration. To put it simply, his healing factor has become so extreme it would be so much harder to kill him, and in fact he basically has immortality, yet doesn't. All of this only when he is 17 years of age, making him complete or near complete, is he will have to wait to see any changes made by the magnificent implant. Would he become even taller than what he is now, or would he remain somewhat the same? Arnie, are you alright? Isla questioned him after his supposed final operation, considering that there may be one more in the future to complete the Immortus gland. Yes, I am fine. Anakin replied as he got up from the surgical table as nothing was used to numb the pain. He didn't want to transmit his pain or display he was in pain, because that would hurt the both of them. The emotions of women are strange but not unpredictable, well sometimes it is unpredictable, but he has had enough experience to know what might happen if he said or did the wrong thing. All of these surgeries you are doing surely must be dangerous. Barris being the more knowledgeable of the two women said to him in a questioning tone. You have all the data and know what I have to go through. But that doesn't even matter, because you didn't see me in pain, or even feel any pain through the force bond to me anyway. Anakin replied, they both roll their eyes as even if they can't feel it, because he shuts it off, that doesn't mean they are unaware or stupid. What say we do some other things in the meantime? Anakin questions to take their minds off of the topic of his experimentation. Anakin had officially turned 17, and after a lot of successful mission, he was finally being promoted after a few long years of non-stop monotony. Jedi Knight Anakin Skywalker, it has only been a few short years since you have been promoted from a Padawan, and now you will be given another promotion today. Mace was present for the promotion for himself. In fact, all of the High Council was present for such an event, because he was now officially the youngest person ever to become a Jedi Master as well. Jedi Master you shall become a seat 
seat on the council you may receive. This is if you wish to take a seat that is. The Grandmaster stood up and announced to everyone present. Most people were surprised, and some even gasped because this would set another new record throughout the order. Even more surprising it was Yoda who had decided to hand over one of the vacant seats to Anakin, because he was of the most afraid of the Jedi right from the start. Anakin had predicted this outcome through the various means and methods he had access to him, whether that be through the Force or his ability to connect the dots through logical forethought. There were many benefits to becoming a part of the Council, but he had decided that if it were to ever be presented to him he would reject. He would have less free time to explore the things he wanted to do himself. And there was a lot of things for him to do. I will have to decline the seat. Anakin answered, reason you do have. Yoda asked him, I just like Qui-Gon as everyone here must know have my own misgivings. Anakin stated not afraid of confronting the stubborn lot. We are aware of your antics, and it would seem Qui-Gon has led you astray in this manner. Kai Adi Mundi said as he was one of the strictest when it came to the Jedi Code. I think that is enough Master Mundi. It would seem that Anakin has made his decision and we shall respect it. Mace having formed a positive relationship with Anakin was easily able to look away from his disrespect, because his own thoughts were starting to change as well. In fact he had been influencing a lot of Jedi younglings for a long while now with him participating in many of their lessons. This was once something that was a cause for concern, but whatever investigation they did ended up with no results that would point to some misconduct. I thank the masters here that believe that I am ready to become a master. Anakin dispels the tension within the room by saying this. Yes, I believe that will be all for today. Mace says as everyone starts to exit the room, but Anakin has something more to say, not to any of them, but towards Shakti. Shakti had become a part of the Jedi High Council this very year, as a replacement to one of the Jedi Masters that had died. She would have replaced Yaddle if Anakin didn't save her, but there was still an open seat. Master Yerl Poof was slain, so she had been offered the seat. Master T, I would like to have a word with you. Anakin signals her out as the rest continue to leave them alone. After everyone else had left it was only Anakin and Shark left within the room, and a slightly awkward atmosphere was being created. Well, what is it that you wanted to talk about? Shark was given off the vibe of not wanting to talk as if she wanted to escape the area. Anakin being aware. Much more now than when he had first met her, knew she didn't like her new feelings. I believe that it is appropriate we talk about a few things. Anakin said before she could make an excuse to leave. Talk about what exactly? Shark tries to play it off but she knows full well what he was confronting her about. I think you know exactly what I mean. Anakin said then transitioned from physical speech to mental communication. You won't be able to escape what has happened. On instinct she replies mentally herself. I deny this. A Jedi must not be attached. I should not, you should not, and no other Jedi should as well. It was the pact, the commitment we agreed to when becoming a Jedi. Are you sure that you agreed with this? With what agency did you have and with what choice did you make when you were brought to the Jedi? Anakin questioned. I, I made my choice. I stayed with the Jedi because I believe this is the place I am meant to be in. Shark answered. It would seem that you still deny our bond. Anakin then continued telepathically. Let me show you what would happen to you if you were to stay with the Jedi. Anakin then proceeded to tell a story. A story of how she would have lead a life of isolation within the Jedi before dying because she was a part of it. He conveniently left out bits and pieces that may have indicated that he was a part of the cause within another timeline, because that wouldn't be a good look. He was here to confuse and persuade her into accepting the bond, as he had no way to sever it even if he wanted to. At least not yet. Shark T drops to the ground and is on her knees seeing these events take place. Seeing her potential future and the choices she had made that even when in the right place, still lead to the consequence of death. And it was all for nothing. Anakin went towards her and embraced her within a warm hug, giving her some emotional support in this moment. She silently cried as she held onto him, which led to Anakin thinking he was taking advantage of the situation he had created. Well this kind of makes me feel like a scumbag, even when I am right Anakin thought to himself. Anakin had calmly settled everything with Shark T, and she was not avoiding him like she was, and in fact had become even more attached after that event. Given he had revealed a potential future to her and through their bond, she could see the truth in his honesty, he wasn't surprised. Just as settling one problem is good, and all it doesn't stop it from creating another. One problem leads to another because that is just the way it is. After Shark's warming up to him, it was apparent that Isla was able to easily pick up on the difference between him and Shark. Another was Barris and her new connection to him by a creative force diet which he had to manage and deal with. Having the affections of multiple women is surely a great thing, but that doesn't mean it is no work at all. Anakin was within the training room given to him by the Jedi alongside Isla. She was meditating and seemed to be very contemplative about something. Her concentration was very intense, and he was curious as to what exactly she was struggling with. He could always invade her mind, but that really isn't conductive to a healthy relationship, and Anakin didn't like doing this much to others as well. It is best that she keep her privacy just as he is allowed to have his own. He doesn't need to know what is going through the minds of the women he is currently connected to all day, every day. With that, Anakin begins his own task of looking over his new design, especially made new armor. He had to make this armor sooner or later, and it would be his replacement for his Vader suit as he considered it incomplete to what he could have now, especially with the correct materials available to him, and his ability to synthesize much more powerful and much more capable metals. His design was a combination of many things which included the blueprints left behind by that ancient Sith holocron along with other things with which he took inspiration from. He didn't want anything too bulky as it could impede his movement, but he didn't want something that would be unable to fully protect him, while at the same time it needed to be aesthetically pleasing. Regal looking in a sense and the regal or royal look he was going for was an outfit that looked similar to Darth Vitiate. The interior was robed, 
but he wanted to add more metallic plating and have the mesh be better made. As Anakin was going over the design he didn't notice that Isla had actually snuck up behind him, and he was caught off guard as she jumped him. Isla had kissed him on the check, and as he turned around to say something, hey Dash, she kissed him on the lips while he was low enough for her to do so because of his height. She shyly let him go as he was briefly stunned by the display of affection. Well, that was quite an unexpected first kiss. While Anakin had kissed others before because of his nightly activities, that didn't mean he had actually officiated his relationship with any of those he was connected with. I thought about it long and hard, and have come to the decision that we should finally become a couple. Isla stated quite boldly, partially because there was no one else around to see this moment. A couple, eh? Anakin has a smile on his face, which brings an even deeper blush to Isla. Yes, she confirms with no hesitation. You also realize that I am currently not only connected to you and to others in this special way, correct? Anakin had informed the three he currently had a false diet with about what exactly it was, and what it was meant to entail. I have also taken that into consideration, and I believe that I wouldn't mind sharing you. Isla said then continued, I have known Barris for a long time now because of you and have come to think of her as my own sister. While with Master Shark, I am also aware of the small feud we have, but I have overcome this. I just want to be with you now, even if it is in secret. Isla says rather cutely before continuing. Do you agree? She was rather shy, but he could also feel her emotions because this confession was quite something. It embarrassed her, and she was also afraid about the answer. While not stated, it is quite implicit that Anakin had been giving off the vibes of not wanting to be in any type of romantic relationship. His reasons. He wasn't exactly ready himself, and he knew his own character well enough to know he would want more than one woman. He had practiced practically asked the force itself about this, and it only responded by sending him visions teasing him about it. It was his fault for reincarnating this way, indirectly making him like this. As if thinking it over and building some suspense on purpose, Anakin delays his answer. I think yes. She was both excited and anxious to hear his answer as she had grown rather impatient over the years, and was ready to fully accept this bond. In fact she had already done so and was ready to go all the way for him, even willing to leave the order. I believe yes. I feel that dash Anakin was cut off. Hurry up with it already. Isla caught onto what he was trying to do. Smiling, Anakin answers by picking her up and embracing her. Yes. He kisses her back and she is overjoyed. He could easily tell through their bond, as he was able to share in her feeling. What does that make us now then? Isla asks as he puts her back down. This means we are in an official relationship, but not a fair one per se. Since you have accepted I will have multiple significant others Anakin left off. You don't have to feel worried about that. I have already accepted this will happen. All I know is that I will be your first girlfriend, first lover, meaning that I have you to myself. Isla says in response. I am glad but feel slightly guilty dash. Anakin again began only to not finish his sentence. Isla decides to shut him up by merging her face with his, as they continued to kiss for quite a while, and it would seem they were both quite passionate about it. Anakin was more passionate than Isla, and had even wanted to continue their little play into something more intimate, but he was stopped by Isla. I think that is enough for now. Even though she was passionate herself that didn't mean she had no reason. They were currently within the training room that even though had become more secure as no intruders could get in without Anakin's express permission, that didn't mean there was no one else who could enter. One reason why Anakin was so passionate was because of the bond, the dyad, and in combination with his pronounced trait of lust from the magic ritual enhancing his desire. It really didn't help, but he was able to regain control of himself. Right, the others may come in. Anakin replied, I know that you know, we are both wanting to continue things. But yes, it would be bad if someone walked in on us. Isla expressed her concerns, more specifically Ahsoka. Anakin said, yes, the others as well, but Ahsoka is the most important here. Isla continued, Ahsoka was obviously still very young, and still had some innocence about her, even though she had recently started learning about adult things from the other women here. Because the Jedi don't really have the best track when it comes to things like this. Just as they were discussing and calming themselves down, the subject of their conversation made herself known by rushing Anakin and hugging onto his thigh. She had started to grow, but she was still not tall enough to really hug him as much yet. Arnie, Ahsoka called. I wanted to learn about. She then started to go on a rant about her day, and about what she wanted to be taught next full of energy, not realizing the ambiguous atmosphere between Anakin and Isla. Alright, I think you should calm down now. I think you need to go back to your meditation practice, Anakin said to Ahsoka because she was a bundle of excessive energy. Pouting, she replied. I don't like meditation though. That is too bad because without it you will grow slower and be unable to become an adult, Anakin said in jest. I am not a kid anymore. I know that what you said is a lie. Ahsoka said having a mini temper tantrum. All right, all right, I apologize. I was in the wrong. Anakin smiles down at the little girl. Ahsoka cutely blushes a bit having developed a crush as her teenage hormones were starting to kick in. Okay? Of course Anakin is not aware of this and doesn't think much of this. But Isla could see this. And could only sigh within her mind. Anakin may have been a playboy within his last life. But that didn't mean he was any good at noticing things like this. In fact he was quite oblivious and was only good with feminine kiss in relation to adult things. This man, I guess that is just how he is. Isla thought to herself. My master. Renala was pacing back and forth in her room allocated to her by Shmai Skywalker as she had started living within the palace alongside the other girls sent here. That is right, she had figured out who Vader truly was. 
Well, figured out would be a lie, because she had been told of his real identity. Anakin Skywalker, it made sense, sort of. But she would be lying if she said she wasn't confused, and couldn't exactly piece everything together. Renala then thought back to the time, and remembered just when he had revealed himself to her, and how excited she was. Anakin had made an entrance with another person back on Tatrayan under the Cloak of Darkness that was the night. He specifically was with Jenna and was headed to Renala, now believing that it is time to finally reveal himself to her. It just wouldn't be right if he revealed himself to Jenna but not her considering she has known him longer. The Prince. Renala was confused that Anakin had come when she was informed that Vader was making his way here. Excited she was at his reappearance as she didn't see him as often as she would have liked. In her view, Anakin had also come along with a beautiful and mature stranger, right to her which only further increased her confusion. Renala. Anakin spoke to her, knowing her name. Ah uh, yes. She replied in confusion. I think it is time I reveal myself. I am Vader. Anakin just straight up cut to the point. But we what? She was still confused, and it would seem the woman next to Anakin had something to say. So this is the best and the brightest of your researchers. Jenna questioned with derision. This angered her? But she was able to keep to herself her feelings, and not instantly lash out in anger. She had greatly improved with her progress within the Force, as she got limited training from whom she affectionately called her master. Instead she questions the prince. What do you mean you are Vader? I meant what I meant, is there something wrong? Anakin then began to cloud himself with dark side energy, and started to present himself to her in a style reminiscent to his Vader persona. Finally connecting the dots and managing to pinpoint the Force signatures, she was able to determine the truth of his words. Master, it truly is you. Yes, that is quite enough for now. I want you to get acquainted with this woman here, she will be heading this department alongside you. Anakin said not really bothered by her show of loyalty, feeling a bit hurt at that Renala replied. But master, do I not do enough? Have I not proved myself to you? Anakin doesn't hesitate to approach her and towers above her, proceeding to lift her chin to look deep into her eyes. I do. You have proven to be quite useful to me. I am not replacing you. I am simply bringing in someone to help you. He assures her because this situation was quite emotional for her. She blushes at being so close to him, and knowing what he looks like underneath even more so increased her infatuation. Anakin was not a bad looking young man, but was in fact very beautiful, and could contend with a lot of models even with his freakish physique. T thank you master. She replied in a quiet tone. What Renala had been mainly working on for Anakin was the expansion of his knowledge to do with the duck side of the force, but she had other things to do as well. The only problem was she is uneducated in things to do with science, and had minimal experience, and as such she needed a partner. This partner would be Jenna, and she would be the perfect partner for her. Master, if I may ask. Renala had become extremely docile in the presence of Anakin, and Jenna just had to comment. How cute, so this is your grand plan. I thought there would be something more. Jenna said, but it was Renala who came to his defense. Do not speak that way to the master. Whoa, calm down there. If looks could kill, then Jenna would die a thousand times over by now by Renala's glare. I think that is enough out of the two of you. Anakin puts an end to their brewing feud with one sentence. They continued to walk for a small while before ending up in a specific room that continued many living medical droids that Anakin planned to showcase to increase Jenna's interest. For the Emperor, the living droids within the room saluted him. Like what you see, Anakin questioned Jenna. This is quite interesting, but you still haven't told me what this is all about. Jenna was becoming increasingly curious, especially after the revelation the droids were actually living and fully capable of using the Force even in limited capacity. We are all gathered here for you to get a look at what my next creation is to further advance myself and the human species. Maybe even create a version of what I'm trying to create here for other species as well in the future. Anakin said directing her eyes to the medical reports visible to Jenna. While Jenna was overlooking all of that Renala had taken this as her chance to grab onto her beloved as her mind became even more twisted. She may have held back and was learning to be in even greater control over the dark side. That didn't mean she was immune. At least not yet. Rubbing herself on Anakin, she says. So this is your true form, master. How glorious you are. I am blessed to be in your presence to be allowed to approach and smell you from up close. It's exhilarating. I am sure it is. And it would seem that you are liking me a bit too much. Anakin says with some jest. But it goes unnoticed by Renala. Quickly getting a hold of herself she retreats and says in panic. Forgive me, master. I didn't mean to impede or get in your way. I only wanted to be closer to you. Do not get me wrong, Renala. I am not repulsed by your presence. In fact, I quite enjoy your company. Anakin was speaking the truth because while he was not overly attracted to her, that didn't mean he was against any form of relationship. At this point in time he hadn't officiated his relationship with any other girl. Really? She smiled before continuing. Master, if I may be so bold. You may? Anakin gave his permission because she was extremely docile when it came to him. In fact her submissiveness was quite seductive, and he had nearly gave in to his inner demons. What exactly is this project the Elite have been working on? Renala was referring to the living droids who had taken the name of Elites for now before they get their own bodies. A specialized bio-engineered 24th chromosome with the sole purpose of making a baseline human better than what they were, Anakin stated. Jenna added her own opinion after looking over the data. From what has been designed, this would eliminate most genetic disorders and reduce the chances of diseases or viruses being able to infect someone. Jenna continued, In fact, it would be impossible with this special genetic restructuring for a human to get cancer. There are other things like increased overall mental and physical capabilities, but the main benefits are those to the quality of life. This would basically be the next step in evolution for humans if it was engineered this way, and from the looks of it, 
You are nearly complete. Jenna finished. That is correct. Renala practically had stars in her eyes that were slightly crazy as she stared at Anakin. Amazing. Jenna, you will help complete this, while Renala will help you with other things. Anakin said with Renala not questioning him and Jenna just accepting her next task. Most of everything had been done for her anyway. So why waste her time with small talk? Anakin would then go on to explain he had to leave for Coruscant, and that when Renala was finished she could come visit him, on the stipulation she was able to hide herself in the force like he had taught her. My master. Renala had a smile on her face just thinking about him. Ani, how has my progress been so far? Barris asked Anakin of whom had become her master, but she didn't change the way he addressed him. She would feel too awkward in doing so anyway. At first some within the order questioned Anakin on his choice of apprentice, because she was known to be a very close friend of his. But this only proved to the higher-ups that Anakin was quite in line with their methods. Meaning that Anakin placed no attachment on his friendship with Barris, and was willing to become her master instead. What they didn't know however was that the two were still very close to each other, and with becoming master and apprentice, it only gave them more time to spend with each other. Unfortunately the Jedi are quite blind at times to certain things. You have been doing fine and soon enough I believe that you will not need to be my apprentice anymore. Anakin replied, really? Barris was excited because she always felt there was some kind of barrier. That was preventing her from being able to express her feeling towards Anakin. Even though a forced diet had formed between the two, it seemed Anakin or maybe it was herself that thought it was inappropriate for a teacher and student to be in a relationship. Yes, I do believe that it is high time you completed your trials, and have in fact nearly completed them all. Anakin stated, can you tell me which? Barris asked thinking she could rush things. No, that wouldn't be right, now would it? Anakin replied knowing full well what he said was bullshit. Yeah right, we both know that you aren't one to follow the rules. Barris says, you're correct. Anakin chuckles a bit before explaining, you have completed all but one, and this last trial of yours is the trial of the spirit, right the hardest one. Barris sighs believing that the last trial she has to complete would be difficult. That is both correct and incorrect, all you would be doing in simple terms, is facing your inner darkness per se. Your doubts, your insecurities and the dark side, would try to tempt you into giving in to your most innate desires. Anakin said, not that those thoughts are all that wrong or even evil, but it is how you channel those emotions that would allow you to pass. He continued, so it is my actions that matter the most. Barris hesitantly asked, yes, remember the new code I have taught you, my own that I have connected to myself, the one I have said to others. Anakin questions, I do, Barris confirms, why don't you recite it for me? Anakin asks, flowing through all, there is balance, there is no peace without a passion to create, there is no passion without peace to guide, knowledge fades without the strength to act, power blinds without the serenity to see, there is freedom in life, there is purpose in death, the force is all things and I am the force. Barris quotes his ripped off code, as long as you have taken my teachings to heart and have trust in yourself, then everything should be just fine. Anakin smiles an encouragement which only manages to daze her for a bit as his features were that good looking, only more so accented by his now wavy and curly dark blonde hair and glowing purple eyes. Anakin's glowing eyes were the result of the special mutation within his sky seed, that was affected by the force, and his incredible force sensitivity. Hello, Barris, are you there? Anakin was trying to get her attention, slightly embarrassed she recovers from her trance. Yes, I am here. She then continued as she was slightly curious about something. Master, I have noticed that something has changed between you and Isla. That is true. Anakin didn't lie. What is it, if I may ask? She was hesitant to ask but was ready for the answer. You could say, I have officially begun a romantic relationship with her. Anakin answers honestly. Barris would be lying if she said she wasn't jealous. But she was aware of the rather unique situation they were all in. There was no telling how many more diets he would create in the future as well. So she had come to accept this situation, and it was made all the more easier that Anakin actually spent time with her and the others still, even when he should be busy doing other things. This only indicated to her, his care for them. I thought we weren't supposed to have attachments as Jedi. Barris decides to be playful, instead of having an outburst using her temporary jealousy. It is a good thing. I don't plan on being a Jedi for long. Anakin drops a bomb on Barris. Wait, what? Barris asked in surprise, not that she already didn't have an inclination with what Anakin wanted to do in the future. In fact, she wasn't really surprised at all, but was just confused why he had not left the order yet. The galaxy will go to hell, and there are even bigger threats years ahead of the current time frame, and I don't have a lot of time left to prepare. Anakin said what he was going to tell the other girls at some point. How so? Barris didn't question how valid his prediction is to be, because he has been near 100% right about the many other things they had done. That didn't mean he couldn't be wrong. It just meant he never really was, especially when it came to things concerning the force and the well-being of people. Even more so when it came to his loved ones. Let's just say that there are many hidden menaces, and it wouldn't be good to tell you or others just yet about what is in store. Just know that I will protect you and everything else I possibly can. Anakin stated quite passionately, that is quite the big responsibility are you sure you can handle this yourself? Barris questioned, worried about how he is doing. Don't worry, as long as I have the support from you and the others, I will be just fine. Anakin smiles again before embracing Barris within an unexpected hug. Okay? Barris replies while stammering having not quite hammered that habit out of herself. A fine student, Barris. The force flows strongly within her. Someone spoke to Anakin as he was watching her training. It would seem an uninvited intruder had made her entry. She is. I do think she has been taught well if I say so myself. Anakin answered the intruder who was actually Luminaro Anjili, the original master for Barris. I am quite disappointed I was unable to take 
take her completely off of your hands. Luminara said, sometimes we don't always get what we want. Anakin replied. Luminara and Anakin had become acquainted when they were both looking for an apprentice, and while Luminara originally was supposed to take Barris under her wings, it was Anakin who had beat her to it. Because of this, as a result she did not get to take on any apprentice of her own. At least not yet. In fact the reason why she had become acquainted with Anakin was because there was a special agreement between the Jedi Order and Morylan, where only Morylan Jedi come take and train Morylan apprentices. At first it was an agreement, but slowly over time Morylan Jedi acceptance became a tradition to any of whom did become one, something that had been going on for a long time now. Again, another exception was made in the case when it came to Anakin, but this exception was on the stipulation that he was not her only master. Just as Anakin himself had two main masters, Qui-Gon and Mace, Barris had both himself and Luminaro. Do you think there is anything really left to teach her? Luminaro asked him. There is always something to learn. I believe what you wanted to ask about was whether or not she is ready to become a Jedi Knight. Anakin replied knowing what she actually wanted to ask. Upon achieving the rank of Jedi Knight, Luminara dedicated herself to physical disciplines. Her pattern tattoos were a traditional morale and reflection of this somatic commitment. She trained heavily to improve her corporal prowess, working over the course of years to enhance her flexibility and agility in combat, and mastering the third form of lightsaber combat, Suresu. Adorning in traditional morale and robes, Luminara trained independently as a Jedi Guardian. Though she was a skilled and respected diplomat, and advisor to high-profile senators in the Galactic Senate. So it is time then. Luminara asked to no one in particular. Anakin remained silent, not answering her question as it wasn't supposed to be answered, but was supposed to be a moment for her to be at peace with Barris moving on. Like a parent watching their child grow up, it was quite emotional. She had done this once before as Barris wasn't her only student, and she had another. In Dash Barris was about to call out to Anakin using his nickname, before seeing her other master was present. Master Skywalker, Master Anjuli. She greeted after her little session with the training droids. Barris. Luminara awakens from her trance to reply to her apprentice. What are you doing here Master Anjuli? Barris questions her. Nothing much, I have just come here to speak with Master Skywalker. Luminara replies. Speak to him about what? Barris was still curious and wanted to know why she had come here. It is nothing you should bother yourself with just yet. Luminara answered not really wanting to tell her why. Okay whatever you say. Barris accepts her answer knowing she doesn't want to say anymore. Master Skywalker can you have a spa with me? Sure. Anakin smiles at here and entertains her request. I best be on my way then. Luminara says and leaves the training room as the two then begin to train with one another. Or more like Anakin was defending and allowing Barris to be on the aggressive. It had been many years since Shmai and Padme had talked about the alliance between Tatooine and Naboo. Padme had gone on from being a queen to becoming a senator for her system, to better represent her people, know the people on the Republic on a much more grand stage. Padme had kept in contact a lot of the time, despite the circumstances surrounding the treaty between the two systems. Padme still wanted to keep good relations with between Tatooine and her planet of Naboo. They were not far from each other after all in terms of actual distance, and it would be great for Naboo to have some military help, even when they were a peaceful people. She knew that the Republic would be unable to help her and her people just like the last time. What she she didn't expect however was that she would be pushed forward as some sort of sacrifice to create an alliance between the Republic and Tatrine because of the benefits they could provide. Unfortunately for them she is a much more strong-willed woman than they expected. Padme. Shmai had successfully connected with her, smiling through the device Padme replied. Yes, it is me. Padme and Shmai were still in regular contact with each other. I am glad that you still have some time to yourself, Shmai said to Padme. They had developed a friendship between the two of them, and had gotten along rather well because of many factors. One especially important factor being the politics and intrigue they were both involved in, even if Shmai didn't really have to deal with the Republic. Why did you call? Padme asked. There was something that myself and others have been working on for some time now, and was wondering if I could ask of you some advice. Shmai said. That is interesting. What exactly are you doing over on that hot planet exactly? She asked Shmai. Well, after looking everything over and having gained years of experience. I believe it is time for our planet to take the next step, Shmai said, but really it was both herself and Anakin that had come up with what to do next. Our economy has become stable enough as it is, and we want to create our very own currency. You wish to create your own currency. Padme was surprised as this was quite the bold move, and would further allow the Emperor to gain more independence from the Republic. The people are using credits and whatever other currency is already available, correct? Yes, Shmai replied. Has there some type of problem? Or Padme was questioning what exactly lead to this decision. It has been brought to my attention that it would be better to further make ourselves independent even though we already are. That doesn't mean we are economically well off. Shmai said before continuing. The industries of the two systems under our control are split. Your people are well cared for then? Padme asked. Yes, on Tatrain we have decided that we will use this planet to mostly produce energy and technology, while on the other system we have gained control over will become our agriculture planet. Shmai answered. That covers the energy, food, water and shelter requirements. That is quite smart. Padme replied. Yes. But we want to do more and further expand the various things we have and can produce. And while we have started to produce and excess everything we need, that doesn't mean we are actually all the strong financially. Shmai continued. How so? I thought that Skywalker Industries would be an adequate source of funding. In case your internal economy fails. Padme said in a questioning tone. Yes. But if the system cannot run itself it would be considered a failure. Shmai replied before continuing. So, do you think this is a good idea? Taking on a thinking posture she replies. It is the right direction for you. 
but I fear for the political reaction to such a development. We would still accept the currencies of other places, it would just not be the main one the people use within the Emperor, Shmai said. That was another to think on. The Tatrian system had become two, and now they had rebranded into an empire named the Emperor, not too unlike the Huts. This was a unanimous decision, but the various leaders within the empire and a vote by the people was done to see the public response. It was overwhelmingly positive which in turn turned Shmai into an empress rather than a simple queen. Of course this also kind of elevated Anakin into an even greater position of power. How has the transition been, by the way? Padme decided to change the topic onto the rebranding as an empire. It has actually been quite pleasant, and while I'm honored to accept the people's praises, I am afraid that I would fail them in some way. Shmai speaks about her insecurities in a show of how far the relationship between the two women had become. Being the kind and empathic woman she was, Padme replied, I am sure you are doing just fine, otherwise the people wouldn't have elected to continue, having you as their queen, no empress. Thank you. I believe that you are doing a fine job within the Senate as well. Shmai replies with her own compliment. Well Padme was sure she was doing something while at the same time felt that her efforts were truly useless. The Republic had come a long way but was still crumbling from within, though Padme still had a lot of hope to its state of being. The two then would continue to chit-chat back and forth about various things, before they both needed to do other things. One thing was on both of their minds though, and that was the last topic of their talk, Anakin. It would seem he still had quite an impact on Padme since a long time ago, and she had in fact turned into a stalker, constantly keeping herself updated on the young boy. No, man he was becoming. I do wish I could meet him face to face again. She thought to herself before going on with her own business. It had been an extremely successful last few years for the Supreme Chancellor. Nearly everything was going according to his plans. But that didn't mean he didn't experience any hiccups. And in fact he experienced a lot of roadblocks that completely halted his plans in other areas. Specifically when it came to the outrun system of Tattoo and his grasp of control over it. His designs for the young and extremely interesting subject of Anakin Skywalker was also being restricted as he tried to do things. Because of the New Empire's treaty with the Republic, Palpatine had some worries when it came to his current apprentices stay on Geonosis remain peaceful, until his plan is fully ready. It would seem however that the Emperor did not have any interest in Geonosis, and he had been actively trying to divert their attention from it. In fact his attempt in having the previous Queen of Naboo become engaged and possibly married to the heir of the Emperor was by his design, Darth Tyrannus. Palpatine had now gone into his true persona of the Sith Lord Darth Sidious, communicating with his apprentice to get an update of how things had been progressing. Yes master, Tyrannus replied with a questioning tone. Tell me how far have you progressed? Has the droid army come into full fruition? Sidious asked, Master, I am afraid that we have been delayed, and have not been able to generate as much as we would have like. There was a hitch a few years ago that had delayed us, and now we do not have as many droids as projected, Tyrannus answered. That is fine, as long as there is enough. Sidious replied, Anakin's interference years ago had stalled the mass production of the droid army, and now they didn't have as much numbers to play around with that they would have had. That doesn't mean Sidious knows of this however, and was still willing to further along his plans. Why would he give up now when he was so close, the chances of failure were actually minimal at this stage, because of his setup. Master, I will be ready to announce an official form the Confederacy of Independent Systems within the next year. Tyrannus told him, Good, good. You have done an excellent job, my apprentice Sidious was currently formulating other ideas, and plans to further advance himself within the Republic, and even if the army under his apprentice isn't enough to fully scare the Republic, they could always make use of what they have to create an illusion. Those who fear make great assets to use for himself. Surely bribery and slippery intrigue is good for his advancement, but that didn't mean he didn't have other means to becoming an emperor of his own. He was very jealous of a Skywalker heir who would inherit an entire empire if he just left the Jedi. Even though it would not be to the same scale he was working towards that didn't mean it didn't hold any value. Thinking about the now master Jedi that Skywalker had become, Sidious sees that he would have an even harder time swaying him to his side. Thankfully it would seem that the boy was not all in agreement with the Jedi. What was unfortunate however was that he was unable to really find any kind of weakness he could exploit from the boy. It was like trying to uncover secrets from times long past. Impossible because it was like they didn't exist which made Sidious increase his suspicion. However, not of Anakin, but of the mysterious figure known as Lord Vader. The enigmatic and elusive figure he had spent a lot of his time in trying to figure it. He had become obsessed with this person, because he was having premonitions himself. He believed that this Vader person could be his downfall. For some odd reason he was receiving false visions of him being thrown off by a somewhat similar figure to Vader, and it both terrified and angered him. Even more so that he is unable to do anything to him with all that he has. It would be a political death sentence to go after the General of the Emperor, as it would paint a target on his back. Even he doesn't want to be besieged by their droid army, because it was enough to hold off against the huts. I will find out who this person is. Given Sidious wanted to live forever and have a forever empire for himself, it would certainly stand to reason, he would be cautious of Vader and anything potentially connected to him. But he had developed a blind spot to Anakin, because of his desire to take him as his new apprentice. Darth Plagueis, remembered as Darth Plagueis the Wise, was a male Muin Dark Lord of the Sith, and heir to the lineage of Darth Bane. Trained by Darth Tenebris, Plagueis mastered the art and science of midichlorian manipulation. Obsessed with eternal life, he experimented with ways to cheat death and create new life from the midichlorians. In his public guise as Magister Hago Damas II of the Intergalactic Banking Clan, Darth Plagueis backed the rise and fall of certain star systems, businesses, and crime laws earning him many enemies, and 
and putting the Galactic Republic into turmoil. One of Plague A's greatest contributions to the history of the galaxy was training Darth Sidious in the ways of the Sith and the dark side of the Force, whom he incited to take control of the galaxy and bring about a new age of the Sith. For decades, he had helped Sidious, known publicly as Palpatine from Naboo, rise to the position of Senator and played a hand in his apprentice's election as the Supreme Chancellor of the Republic. Together, they instigated the Inchori Uprising, the invasion of Naboo, and the war that would destroy the Jedi Order and the Republic in years to come. They were even unwittingly responsible for the procreation of Anakin Skywalker, the Chosen One. Plague A's plan to be appointed co-chancellor of the Republic, so that he might advise Sidious from the dark, and devote himself to his own research. But his apprentice had other plans. Sidious, convinced that his master had outlived his usefulness, killed the Muin in his sleep the night before his election, and eventually rose to become ruler of the Galactic Empire. This would be the end of Plague A's story, his rise to power and inevitable fall from grace, as he was blinded by his trust in his apprentice. Where could you be? Anakin said out loud as if he was on the lookout for something. He had tasked many droids he had at his disposal to search stealthily within the areas he believed he could find Plague A's. Why? Because he could transfer Plague A's consciousness and soul into something else trapping him to his will. This would allow him to learn from Plague A's, while also enforcing absolute loyalty to him. He was killed within his sleep, if that is how Sidious had still done it, meaning his body may have already been taken away. He thought to himself, to where? He doesn't know. Anakin was after the body of the Sith Lord, because there is a possibility he is still alive, still conscious enough because of the technique created by Darth Tenebris, known as Maxi Claw. Maxi-chlorians Maxi -chlorians were a creation of Darth Tenebris as a way to achieve a form of eternal life. During his lifetime, Tenebris injected himself with a retrovirus that infected some of his midi-chlorians, turning them into Maxi-chlorians at the loss of his precognition abilities. These Maxi-chlorians were long-lived midi-chlorians that would linger after Tenebris died, instead of migrating back into the Force. Unfortunately, while Plagueis was used as an experiment for his own Master Inkis, in the event he died. But it didn't matter in the end. Tenebris was locked in an eternal hell created by himself, and Plagueis was the successor of this mastermind. If Anakin could find his body, he would be able to isolate the Maxi-chlorians that contained his consciousness, and then bind it to this object. What object would he be using? The Sith holocron that he had discovered underneath the Jedi Temple which had become a talisman. In fact, he had the talisman with him in case he encountered the decaying body of Plagueis. After many months, however, of retracing the steps of Palpatine and the possible locations his body may be, he had received valuable information of where his body could be buried. Which is why he was, along with his droids, searching a gravis Site that was not on Coruscant, and in fact was within the Valley of the Dark Lords. At least Palpatine had some decency, which is incredibly surprising he would even bury his body, instead of just outright burning him and destroying the remains. Anakin thought to himself while on this far out planet, the Sith Holocron had become useless to him anyway, and he had gone ahead and taken out all of the information within only leaving an empty space for the consciousness and soul of Plagueis. So what better usage was there other than become a storage device? An extremely powerful storage device, but something for storage nonetheless. And he didn't have to worry about Plagueis making a comeback, because this device enforces loyalty to him. Deciding to use the Force to guide him to his objective, he walks within a trance, as the droids follow alongside him. Here, there were many voices that could be heard throughout the valley, as this place was quite infamous. It was the burial site for many fallen Sith Lords. Here, come to me little boy, become one with the dark. You were born because of the dark, because your destiny was to destroy us. To destroy the Sith and to destroy the Jedi. Anakin was being bombarded by many disembodied voices that tried to distract him. But he only had one goal in mind, bring balance to the Force. The only way to do so is to become a Sith. It is your destiny after all the Valley of the Dark Lords was a massive rift in an outcropping of stone about three days walking distance to the city of Dreshti. Wider at the mouth, the valley's stone walls were sheer and steep, before opening into a lower valley with coarse outcroppings and rocky mountain ledges. Overlooking the lower valley were six towering monoliths in the shape of humanoid men bowing their heads. Lining the upper valley's walls were the tombs of ancient Sith, such as Nagasato's tomb, and the tomb of Ludocress. At the center of the upper valley was a three-story crypt containing the remains of a junta pool. The lower valley, once lined with temples and soaring edifices to falling Sith lords, was largely destroyed during Republic bombings, and what tombs remained were hidden behind sand and debris. The lost tomb of Marco Ragnos was unearthed bit by bit by subsequent Sith regimes, but eventually lost once more after each defeat. At the mouth of the valley stood the Reliquary of Zoxan, a sprawling temple complex upon the leftmost wall of the valley. At the back wall of the Valley of the Dark Lords was the Sith Academy of Korriban, a pyramidal structure which towered over the tombs. The academy was rebuilt several times, while another academy was built in Dreshti by the Brotherhood of Darkness. None of this mattered to Anakin however, as he was led to one tomb in particular, which would be his goal. The burial place of the Sith Lord Darth Plagueis. Fan out and secure the area. Anakin verbally told his droids as they explored this relatively newly constructed man-made cavern. There was a tomb, a coffin of sorts that contained the remains of Darth Plagueis, and this was his chance to trap the corrupted soul. Telepathically Anakin heard something. Something so small and minuscule trying to call out in distress. Help me. I will not die. I will get my revenge. Anakin was cautious to connect himself to this and decided to do so, but diverting this connection through the talisman he had brought along. There is no telling whether or not Plagueis would try and take over his body. Something dark came from the coffin and was hastily advancing towards Anakin, but it was sucked into the holocron as it glowed an eerie red light. You, the disembodied form of Plagueis reveals itself after being caught within the holocron. I wouldn't mistake something of my own doing. His voice became tangible within the real word, enough so that he didn't need to use telepathy. It would seem you recognize me. Anakin states as Plagueis was still struggling to escape. How could I not know about you? 
I wanted to see you. But my cowardly apprentice stabbed me in the back before I could get to you, Plague said. I guess I should thank Sidious then. Anakin has a cocky smile on his face to further taunt the ghost. Why? Because he wanted to test the limits of whether or not it could hold Plague's within, so he would not be surprised in the future if it managed to fail him. Why have you come here? Plague was quickly able to calm himself down after his initial outburst, because he wasn't the overly emotional type. His was a much more calm and collected person. Well, it is not like you would be unable to resist my commands anymore. So what the hell? Anakin said to himself before directing towards Plagueis. I have come here to take you under my control and get you to teach me about Sith alchemy and other things like your science within midi-chlorium manipulation. Never. Plagueis still doesn't fully comprehend the situation he is in. That is too bad because you will willingly give in to every command I say. He said to Plagueis. I will need why I yes Plagueis was struggling. I I will follow your commands. If one looked closely they would notice Plagueis was very minutely making facial expressions that gave away he was an intense pain. He had been trapped in Anakin was successful in his endeavor. Don't worry. I will not mistreat you as long as you stay loyal. What may I call you? Plagueis questioned. You may refer to me as Emperor. Anakin had grown used to this title because of his living droids. Yes, my Emperor. Plagueis does a mock bow. Anakin just smiles as he starts to pack up and leave with his droids while deactivating the holocron, forcing Plagueis into temporary unconsciousness. Back on Coruscant, Anakin had completed what he wanted to do, and had fully extracted everything he wanted from Plagueis. This increased his own knowledge within the dark side of the Force, and allowed him a greater capacity of abilities. Core among them was Maxi-Chlorians and Midi-Chlorian manipulation. While Anakin had minimal uses for Maxi-Chlorian, it would still help him immensely in the process of transferring the consciousness of his living droids into their future new bodies. This would advance him greatly and decrease the casualties within the future wars that would be fought. He he knows that he can't escape it. There is no way that Palpatine would leave him alone. There is also no way that the Huts would leave him alone as well, and the two within the future could create a coalition of sorts to be combative against him. Another thing to take into account are the future events that could happen. Specifically with the Yuz and Von Hoom would start an intergalactic war themselves way into the future. Not to mention the smaller conflicts that would happen throughout. Midi-Chlorian manipulation was a form of Sith alchemy mastered by Darth Plagueis. Requiring immense knowledge of the dark side of the Force, it was the ability to create, maintain, or save life through the influencing of midi-chlorians to a certain degree. Plagueis was able to use this ability to make creatures give birth without a second partner, referred to by his droid servant 11-4D, as the Magister's pregnancies. Plagueis was able to kill the comatose Darth Venomous, and then bring him back to life several times, before the Bith's organs failed, and Plagueis granted him everlasting death. In addition, he turned this power on himself, in order to heal his many injuries afforded to him by the Maladian assassins who almost killed him, and was confident that he would stop aging at all with this power. However, despite all this, Plagueis was still unable to keep himself from dying at the hands of his apprentice. How unfortunate for you. Anakin thought as he stared at the deactivated holocron he had with him, and decided to store underneath the Jedi Temple for now, as this was his base of operations for now. Darth Plagueis stated that a child born of this power would be the embodiment of the Force. The Muin tried to impose his will on the Force into creating a forceful being, but considered this a failure, as Anakin was created by the Force itself to bring an end to the Sith once and for all. That didn't mean he wasn't an embodiment of the Force, and in fact he was. A manifestation of its will to keep the balance, it was just that Plagueis didn't understand this concept all too well, despite being the creator of the technique. Anakin could link this ability to have similarities to the elixir of life from his previous life, which was said to grant the drinker eternal life and or eternal youth and create new life. It had a lot of the same capabilities, and Anakin was going to make sure to use it to the best of his own abilities. But he wanted to do so in a way that cheats the system. The dark side of the force is quite corrupting, and even though he had become balanced himself, that didn't mean he was completely immune, if he overused such abilities. So he had an idea. By combining science that missing Immortus gland he had been working on, midi-chlorine manipulation and genetic manipulation, he would create the final half of the implant. He would make the midi-chlorians within the Immortus implant in particular forcefully work in a specific way, but he would influence one side of the implant to be of the dark side, while the other be of the light. He would make the magnificent implant become the dark side variation, while he would make the other half become the light side variant. Doing so should eliminate the conflicting energies. But this also means he would have to recreate midi-chlorians manipulation. Recreate it as a light side ability. He could do this by transforming the midi-chlorians and the genetic coding within these implants to better suit his needs. Anakin would of course do this for himself only because he was greedy. But that didn't mean he wanted immortality without someone to share it with. He always thought the greatest problem with living forever was the social aspect. If humans were not such social creatures by nature, they would probably like the idea of immortality more. Because that is just how nature is. Of course, that may not be perfect logic, but it was enough for him, so he would go ahead with his plan. Originally, he was just going to use Art of the Small to steal the genetics, and the way the midi-chlorians work for the Mortis gods for himself, thus giving him eternal youth. But this option, at least to him, was much better. The Infinity Gate on Dathoma was important to Anakin. He had been researching how to recreate 
create such a revolutionary technology for himself, and was intending to create a gate on every planet under his control, which would help himself in the development of his empire greatly. When it came to Dathoma, there were many reasons he would have been able to keep under his control. This is why he gave it away for free, and it was not like he invested all that much on the planet. The only thing there that was useful for him, he had already gotten. It is better to grant it independence, than try and keep something he would obviously lose, trying to keep control over either from the Night Sisters within or from people outside, willing to use the planet to their advantage against him. Why would he include that risk for himself? He would be able to retake control of it in the future anyway, when his militaristic might and power has expanded to such a degree, it would allow him to do so. Of course there is also the political and economic reasons for not wanting to stay, as it would take too much time to completely bring such a dangerous planet under his complete control. Back to the Infinity Gate. It had two main capabilities that was above everything else, and he was reverse engineering the gates for his own use. Imagine not needing ships anymore. Well, he would still need ships because the gates would be cool, and all but they are unable from what he has designed to transport everything and or everyone perfectly. An example being he would need one gate on Tatooine and one on Anduil to transfer things back and forth between them. This was what he intended to do. The basic description of the Infinity Gates is that it was an ancient network of structures developed by the Saurian Qua species of Dathoma during the pre-Republic era. They enabled instantaneous interstellar travel between far-flung locations, and could also be used as a superweapon. Through what the Qua called the power of the cosmos the Infinity Gates, were able to transport them across the galaxy or project devastating infinity waves. The gates were accessed from a star chamber within massive pyramidal structures known as the Star Temples. The Star Temples and its associated buildings contained traps which protected the chambers from intruders. Inside the Star Chamber was a realm of infinity, a pocket dimension that housed the central control station, which was used to control the power of infinity. From what Anakin was able to piece together, this pocket dimension was a space of which they created a specialized energy and stored it within. It had no connection to the Force, but it was an advanced form of energy they were somehow able to access or create. Of course, Anakin was not only interested in the Infinity Gates, because there was also a similar contraption built by the Gree, known as Hypergates. Hypergates were a form of faster-than-light transportation used by the ancient Gree civilization. He had also discovered the blueprints to creating such a device as well, and wanted to incorporate both civilizations' unique designs. But he wanted to separate the superweapon part from the teleportation part. He believes it is just a tad bit dangerous for both things to be held within the same thing. A network of devices that created hyperspace wormholes. Hypergates used an unknown technology to circumvent mass shadows, allowing near-instant travel through space into other hypergates. Hypergates had a variety of sizes and functionality with such shapes typically being freestanding accessways, gateways, or archways. Those that activated the technology and stepped through the threshold were instantly transported through hyperspace to a corresponding hypergate terminus at another location. Such locations tended to vary as a receiving hypergate was capable of being located on the planet of origin, or another world entirely with rumors of this latter fleet, known of variant gates that were capable of sending entire starships across the galaxy. Anakin had already begun construction of a merged form of both technologies, because he wanted the very best, and didn't want the flaws from both sides. Some flaws would still be present, but he should be able to, with his own design, make use of the best of both worlds. He had a habit of trying to balance things, just take the balance within the Force for example. It would seem it was within his nature to do so. Arnie, you have grown so much. I am so proud of you. Shmai spoke to Anakin who had come to Tatooine on an unscheduled and unplanned visit to his mother. Anakin approached her quite surprised she had recognized him, because he looked quite different from when they had last seen each other. Mother. He smiled as he scooped her up and embraced her within a hug. He was quite large in comparison to her small frame. Ani, you have grown so much that I am inclined to believe the Jedi somehow were the reason behind this. Shmai said, that is untrue. Anakin stated, Shmai may be let in on a lot of Anakin's secrets by now, but that didn't know she knew everything. But when thinking about it for a small bit, he believes that he should reveal to her what he has done to himself. Not right now, however. What are you doing here anyway? Shmai asked her son. Did you not want me here? Anakin asked in a mock hurt tone. I didn't mean it in that way. What I meant is why are you here because aren't you not allowed to be here? Shmai knew her son was sooner or later going to leave the Jedi. She had raised him after all and could see things, many things in fact, leading to her prediction being correct. She didn't need the Force to tell whether or not he was going to leave, but the only reason she did have this suspicion was partially because Anakin trusted her. After having embraced her, Anakin let her go. Let me take a closer look at you. Shmai then started to check every inch of Anakin, right from his head to his toes. Anakin towered over her at a height of 2.15 meters, because thankfully the magnificent implant didn't actually manage to further increase his height. His hair had been colored a nice dark blonde, which further accentuated his somewhat handsome ethereal features. Not to mention his once blue eyes had turned violet, and now even let out a faint glow. That if within the dark people would be able to make out. You certainly look quite different. Did you dye your hair? Or did you do something that I should know about? Shmai looked at him as even though he was physically imposing. That didn't mean she couldn't still be stern with him. Chuckling a bit and rubbing the back of his head, Anakin answered. No, this is all natural and a result of some other things that I can tell you about later. She raised an eyebrow. Really? I will remember that and will seek you out later about it then. She finished. Anakin along with Smy, then headed towards Skywalker Palace. And it was still as magnificent as it had been first constructed. In fact it had been upgraded since the last time he had been within its holes. The droids that happened to be within the palace saluted Anakin as the Emperor that he was. They quite loved him even if it was only their programming. While there was no living droids within here and doing other things. 
things. He had at this point stopped production of living droids because they were flawed, and he was nearly ready with everything to hammer out the flaws within the synthetic bodies he was having the Kaminans create for him. They would be better than the living droids' previous bodies, and would include the upgrades that had been done to himself, not only that they would be able to experience life as a proper living being. Their existence was quite tortured, and Anakin had always felt a bit bad for them. So, Arnie, why have you come exactly? You haven't answered my question yet. Shmai asked him as they were now within the safe and secure walls of the Skywalker Palace. Well I came back for a few things. But most of all I wanted to see you again. Anakin was quite the smooth talker. You flatter me Arnie. But I know you didn't come here just for me. But Shmai knew her child. So she was easily able to see through that excuse. What? Anakin starts with mock exaggeration. Of course I am here for you. Why else would I come? Alright, alright. That's enough of that. Shmai chuckles a bit as they now had entered Anakin's room of the palace. Okay. I think first I want to get out of the way why I look so different. The reason for such a drastic difference. And why I have been developing so fast throughout the years. Anakin at this point started to recount what had happened and what he had done. It didn't give away everything. But he did reveal why he had properly left as a child to Dathoma, the ritual he had done to become stronger. Of course this made her become worried for him after this. But he had more to explain. He then went on to explain about his genetic experimentation, which had resulted in him looking like this. While Shmai was not against stuff like this. What she was against was her child now telling her about this, and just going through with it. While she knew he was much more of an adult now, the stuff he had done was when he was but a child, which only further worried her. Yeah, that is pretty much it. Anakin finished which then immediately had Shmai jump on him again, and embrace him within a hug. She near had tears within her eyes which near had Anakin having tears within his eyes as well. I am sorry I didn't tell you these things earlier. No, it is my fault that I failed as a mother. Shmai said, Mother, you didn't fail me and have in fact raised me with the very best effort you could. It was I who had done some things behind your back, which leads me to another revelation I wish to reveal. Anakin said again, And what is that? She had stopped her crying by now, and was ready to once again hear from her son what he had done. Well you know about Vader right? Yes. Yes, of course I do. Shmai replied thinking back to the very strange existence of the man who had supposedly helped her and her son long ago. I have been doing things behind your back for an even longer while than you may expect. Anakin then continued. I am Vader. What? Don't be ridiculous now. How could you possible dash Shmai stops as she starts to put together the pieces of a puzzle? That is right. Anakin had a rather small smile on his face with hopes that she wouldn't be too upset with him. Unsurprisingly she just embraces him again and doesn't say anything else anymore going on information overload. Anakin lulls her to sleep and she peacefully falls asleep on his bed whereas he has some more stuff to do. Well, that went better than expected. Anakin thought to himself as he once again left the palace. But that didn't mean he was going to leave after dropping the bomb on his mother. He would stay and still be here when the morning came. No, he has other places to be as well. As while it would have been nice to just come here to see his mother, he still had to get to other places and to further build up his empire. The Emperor. Quite the ingenious name as it merges the word empire with the word sky. In what way does it get merged? The Emperor is a synonym for the word sky, just like another synonym for this is heaven. What better name than the Emperor of which represents himself, his origins and what his domain has become. What he wanted to do now was the creation of another currency that would be used exclusively within his own spatial borders. He would go out to create a bank that would of course be separate from the intergalactic bank, which would eventually fall under the control of Sidious. It would be extremely dangerous to leave his assets and wealth under the control of him or others. That would seek to weaponize this against him. So what better solution than to create his own bank, to create his own currency? From polls taken from both the Tattoo and Anderwil systems, Anakin was able to determine that they were in favor of this happening, especially if it was supported by his mother. So, just like all things he created, he would need to have a name ready for this new bank, and the name he has is of course again related to his now famous last name. It would be called Skybank. Anakin was rather lazy when it came to naming things, but it was sufficient enough for everyone to see that it was under his control. But that didn't mean he was going to extort his subjects. He may be in control, but he does know that if he somehow messed with the people, it would slowly start to rot his created systems from within. Equality was quite a high standard to live up to and was hard enough when taking into account many factors and situations across the two star systems he has control over. Right after the creation of Skybank he had to create the name for his currency, and just like with a lot of rulers, monarchs or better of great importance, he would create the currency by naming it after himself. Skycoin or Skycoins, simplified as South Carolina, would become the standard currency used throughout his worlds and star systems, as he slowly expands across the outer rims. He already had the design ready and everything, but it would be a virtual type system using his special matrix underneath Tatrine. It would have to become the most protected place, but it already was. He wanted to protect his mother and as a result Skywalker Palace became a place of great importance, so he just had the internal networks and systems created on Tatooine. It was quite the good idea. Tatooine did become the planet that started to produce energy and technology as its most standard export while it still had to export food and water, but the food and water came from Anduil. While Anduil exported food and water, but imported energy and tech. Anakin had made sure there were such systems put in place to ensure the stability of his developing empire. All this work just so society won't crumble. Anakin thought to himself as he headed in another direction, specifically the research and medicine department here on Tatooine. Within the research and medicine division, Renala along with Jenna, had a lot of work to do. 
At least that was on the surface. What they actually were working on, alongside the living medical droids, was the 24th chromosome, and it was nearing completion. In fact, one could say it is complete, and there is really nothing more to add. All they needed to do now is experiment with it to make sure there are no unsavory side effects. Have you checked the genetic stability? Jenna asked one of the living medical droids. Yes, madam, from out projections. It should be fine for human testing. The droid responded. What is with you droids and you need to be so polite? Jenna asked out loud, not really expecting an answer from the Solomon Cold machines. For the Emperor, the medical droid Jenna asked a question too before answered her. With some confusion, Jenna then continues to question since she was answered. Why exactly are you guys so invested in your Emperor anyway? Are you guys not living and have your own free will now? Blasphemy, one must not besmirch the Emperor and his glorious self. You are lucky your heresy goes unpunished because of your use to the Emperor. Practically all the droids within the room stopped what they were doing at Jenna's insolence. They stared at her which created a weird atmosphere as if she was about to be destroyed. But then they went back to doing their own things. You shouldn't really say anything too outrageous against my master as they see him as their god of sorts. Renala went up to Jenna. They are crazy. Jenna made sure to keep her voice low. Renala then says something that sends a chill down her back. He is, he did create them after all, and it would be prudent of you to keep any of those thoughts to yourself. She said this in a tone that cannot be mistaken as nice. What a crazy bunch of beings I am with, maybe I shouldn't have taken the young lad up on his offer, Jenna thought to herself. As Jenna was recovering from her shock, Renala had made her way over to another area of the medical facilities. This place in particular was a special area that was by her master, and that it should be guarded at all costs. No one else was really allowed to enter because it was cultivating something incredibly important. Not even Renala who had worked here was allowed to enter, only her master could go in. She had used her force sensitivity to try and get a peek, because she was immensely curious and it was not like she would get into too much trouble. She knew when and what she could get away with as long as it doesn't cross the line, and sensing through the force, what was on the other side was within her master's tolerance levels. She was on the verge of getting a basic outline of what was inside, but was startled by the presence of her master coming into the building. Master, forgetting what she was just trying to do she become somewhat like a dog, and ran along the hallways to greet Anakin. Anakin had made his entrance, and the medical droids had greeted him with a salute and the standard my emperor. Greeting. He would be lying if he said he didn't start to like the title as it slowly grew on him. It fit him rather well. But he would also be lying if he said he was totally comfortable with it right from the start. At this point, they may even just start calling him the God Emperor or something akin to that. He fears for what his children in the future may have to go through. Yes, yes, you all may return to your work. Anakin spoke to them so as they didn't feel pressured. They may not have every emotion available to a normal sentient creature, but that didn't they had none, in fact it was determined by their programming what they could feel, or what they would be capable of feeling upon creating them. Skywalker, you're here. Jenna approached having felt pressure the entire time after that small incident, and was glad that there was someone seemingly sane. Well, how could she complain when she was quite crazy herself in her own pursuits? But it would seem Jenna doesn't realize this. Why hello there Jenna, is everything alright? Anakin replied and was slightly curious as through the force, he could sense her somewhat tumultuous emotions. Well, I guess, but I think Thar dash Jenna was cut off by Renala dashing into the room and stopping just before Anakin. Master, are you are here? What a surprise. Renala had a large smile resting on her face, and if Anakin would pinpoint this kind of behavior, he would liken it to an excited dog. He could just about see the tail wagging back and forth behind her. Calm down Renala, you should redirect this overwhelming energy you have. Anakin said to the excited girl. Oh, sorry master, I was just excited to see you. That was all. Renala explained while Jenna just rolled her eyes. That is okay. The reason for my visit today is to check in on the progress of the project. Anakin said to them both the look towards Jenna. Tell me Jenna, is it ready yet? It is. She was quickly able to recover even if her emotions were still on the fritz. The only thing we need now is someone to test this on, and if everything goes according to projections, then we should be able to start mass producing the serum. You need a test subject then. Anakin questions. Yes. Jenna answers in confirmation. That should be easy enough, in fact there are still some human prisoners within the prison facility here on Tatooine. Anakin said then continued. We have a pretty good crime fighting system here on Tatooine, but most criminals don't really deserve to be experimented on. There are however a few exceptions to the rule. Anakin finished as he ordered a droid to bring one of these exceptions to the research facilities. After a few minutes where everyone had gathered to a containment chamber where their test subject was laid out on a table, the man was strapped up and was clearly feral, having struggled all the way here, and was foaming at the mouth. It was not like Anakin allowed animals into his prison, but that doesn't mean he wouldn't lock them up either. Hello, don't worry, if everything goes well your death will come soon enough. Anakin's voice came from the sound system, and projected within the room where a throwable droid was there ready to inject the serum. The droid proceeded to inject the serum, as Anakin didn't have a need to say anything else, as he considered it cruel enough as it was. The man was still trying to resist before he went still after the injection went through. From the vital signs and readings his body was going through a metamorphic process, transforming his cellular structure and the entirety of his various systems, reinforcing and strengthening his entire being. Watching the process, Anakin, Renala and Jenna were curious of the results, and it would seem that nothing untoward had happened just yet. Seems like it is a success. 
Anakin stated looking into the Force to see if it would be a failure and it wouldn't. The Force was especially accurate when it came to him asking it for answers, and he assumed this was because he was basically its child in a sense. The criminal then started to go insane, with newfound pumping through him as an entire had passed, and they only had to wait for the man to awaken. As he did though it became especially clear it was a success, and that there was probably the go for the evolution of the human race. Potentially not just for humans but for other species as well. It was just that Anakin had to create other versions of this serum to help enhance other species to their maximum physical, mental and genetic potential within themselves. The droid was destroyed, and he did significant damage to the interior of the containment bay, where the man had destroyed his restraints. Right, I think that this is a wrap, Anakin said to the room. He would then go on to gather the results and put down the prisoner after his usefulness was outlived. Anakin would then proceed to praise Jenna, and then head to Disso for Rinala as well because she had become especially clingy. He didn't want to have her become too much of what was called within his previous life a Yandir. She was quite dangerous, and if she learned of him having other females he was close to, she may do something drastic. He wouldn't like to put her down, as he was entirely willing to knock someone out of commission to ensure the safety of his loved ones. The reason he didn't that much emotion for her and she did for him was strange, but his reasoning was because he didn't have a lot of time to get close. On the other hand, it would seem she was just twisted in some, no, many ways, meaning it would probably continue to be this way. Anakin can only blame himself for this blunder. But it was not like he was unwilling to accept her affections, it would seem though that she was incredibly shy about those emotions. Again a trait that most genders shared with each other. The secret Anakin was working on was the Immortus Gland. He wanted to complete it for himself as he felt incomplete, and that was not just in the logical sense his implants to transform him was incomplete, it was also in the sense when it came to the Force. His plan to transform the two halves into the respective dark and light of each other was at the forefront of his plans, as he believed it would fully complete and add his own twist to such an elaborate design. He also wanted to inject the 24th chromosome serum into himself, and was aware that any genetic modification he would want to be done, should be done before he does so. This would elevate him to levels of power and levels of intelligence unknown and never seen before. He was already quite well within the mythical standards already when it came to his abilities, but that didn't mean his journey was complete. No, he was far from over, and would be going through with the Immortus gland implant in secret. He needed to do so as any distraction would be dangerous. No Isla or Barris could be present, and it had to be only himself, in fact he would take all precautions, and not even do the last implant underneath the Jedi Temple, simply because the latent dark side energies may affect the process. No, it is a guaranteed thing to happen. So he needed to find a relatively neutral planet, and in fact, had chosen to go to Anduil, the agriculture planet under his control, because there was no residual energies of either side. In fact he was the only real force presence on the planet. Taking some medical droids with him off of Tatrine, he moved himself to the planet, and he had already set up a base for himself to go through with the operation. I need the area security. Secured. The process I am about to begin is very important. Anakin had in fact not even wanted any of the living medical droids, and had taken the unliving ones with him. His paranoia is well granted given he is doing something never seen or heard of before, and it would be a process that would likely take up every ounce of his concentration. He may even have to block the forced diets he has formed with the women on Coruscant, because he was afraid he would not have enough control. Roger, Roger. The droids replied to his commands, and slowly filtered themselves out of the area that was isolated from the rest of the world, from the rest of the galaxy. Who knows what weird resonance within the Force may be created due to his actions as every action has an equal reaction. Especially when it came to the Force because it worked in strange ways, Anakin wanted to be fully prepared. Let's begin. He he sat down on the surgical bed before laying himself fully out, as he started to control the few medical droids within and himself. The energies within the Force were calling out to him as he began the process. Within his brain there were two specialized, small spots that would become the epicenter for the dark and light to take place. If possible he would make these two bounce off of each other, forming a symbiotic and balanced relationship. The Immortus Gland, that Anakin had started to call the God Maker, was a genetically engineered organ about twice the size of a thumbnail, that existed within the cerebral cortex of each of the primages. The Immortus Gland may even further increase his physical size and capabilities overall. And while he really didn't want to get any taller, it was a sacrifice he was willing to make to become immortal. The organ would regulate his rapid growth to maturity and his overall metabolism, granting him a lifespan measured in centuries, if not functional immortality. In fact when combining every other factor especially when it came to him, he will essentially become biologically immortal. His body would recover from any wound, if any limbs were destroyed or cut off, he would be able to regenerate and create an entirely new limb, along with his cells, gaining some new properties that would allow them to better care for the passage of time. He would gain eternal youth along with biological immortality, as his body would stop aging due to the many factors, especially the Immortus Gland. The Immortus Gland was structurally divided into two hemispheres or valves, the right or dextrophic lobe and the left or centarius lobe. After a long process that had him going under a lot of pain that he was successful in not transmitting to anyone he was connected to, he needed some time to recover. Anakin didn't have time to think on anything, and didn't have time to inject himself with the 24th bioengineered chromosome, because as soon as he was done implanting the complete design of the Immortus Gland, he started to work on transforming them using midi-chlorium manipulation, making one side delve deep into the energies of the dark side, and using it to influence his body, and its capacity to become immortal, gaining eternal youth. He also did so for the other side, but instead of the dark, it was the light with which it was imbued with its own version.
version of immortality. It was a long, long month after before he would awake from his temporary comatose state and would find himself different. Has anyone seen Anakin? Shark had entered the training room of which the girls were in. No, now that you mention, I haven't seen him within the past few days. Barris replied as she approached Shark. I remember that he said he was going on a short trip to Tatooine. Isla said as she heard the topic of their conversation was Anakin, and that he had told her he was going to Tatooine. While Anakin didn't tell them everything, he still told them about a few things, and one such thing was that he was secretly a very important part of the Emperor. He had a massive role to play within the Emperor and its systems. Why did he go there? Shark questioned Isla. He said it was something important, but I could tell he was unwilling to tell me about anything else about it. Isla answered, but he should have been back by now. Going from his patterns, he should have been no more than a few days, and from what I have remembered, the longest he was gone for was three days. Yes, it's already been a week, Barris added. I am just curious, Shark said. Isla then started to tease her. You mean you are worried? She had a teasing smile on her face while looking at the Jedi Master. No, I am just curious as he has not been tasked with any mission at all. Shark was able to ignore Isla's teasing and continued. I am only saying this because the lack of his presence is already starting to be felt. Is he that famous? Barris was the one out of the three here, with the least amount of knowledge about Anakin's fame. He was quite well known, and while she did know he was well known, she didn't know to what extent. Well, you could say so, Isla said with a bit of distaste. It was because she disliked him having this amount of fame, it made her slightly jealous sometimes, when there were some random girls that approached them when out in the public. Of course as a Jedi they shouldn't be within any type of romantic relationship, so they had to keep it secret, but that meant girls from outside the Order, whom were interested in him got annoying, especially when it was supposed to be their alone time. He should come back sooner or later, we don't have to worry. Isla said before all three of them felt something within the Force was strange. It was as if it was struggling to come to terms with something and their bond to Anakin was especially dull, not broken just like it was forcefully blocked. All three looked at each other feeling this way. What was that? Barris questioned. No, what has happened to Anakin for this to happen is what you really mean. Shark said in a tone that was certain Anakin had somehow gotten himself into some kind of trouble. You said he went to Tatooine, right? She asked Isla. Yes. Isla answered with a slightly concerned look on her face. I think we should go to Tatooine and ask about Anakin then. Shark continued. The three then got ready to leave, but before they could chase after their army, the group was stopped by Ahsoka. Where are you guys going? Don't worry, we are just to find Anakin. Barris spoke as the other two didn't have any time to waste and left already. It was Barris who was the closest with Ahsoka other than Anakin after all. If you are worried about him, then I think you guys shouldn't be. Ahsoka had a small smile on her face. But there were some small signs that indicated worry, despite what she said. I know, but this is just in case. Barris replied. Just make sure to stay safe. Ahsoka said. I will. Barris replied before bursting with a very fast speed down the halls of the Jedi Temple. While the girls scrambled to find out what had happened to him, Anakin was off in his own world. Specifically he was within his mind being confronted by the same two versions of himself that he had met during his time on Ilum. Well, 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 we meet again. Red spoke first. Strange how things work now, don't they? Blue continued. I am guessing that my current situation is not going to be as good as it could be for me. Anakin questioned the two not expecting everything to be explained to him in this situation. Now, now, there is no need to be afraid. Red said. I think there is plenty of reason to be afraid about what exactly is happening right now. Anakin then continued. Fear is actually very useful, I guess. Red agrees. Blue doesn't seem to agree and starts. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate dash. Dash leads to suffering. Yeah, yeah. I know that adage. And it can finish for him. That is quite silly though. Doesn't fear help an animal determine whether they should go through with something or not? I mean if I was a mouse and saw a cat, I would certainly feel fear. Fear would would lead to me running and hiding from said cat. Anakin continued. Enough of this philosophical talk. We are here to recognize your progression from physical balance of the light and dark. Then we will determine whether or not your spirit is ready to gain its own balance within the dark and light as well. Red cut straight to the point. I am guessing that small ritual done on Ilum wasn't enough then. Anakin said with a questioning tone. Only for your body. Blue replied. So the energies within myself were imbalanced at the time. And it was only within my physique. Meaning that there is still more to come. Anakin thought over the situation that he had believed he had already overcome. Technically, yes. Blue replied to his thoughts before continuing. Because of your actions to achieve immortality, the Force has deemed that you must be tested. Yeah, that little experiment of using the Immortus gland through manipulating midi-chlorians and concentrating pure dark side and light side energies into the both was quite risky. Red said, you could have died, but you are lucky you are still needed. Blue said, I am still needed am I? You know, I may be still under your influence, but I will get out of it sooner or later. Don't mistake my cooperation with compliance, Anakin stated. We are aware, we have tried to correct your path. But it would seem whatever had happened upon your development was something even the Force itself couldn't predict. Red said. The Force is not so infallible, it would seem. Anakin said. It should be impossible, what you are goes against what we want, but we are unable to fully stop you. Because that is what the Force is. It may direct or guide the actions of everyone it doesn't mean it's set in stone. Blue said. But Anakin started off knowing that there was a but coming. Blue continued. But, what you wish to do is not in line with how the Cosmic Force operates. Immortality, true immortality should not be within your grasp. There is no death only the Force. You must be aware of the other things I have been doing. Anakin said again in a questioning tone. We are, and the Force both agrees and disagrees with many of your choices. We can see you are going along with the idea of balance. 
but the methods you are going about it is opposed to the exact outcome we want. Blue continued. You mean the Force is a control freak? Anakin said, exasperated. Yes, and children should listen to their mother. Red said before Anakin's world was dispersed, and he didn't see the two anymore, but instead saw his mother. She was smiling and looking softly at him. Arnie, why don't you just help me? Anakin knew this was just an illusion, and was entirely possible it was just a test, just as he had been constantly hounded by visions and scenarios, of which may or may not come true. He replied, Mother, I know you are not real. I am still a representation of her, am I not? Yes, he agrees. Would I not be disappointed with some of the things you have done? In fact, I would completely disagree with a lot of what you have done. I know. Then why? Someone has to make their own decisions and live with the consequences. Whether they be the right or wrong decision, it is still my own choice to make it. And if need be, learn from it. What if listening to me would write all your decisions? That you would be safe in knowing that every choice you make directed by me is the correct one? Are you sure about that? Now confused, force my reply with a question. What do you mean by that? The Force is an energy field that is semi-sentient, and because of this and its connection to the living Force, which are actually organisms that form a symbiotic relationship with living creatures, it would make sense that doing so brings you benefits. Anakin then continued, Anything I do in accordance to your choice, your direction would mean you benefit in some way, and it may be something wrong, something that could kill millions. You have done it in another timeline, another universe, have you not? Anakin finished with a question, You are referring to Vader, aren't you? Force Shmai had a rather complicated look. Yes and no, not just Vader within another timeline but with others, things that happened before the rise and fall of the tragic tale of the Chosen One, but others as well. Anakin then continued, There is Sidious, the Jedi, everything dating back to the most distant of times, where you have dictated and swayed people to your will. I will not have the same fate and will go about myself in a way that stays true to who I am. Force Shmai still had a complicated look on her face. I can see that there is no changing your mind. She then continued, Your decision today will lead many to their fall, and will lead many to their salvation. I know. But no matter how powerful you are or how all-known you could be, it doesn't mean you are always right. Anakin continued, Just as with everything else, you have your own reasons that usually line up with keeping a balance of some kind. This balance has put the lives of many on the line, and has resulted in total destruction for a lot of people. I admit, I cannot sway you. Force Shmai said again now adopting a rather calm or serene expression. Your will is very strong, strong enough to break away from my influence. Soon enough you could become somewhat of a god, a real god that your creations praise you for being. What do you mean by that? That is enough about that, for now it would seem your mental trial of eternal life is over. Next you will face the gauntlet within this dimension. Force Shmai said, gauntlet, that doesn't sound too pleasant. Anakin says smartly, I may be your mother. But that doesn't mean I only have one hand, and it would seem through the gentle hand you will, will not crumble. Maybe your hopes, dreams and desires will conform to the Force about a test of strength. Force Shmai's smile was starting to turn a bit sinister. Anakin was mentally transported to another dimension, the dimension within the Force that was unknown to everyone. Chaos, otherwise known as Hell. Welcome to Hell. Great. Anakin thought to himself about whatever creatures or even powerful Force-sensitive dead people he would come across. Wait, maybe I could use this opportunity to learn a thing or two from these people, and in fact I could observe how this hellish dimension works. Anakin was already coming up with ways to exploit the situation he was in, whether that be positive or negative, it would seem that the Mensa to grind is very persistent. Chaos, referred to as Hell in Corellia mythology and also known as the Void, was a reputedly dark region of the netherworld of the Force inhabited by the spirits of deceased Dark Lords of the Sith, Dark Jedi, and the spirits of all evil sentient beings who had died. In Nabu mythology, Chaos was envisioned as a dark pit kept closed by six impenetrable gates. What stood before Anakin was something close to that concept, a deep dark pit kept closed by large gates, that only muffled to intense screams and angry howls. They could barely hear. Looking down Anakin could help but ask. So, I am supposed to go in then? Force Shmai was still with him. Yes. Just leap right in. There is no need to worry here. Just that should you fail you will be erased to your personality. Your memories, your entire consciousness will become nothing, and then you would become a true embodiment for the Force to work through. Please don't die. We don't wish to use your immortal body after death to complete our designs. You are still needed after all. Force Shmai just smiles innocently after saying all of that. Nature may be a cruel mistress, but the Force is sadistic bitch of a wife. Anakin stated, Thank you. Now off you go. Force Shmai pushed him in as the gates to the deep dark depths opened just for him. How will I get out after completing my supposed test? Anakin questioned as he was slowly falling into the depths. Don't worry, just take your time, and everything will be just alright. It's not like the longer you delay yourself you give those within the waking world more time to find your unconscious body to discover everything you have been doing. Force Shmai just continued to smile. You are not even going to give me the decency of some time. Anakin shouted out to his Force Mother. Sometimes life's works in mysterious ways. Force Shmai says with a smirk on her face as she chuckles. You mean the Force? Anakin questioned, but this time didn't shout out before being engulfed in the darkness of the Chaos Dimension. That too. Darkness had consumed him. All around him there was no light. The screams and howls he had heard before taking the plunge were not heard anymore. Anakin was trying to make sense of his surroundings, but none of his implants would help him in this situation. His physical capabilities don't really matter here, because he is just a corporeal being, a spirit that could only affect things around him through the Force. Of course, within the confines of this dimension, he should be able to physically in a sense interact with whoever he comes across, because there would also be spiritual in nature as well. 
Nothing that has a living body could come down here, and that was why Anakin was only down here as a spirit, which really limited him. But just because it did, it didn't mean all of his physical manipulation was for naught. Some capabilities would still be able to access, in particular his baseline physical strength or speed, should be above the average Joe down here. That is if there are any average Joes located down in this hellhole. Anakin thought to himself. Still falling Anakin decided to stop and use the force to do so. Upon stopping he was finally given the ability to see. And what he saw was an environment caked in brimstone and flame. Just like what I would have imagined hell to be like. He thought to himself. You there. Someone spoke to him. New to these parts. Aren't you? An athletically built woman of average height with long, blonde curls of hair and eyes yellow with the duck side. And you are? Anakin asked the very alluring female. It is quite rude to ask me of my identity without stating your own. She raised an eyebrow as she said this. Deciding to take on a more elusive approach, Anakin clouds himself with the duck side, which was especially present within this dimension. His eyes, which were a glowing violet, had now turned to the burning yellow and red of the Sith. State your name. He decided to start playing on his Vader persona more. I will not ask again. Aware of how cruel and insidious a Sith could be, he decided to not be nice. A show of dominance then. The woman asks before getting into her own stance despite Anakin being physically much more imposing. Come at me then. The two didn't have anything to use against each other, other than the Force itself and their physical forms. But it would be suicide for the girl to attack Anakin physically. So obviously she relied on the Force and her connection to the dark side to make sure she pulls through and emerges victorious. Anakin decides to rush her but unfamiliar with his new environment is thrown for a loop, when she is easily able to create distance between the two. Experience matters the most around here, and your brute force won't work here. The woman taunted, no matter, your efforts to escape my grasp are futile. Anakin said as he drawing on the dark side rather easily, but it tried to corrupt his mind, much more than it had when alive. What the hell is this? No pun intended, but Anakin was having a hard time controlling the untempered dark energies flowing through his corporeal form. She pushed and pulled with the force to further distance herself, and try and cause some form of damage. It was successful in doing so as those who were ghosts were much more susceptible to the energy field known as the Force. Anakin could only come up with the idea of creating Force lightning around himself, and it worked. The scale of powers and abilities within this dimension was as if it had become a battle between gods. Not that the Force technically didn't already elevate people like this. But this was on another level that Anakin hadn't experienced before. You learn fast, newbie, but don't think your attempts to defend yourself will help you. She started to generate her own force lightning, forming an arc that went across the distance between the two and struck him. Damn. Anakin had sustained damage, but not to the extent he wouldn't be able to heal from. This is dangerous. He thought to himself as he remembered Force Shmai's words. Die in here and my entire being would be erased, expunged and purged. He revised to himself what she basically meant to convey to him. Well, what are you doing? The woman continued to taunt him, which was an attempt to make him do something stupid. Anakin didn't reply, and just sent out his own concentrated pushes into the Force, manipulating the latent residual energies to create a large area of impact. Seeing this coming, the woman creates an energy shield around herself to protect her spiritual form. Her efforts were only slightly useful, but Anakin had actually managed to break her shield, and decided to close the distance between the two. He wanted to finish this fight as soon as possible, because who knows who else is here, his precognition hardly works and only allows him in increasing his reaction speed to things happening around him. He cannot actually spread out his sense within the Force as he could when within his living body. He went into a full-on sprint which he used the Force to aid him in getting closer, while bombarding the woman from all sides to make sure she doesn't try and do what she had done before. Lightning started to crackle from his palms. The woman wasn't able to handle the situation, as there were multiple pushes and boundaries within the Force, forcing her to stay in place. Otherwise she would have been able to create some distance again. Forced to stay in the same spot was hard, because if she moved she may be harmed and possibly destroyed because of Anakin's onslaught. No. No, wait. She yelled out as he closed the distance between the two. You don't know you are doing. Anakin didn't care because his instincts didn't alert him to anything dangerous. And while Anakin doesn't always completely trust the Force, it is still something he is a part of and will continue to use. His senses within the Force also didn't alert him of anything as well. He was just in front of her. He reached out his palms covered in lightning that coursed up and around his arms, where the energy raised his hair as if he was a Saiyan. Upon making contact with the barrier, it broke down, and he continued his path to grabbing the woman. She tried to utilize this opportunity to use the Force and create a push of her own, but it was useless because because Anakin saw through this, and had already reinforced himself. No, she yelled out one last time before he touched her, and as he did it created a weird sensation between the two. A bright light was given out which lead to Anakin being confused, as he was now within a different space. Where am I now? He thought to himself. I know why you went to Prakath. I know you went after Andedis Holocron. I know you were searching for the secret to eternal life. Anakin experiencing the point of view from the woman he was just fighting with, and she was speaking with someone. I did that out of necessity. I taught you everything I knew about the dark side. I waited for years for you to challenge me. But you were content to toil in my shadow, to remain an apprentice until the ravages of age robbed me of power. You are unworthy of becoming the master, Xena. That is why I went to Prakath. The man she was talking to responded. Your time is over, Bane. The woman now identified as Xena, spoke before engaging engaging her master, Darth Bane. Their engagement was short before they departed from each other, where one had escaped, while the other chased and his point of view changed again, now outside in the open space. A camp of some kind structures were seen throughout, and in his view, or Xana's view, she was only looking towards the cloaked figure known as Darth Bane. I wondered why you chose this place to meet. 
I thought it might have some symbolic meaning for you. Xana said reminiscent about the past. The last time we were here you were too weak to even stand. You were helpless and you thought I had betrayed you to the Jedi. You said you would rather die than be a prisoner for the rest of your life. You wanted me to take your life. But I refused. Xana continued. You knew I still had things to teach you. You swore you would not kill me until you had learned all my secrets. Bane said in response. That day is here. I have surpassed you, Bane. Now I'm the master. Xana said. Then prove it. Bane continued before they both ignited their lightsabers. Bane then attacked Xana, quickly pushing her back with the ferocity and power of his blows. He used several new techniques that he had never taught her before or used against her in their training sessions. Nevertheless, her defense stayed strong and Bane soon settled into a pattern of feints and quick thrusts. As he continued to drive her backward, Xana began to gather her power, preparing to unleash her sorcery against him, hoping to bring the duel to a quick end. However, Bane circled to come in on her left flank and Xana, her focus split between Bane and preparing her spell failed to notice the freshly dug grave of Sarah behind her. She stumbled on the grave and fell, and Bane immediately set upon her with a series of furious attacks, kicking and stomping at her, cracking one of her ribs. Xana rolled with the impact, landed on her feet, and threw herself into a series of back handsprings, before finishing the jumps with a thrust meant to impale Bane. Bane, however, had stopped several meters back, letting her tire herself out with her extraneous flips. Xana quickly gathered the force and attempted to overwhelm him with her sorcery, focusing on imprinting images of Bane's worst fears into his mind in an attempt to drive him insane. Although the ploy began to work at first, Bane had conquered his fizz years before, he successfully summoned enough willpower to defeat the spells with a powerful blast of force energy that sent Xana flying backward. As Xana rose to her feet, Bane charged at her once more. Desperate to end the duel, Xana drew upon the power within Ambria itself and summoned tendrils of pure dark side energy from the ground around them. She thrust the tendrils at Bane, who attempted to dodge the attack as he advanced on her. One tendril clipped Bane's shoulder, causing him to fall to the ground in excruciating pain, greater than any pain he had ever felt before. Rising again to his feet, Bane charged Xana, dodging the tendrils, and realizing that his only hope was to cut her down, before more tendrils hit him. When he was in range, he struck out with his lightsaber, and Xana, her focus split between the tendrils and defending herself from Bane, barely deflected the blow, but her lightsaber was knocked from her grasp. However, as Bane went for the final, killing blow, his sword arm was cut off by one of the tendrils. Bane collapsed to the ground in pain, and, realizing he had no other choice left, he grabbed Xana's wrist, and began the ritual of essence transfer. Bane's body was immediately destroyed, turning to ashes his consciousness transferred over to Xana's body. However, he could still feel her consciousness within her as well, and she fought back. They engaged in a battle of wills, Bane seeking to obliterate her identity, while she attempted to force him out of her body. They were matched evenly for a moment, but Xana finally defeated him, banishing his consciousness from within her. Nevertheless, part of Bane remained imprinted upon Xana. Who are you? Anakin was now face to face with the figure known as Darth Bane, a shadow of who he once was. A shadow within the consciousness of Xana. Anakin now knowing who he is dealing with, knew that he was probably going to fight this man. Well, I guess I am here to destroy you permanently. Anakin knowing now that he is within the subconsciousness of Xana, imagined his lightsaber, and it appeared within his hand. Bane seemed to not want to talk either as he also summoned his own. You will not destroy me, Xana is unworthy. Bane spoke. It seems to me old man that your time has come. Anakin replied taunting the Sith Lord. Shut up. I will destroy you. Bane replied. Bane lunged at him with deranged madness and lunacy. But Anakin saw this coming, and started to adjust to his new environment once again. The same environment that Xana last fought her master in. Anakin had disconnected his dual-bladed saber, and was now holding them separately. He swung multiple times with such force it created impacts in the imaginary environment. Bane slowly but surely being pushed further and further back onto where he was originally showing Anakin's physical capabilities and his influence on the Force. But given this was just within the mind of someone within the Hell Dimension, it was better to rely on the dark side. The energies of the light was especially small within this place. Ha ha ha. You are strong. Much more brave than my cowardly apprentice who waited until I was old, decrepit and dying before trying to strike me down. Bane spoke as he coughed up some blood like an old Chinese cultivating ancestor. Don't worry, your apprentice may have been unlucky, but I know of the tricks to try and transfer one's essence into another. You will not be living, in fact you won't even be in existence within the hell dimension. Anakin said, Do you think I'm afraid? I was destroyed long ago and am just a shadow of my former self. That is why you were able to defeat me so easily. Bane said. Anakin replied, That may be so. But this is a pathetic existence you lead. I shall have mercy and put you out of your misery. Anakin approached with his sabers, both blue and red, and was just about ready to take the plunge, before Xana appeared and stopped him. Why? He asked. Why? Anakin asked as Xana had stopped him from executing the remainder of Bane's soul and consciousness. I will do it myself. She said before taking Anakin's red lightsaber and swinging the blade through Bane's neck, separating his head from the rest of his body. Bane then started to dissipate into nothingness. Then Xana looked towards Anakin looking him directly into his eyes. You shouldn't have touched me. She spoke. Now you will have to be stuck with me. Anakin was about to ask what she meant before feeling something he was all too familiar with at this point. Great, he said inside, another died. Before the two could continue to talk within her mind, a flash of light happened, and Anakin was ejected from her mind. We rejoin Anakin and Xana where he had touched her. They were awkwardly in a compromising position that leaves much to the imagination. Groaning Anakin is the first to awaken from his spiritual slumber, and quickly untangles himself from this situation as he doesn't want the woman to attack him again. He had just helped her. 
but he assumes that any and all goodwill would go out the window if she awakes to how they were. Taking a look around the environment still projected flames and molten lava deep beneath under some crystallized cabins that glowed a range of reds and oranges. The sky was a blazing red, yellow and orange, while the ground was also painted red with brown and black mixed in. This certainly doesn't look very hospitable. Anakin thought as he waited for Xana to awaken from her subconscious. The Sith woman started to awaken, and as her eyes opened, one could see that she was still deeply aligned with the dark side. Where am I? Her eyes were still the burning yellow of the dark side's corruption. Anakin had let go of his hold on the dark side, allowing his eyes to return to his glowing violet eyes. Hey you, you're finally awake. Anakin said while immediately thinking to himself. Wait a minute, did I just- He was interrupted as the woman immediately got up and took on a defensive stance. You, me? Anakin pointed a finger to himself as the woman spoke to him. Yes you. Why did you do it? What did you think you were doing? She was distraught, no doubt as she had just experienced a cleansing of sorts. Nothing? I just wanted to ask some questions. Anakin stated. Then why did you try and do it forcibly? She questioned him still not letting her guard down. I thought that was one the Sith worked, might makes right. Anakin stated. You are both wrong and right. She replied then continued. You are slightly wrong in that might makes right. It is strength gives way to power power, and power gives way to victory. Right, I was seeking victory and the fruits of what that would give me. Anakin replied knowing full well he is probably annoying the beautiful Sith. You are totally doing that on purpose, Xana said with a questioning tone. No well, maybe. Yes, maybe. Anakin replied. Well, what is it then? Yes or no? Xana was actually indulging in this childish behavior that was wasting some time. Both. Anakin answered. Sighing Xana then started to calm down after her initial suspicions. All right. It would seem that you are not the brightest of Sith. In fact, you don't even have the signature eyes. She then continued. In fact, you didn't even talk with me properly first and just attack me. Anakin just decides to play up his ignorance and tilts his head to the side in a cute manner. What the hell is up with this person? And why do I feel strangely attracted to him? Xana was having weird thoughts and feelings not knowing where such things were coming from. One only has to look back on her life, because throughout she didn't experience any proper love, and was quite the sociopathic little child with minimal feelings. She had always wondered what love was and what it would be like. She even went so far as to try and manipulate another person into believing she had loved him, but she didn't. It would seem that she is also unaware of what exactly a forced diet is given, she is unable to recognize the now special bond between herself and Anakin. Subconsciously she may have recognized it, but at the waking world she did not. I guess I could take you under my wings for now, Xana said out loud not expecting an answer. You will? Where am I exactly? Anakin asked playing up his act of ignorance. Welcome to hell, or at least one part of it. Xana answered. There are many layers to this place. The further down you go, the more dangerous it becomes. In general most of us Sith stay on the upper levels because it is safer. What is deeper below? He asked. Creatures and beings of great power that are extremely old. Beings that are no Sith and in fact have power levels similar to stories, legends and myths of divine beings. She continued. Really? Yes. But I believe it is better if you see stuff like this than hearing it from me. Xana said. Follow me. Thus began the journey into the depths of chaos, a never-ending abyss that was easily the worst place for any being to be. Xana and Anakin spent a predetermined amount of time together as they traversed the spiritual landscape. So, what is your name anyway? You have not told me. I go by Darth Xana. Xana said trying to pull out any information from Anakin. Anakin Skywalker? He obliged. Raising an eyebrow she asks. Are you not a Sith? No. He replied. A dark Jedi then. She nods her as if she found the answer. No. He replies again. Not a dark Jedi. Then you must at least be a practitioner of the dark side to be here. She was getting confused. Yes and no, he again said. But this time it confused her even more. Can you just answer me directly? Frustration leaked from her voice. She was used to people, especially men falling for her very beautiful and alluring charms. But it would seem that the dunderhead before her wasn't charmed. I did. Anakin was actually enjoying this experience because it helped relieve some pressure from what was happening. Her anger nearly spills over. But she manages to restrain herself and feels she would regret trying to attack him again. Fine, keep being stupid. Deciding that enough was enough, Anakin wants to make amends. Okay? I was just playing around. Honestly that may not have been the best thing to say in this situation. Xana twirls around and lunges at Anakin going for the metaphorical kill. His family jewels. But he easily dodges. Whoa there. Careful. I still those. Anakin says. You are dead anyway. Just accept your fate already. She replied before going to punch him. But he just stops her and looks into her eyes with an eerie glow being emitted. You cannot escape me now. Anakin says. What do you mean by that? She felt there was something more to his words. But he didn't answer but dodged the question. What I mean is that you should continue to be my guy for now. I need to know what this place is all about. I am not going to stay here long. She laughs in derision. Of course not. There is no way you sound exactly like every other poor soul who ends up down here. I don't have much time and I would appreciate it if you would hurry up taking me to my destination. Anakin now said in his voice like the cheerful energy he had before. Seeing the seriousness of the situation she can't help but try and push her luck. She wanted to know about the outside world. And why should I help you? She questioned. Like I said, you can't escape me now. Anakin replies implying something more that she doesn't realize. While the concept of a diet within the force was not a new one. It was certainly regarded as lost information, and was not generally taught within the Sith, even when it was incredibly important to the Sith in the first place. So it did make sense that since it was so rare, so special and unique, it would be impossible to know about it. 
And if you have one without actually knowing how it feels, right, if you won't give me a reason, then at least make this an exchange. She redirected herself into the direction she wanted. And what would that be? He asked. Information, it gets boring being down here for a couple millennia, and I want to be regaled in whatever stories you have to be told. Tell me, have the Sith become great? How much more powerful has our order become? She asked. So you wish to know whether or not your order succeeded ever since your passing? Anna can ask knowing full well that was what she wanted to know. Yes. I may have been short-lived, but the Sith are eternal, Xana stated. Are they? Anakin questions allowing something else in his voice, doubt. Are you doubting our capabilities? Xana asked him with some anger. The Sith are no doubt strong in the past. Now, the Sith are definitely trying to make a great comeback through another Sith Lord, but I doubt he would last long. He replies, tell me more. She asks him with some haste. Okay. Anakin then proceeds to detail to her about the events of the galaxy ever since her time of passing, which was the great peace of the Republic, about how the Sith Order had collapsed some time after Xana's subsequent death, and no other great Sith Order of any kind had made a re-emergence. Impossible. Xana denies this. At least there are Sith still alive and still follow the rule of two. Contrary to what you think, you were nothing but a puppet, a pawn within the great scheme of things. Anakin said to her, the current leader is actually someone who would spit in the face of your traditions. A traitor then, Xana says with some heat. Perhaps, he replies. Now, can you lead me to where I want to go? A deal is a deal. Despite being a manipulative person for some reason she was told within the force, and had felt herself feel negatively about trying to back out from their exchange. Great. Anakin smiled which sent her into a daze for a second. That seemed to be an eternity before returning to herself. Come, it would seem you have some type of death wish wanting to face those things. Even though she was incredibly talented and strong within the force, she doubts anyone could defeat those things in the depths. Maybe I do, but I need to do it. Anakin stated more to himself than to her in conviction. These abyssal monsters were in his way to eternal life after all. Ahsoka had been having the time of her life ever since meeting Anakin. She was a lonely child, not necessarily shunned by her pairs but also not accepted either, she was without any he she called call her friends. And even though she had a slight sense of belonging to the Jedi, she always had this feeling there was something more to come. Then it came to her, visions of an older looking version of herself with another person. It was Anakin. But her Anakin now looked different, not completely different, as he still had the same facial structure and everything, it was just a lot of things about him was different. She had seen herself become his friend, and had also seen herself eventually leave the Order. Something she was scared about at first. But then she didn't have to worry anymore, because she would always have someone to come to. She looked up to Barris as an older sister, the same applied to Isla as well, but she was much more closer to Barris. What wouldn't change though is that she was incredibly attached to Anakin, because she was always meant to be friends with him. The Force had told her so. Currently 12 years of age she would soon start having to look for a master, and while students were generally accepted at ages 13, she knows that she was different. She had recently turned 12, and was a year off from constructing her lightsaber and from finding a master. There was only one person she would even accept or even consider as a master. In fact, she had heard and had sensed that Barris was going to become a knight soon. So she would wholeheartedly take her chance as soon as she could. Ani, she had affectionately referred to him as had told her once, in life there are opportunities, and once missed they usually don't come again. But that doesn't mean these things are always right, and caution is needed when doing so. She wanted to throw caution to the wind, and in fact didn't care because she was content in her feelings, and accepted that she wanted to stay by his side even when he already had so many people with him. He had essentially become her family, more so than the Jedi. She knew that the other older women and Barris would abandon their lives as Jedi and follow Anakin. So why couldn't she do the same? After all, Arnie had also told her, your life is your own, and you should make your own decisions. She conveniently left out his other piece of advice because this choice was not something she would even take into consideration. She would be next to him simply because she was meant to. If you are wondering what Anakin had also added on it was, just know that not every decision is going to be the right one. Ahsoka thought to herself, I wonder if Anakin is really okay she was left here alone on Coruscant, because everyone else she was extremely close with went on a search for Anakin. Not that she blamed them, she was just hoping everyone would be alright. When she said she had a feeling everything would be fine, she didn't lie, but that didn't mean she still didn't worry. There was many times she had gone to Master Yoda for some guidance. Not that she didn't appreciate Anakin, she did, extremely so. It was in fact Anakin's suggestion for her to not only stay with them all of the time, because there would be times that she wouldn't be able to seek his advice, and while he doesn't agree with Yoda a lot of the time, he was at least experienced and had some wisdom to share. Yoda had said to her in regards to finding a master, youngling Ahsoka, nervous about finding a master, um, yes, she replied, believe through the force, there can only be one for you I see, don't worry, strong within the force, stronger than most within the order, a signed you will be one most appropriate for you if need be. Yoda finished, she gave her thanks and pondered the meaning behind his words, but didn't put a lot of thought into it. Back within hell, a ripple was seen as a figure was fighting through a horde of monsters rushing at the person, there was no one else around, and the figure was all alone. How nice of her to leave me. Anakin thought to himself as he was the one currently punching his way through a horde of rather vicious abyssal creatures. He had been left alone all by himself, not because Xana didn't want to stay but because she was still influenced mentally by her own choices. The force and the dark side. Meaning, when she had the opportunity she ditched him because she had gotten what she wanted. But that doesn't mean she didn't give him everything he needed. In fact, she had provided in full according to their deal. 
knowing how manipulative she was Anakin was surprised. I guess I shouldn't be however thinking to himself about how diet's usually influencing the person you're connected to and yourself to start feeling things about each other in a different way. From what he knows there are two types of diets so far, one between a master and their student, which was mean for the Sith to empower the other when they died, then the other was the one he has, currently connected to Isla, Shark, Barris and now Zana. It would influence the participants' emotions somewhat to induce emotions like love, the romantic kind. It wasn't exactly a negative thing, and Anakin didn't mind the force playing matchmaker, because there is a basis behind how a diet works, as if there was no connection, no compatibility and certain requirements weren't met it would not happen. A reason why he believed he could have so many was because of the force and him being the chosen one. Maybe Mother Force just likes spoiling me. Anakin thought to himself knowing the Force probably knew what he was like and knew what he desired. It was like it was arranging multiple brides for him. Not that he minded all too much, but it certainly wasn't exactly under his own terms. And another bites the dust. He said as he had for the thousandth time put down another one of these creatures, it would seem his current test was of his mental endurance. After what seemed like a few minutes pass, he had finally put an end to the last of his obstacles from his goal. Anakin continued his way down to the next level. He had meet a few other Sith and Dark Jedi along his way through but never got to interact with any of them, because Xana scared everyone off. While she may not be the biggest fish in the pond, she was definitely big enough to scare away everyone else. Seeing the entrance to another level he delved in, the next level was actually a simulation, it purposely put someone within their own personally crafted hell, where they had to live through what they had done in life. Some actually enjoyed whatever sick things they had done, but that doesn't mean everything was good for them. There were certainly ways to get around this level and how to beat it. Anakin was facing it as well, but because he is a glitch within the system, it gave him the life of another Anakin, another Vader whom he was most familiar with. He had to live through the tragedy of Vader, his rise and fall, his slavery on Tatooine, to his slavery to the Jedi then through his slavery to the Sith Lord Palpatine. This further increased his resolve to make sure that Palpatine is put to an end as fast as he could. Okay, maybe the original wasn't enslaved to the Jedi, but there are instances with which the Jedi Order could have done better. Anakin thought to himself, he felt the pain, the physical and emotional to such a deep level, but his will held out long enough for him to reassert that he is different because he is. The loss of Padme, the supposed loss of his children, the loss of his mother, the suffering and loss of his hand to the loss of his Padawan Ahsoka. The original Anakin definitely didn't have the best life, and his punishment for the horrible actions he took was definitely not pleasant either. It may have been well deserved, but that doesn't mean his story was any less tragic. In the end, practically everyone had failed him. This story was irrelevant to him though because he was not that Anakin. He was not the monster he had become, and in fact he may become something more. He had already been alluded to the fact of divinity by the Force itself, and it would seem there are some beings trapped within the Force's chaos that could have a clue to this illusion. Or maybe not, no one will know, and he most certainly will not until he goes deeper. What is with this place? Anakin was still being barraged with another Anakin's life, before he started to notice that no matter he did, nothing changed. Everything he tried to change just went the way it originally did no matter what he did, and it was not like this didn't happen somewhere else. Or within another universal timeline. Here though he was different, and he had the sneaking suspicion this was done on purpose to try and again whittle down his mental fortitude. So he instead went with the flow which is completely against the way the Sith do things. They most certainly don't try to side with order, but would try and create chaos, because it was within their nature to do things according to their emotions. The only way he could combat his situation was to allow the fate of the original to happen. And just like that everything came to an end. Who would have thought that the way to end your misery is to accept it? Obviously that's probably not the best way to overcome this test. But it was the only way as the Sith were unable to change the past, just as Anakin couldn't change the fate of the original. Everything matters in the moment, reminiscing the past too much is bad, thinking of the future too much is also bad. Living in the moment is the best option. After escaping the second level, Anakin was promoted to the third. The first level seemed to be some type of gathering grounds for the evil, while the second level was a test or torture, choose your pick. He doesn't know what will come next, but he hopes it's something that can be done quickly. Who are you to disturb my slumber? A voice spoke out and the rumble was felt through the force. Anakin was able to tell that this may take some time. In the back of his mind Anakin could feel that the figure before him was more than what it seemed and strangely within the force, it felt strange. Answer me, the cloaked figure demanded. Another voice was heard, but this time it was only directed at Anakin, and all he heard was he is a wound in the force, more presence than flesh, and in his wake life dies sacrificing itself to his hunger. That's not ominous at all he thought to himself after being told that. Identify yourself at once. Anakin now felt the presence of this person within the Force crew and tried to put pressure on him. Anakin pushed back just enough to make sure this presence doesn't outright destroy his corporeal form. My name is Anakin Skywalker. That is not a name I know of. The figure spoke again, but Anakin was unable to determine any of its features. You must be new, and foolish as well to trespass here. I do not want any trouble. I only wish to proceed. Anakin stated. You wish? Do you? The figure spoke. You shall not pass. Who are you, Gandalf? Anakin thought within himself before saying. I think I will be passing. Thank you. No other words were exchanged as both of them started to draw on that power within the Force, and both were surprised to discover the strength with which each other had. Anakin, knowing better than to try and get physical because in this dimension all that mattered was the Force and nothing else, he kept his distance. You have no idea who you are messing with. The figure spoke. I do not, so why not entertain me? Anakin asked while being snarky, but this isn't able to provoke a reaction from the figure. Since I feel your strength, 
I know that this will be a good fight. You should know the name of your killer after all. The figure then started to unravel before him and Anakin was surprised because he knew who this person was. My identity is Dash he was cut off by Anakin. Darth Nihilus. Anakin said which surprised the person now identified as Darth Nihilus. Darth Nihilus was a man who always craved greater power. However, unlike most Sith Lords, he cared very little for the Sith as an organization. Nihilus saw death as the sole purpose of life and power as the means to achieve it. He was cautious as his actions during the campaign against the Jedi showed and was known as an aggressive, dominant figure who would not abide a threat to his power. Nihilus was once a human male with black hair cord finely into strips that he tied together behind his head. After he indulged his hunger for the dark side he lost his corporeal form, preserving his existence, only by having his spirit linger within his mask and armor. The Dark Lord fully embraced his condition as the mysterious and monstrous facets of it instilled in people who met him a deep-rooted fear upon which he could prey. Ceasing to feel fear and other emotions, he became an entity of pure intent. Nonetheless, Nihilus was still human enough to have some feelings, as his bond with Ma persisted until their confrontation on the Ravager. She was his only apprentice, and her betrayal was met with much anger. It would seem you know of me. Then that must mean you recognize that this will be your end. Nihilus said. Death comes to all. During combat, Darth Nihilus fought in an aggressive, one-handed style. He had learned some of the greatest of the Sith teachings, but such practices took the form of dependence. They would make him stronger, but only for a time, and he would have to feed upon force energy to replenish his strength. Anakin could draw upon Nihilus' fighting style. But because this was mostly long distance he would rely on the force to help him here. Nihilus wouldn't really allow a physical confrontation anyway. Or would he because he had just summoned a lightsaber from out of nowhere? Oh, it would seem that you are new here, foolish of you to assume that I would face you with no form of armament. Nihilus taunted trying to see the mental limits of Anakin's psyche. But he was just as unperturbed by the childish insults that was once thrown at him. Anakin deciding to see if he could do something similar, was not surprised to find he could, and now he held his dual-bladed lightsaber within his corporeal hand. Knowing of Nihilus's capabilities, Anakin knows he may be in a heap of trouble. Because he was only learning how to drain the force and life energies from people, while Nihilus had basically perfected his. The longer the fight went on the more Anakin would feel drained. I guess we should get started then. Anakin said as he decided to engage in a lightsaber duel, because that would probably be his only way to get to him. Yes, come to me. I like the smell of you. Nihilus was infamous for his ability to sever the force and create wounds whenever he could, and his insatiable desire for those strong in the force to feed upon. Jabitha, can you tell us where Anakin is? Isla had asked the living ship as they had come to and arrived on Tatooine along with Shark and Barris. I don't know where Papa is. Jabitha telepathically replied. Jabitha had grown in her force-based abilities, because Anakin had been trying to get her to open up more to the uses of the Force. It certainly helped to increase the speed she went at when traveling. Are you sure? Barris asked because if even Jabitha who probably has the strongest telepathic link to Anakin couldn't find him, it meant something was wrong. They knew for sure he wasn't dead, otherwise they would have felt it, they would have known it, so Atlas he is alive. That should be enough for the girls for now, Atlas that was until they found him again, or he mysteriously just pops up. Charting a trip to Tatooine without anyone else knowing would certainly raise some questions, well it probably wouldn't because the original Anakin was able to fly off to Anakin to see his mother dying. But that is besides the point, they should have as much time as they would need. Maybe we could try and pull on the connection all of us, together. Shark suggested. That could work, we would have to connect to each other to amplify the connection to break through whatever is blocking us. Isla agreed with Shark. Okay, let's do it. May we come inside Jabitha? Shark asked Jabitha because it would be even better to link up with Jabitha as well. Yes, let's find Papa. Jabitha responded. Everyone boarded the living ship and were surprised about the inside, because all three had come to know about the living ship it didn't they had ever been on her. Quickly getting over their surprise and getting to where the best spot was they started along with Jabitha connecting to them as well as while she didn't have the same connection, it was her psychic abilities outside of the Force that enabled another method to get to Anakin. They built themselves up within the Force and tried to trace where Anakin could be, and they had little success only being able to pinpoint that it was within the outer rooms. Somewhere around the systems they were surrounded by. Not very useful, but it did at least cut down the amount of area they would have to cover. Not that it would be too much of a problem with Jabitha's insane speed. Damn it. Isla yelled in frustration as her emotions started to bubble to the surface of the calm facade she had put on. Calm down, Atlas this is better than nothing. Shark tried to calm her down, is getting angry now doesn't really help them. Sorry, you are right? It's alright, we are all worried. That idiot just had to go on an adventure and not tell us anything about what he was doing. Barris tried to encourage Isla. Thank you. But I think we should start our search again. Isla said before commanding Jabitha. Jabitha, can you help us out? Of course, anything for Papa and his mates. Jabitha mentally said to them all which got a strange reaction from all of them. Isla blushed, Barris blushed as well but had more embarrassment while Shark was the less worried about what was said. Shark still sported a blush of her own where her leg had darkened. Did I say something wrong? Jabitha questioned. No Jabitha, what you said is not wrong. Shark was the fastest to recover. Back within the third level of hell, Anakin had to face a destroyer of worlds. Nihilus was using his aggressive saber siding style, while Anakin had taken a defensive position, because he wanted to tire Nihilus out. This isn't a good plan, he can continuously draw on the residual energies here. Anakin thought to himself, but it wasn't like he wouldn't be able to do so as well. 
It was just that this fight could continue for a long time. Anakin doesn't have the time to be spending all of it on Nihilus. Let's take this up a notch. Anakin said as he started to draw on the dark energies that was latent within this dimension. Nihilus didn't say anything and continued his onslaught. What Anakin was trying to do was replicate the ability Nihilus was using, and it was slowly working. He was becoming a scar himself, an embodiment of chaos with which he could use against his opponent. Nihilus' ability to drain the force within an area, a planet and from people, might have come from his ability, was the result of drawing a design from his once apprentice's abilities of force sight. Continuously drawing on the dark energies, it would eventually start to have a corrupting effect on his mental psyche, and may even start to affect his process to becoming immortal through the implant, plus spiritual balance. It certainly had corrupted Nihilus where he had this insatiable hunger, it becomes something he depended on. He heavily depended on his ability to feed off of others, and this was something Anakin didn't want. Ha ha ha. Trying to copy me are you? Nihilus laughed sensing the change in Anakin and the Force. He stopped laughing however as he began to sense that the boy had such a control over the Force, it would seem unnatural. Even to him where he had become an absolute monster, a beast that formed countless scars within the Force. You mustn't be left to live. Nihilus redoubled his efforts to strike Anakin down, which made it harder to draw on the energy of the Force. This stalling of time has two detrimental effects, one being the longer it would take to master this technique than overwhelm Nihilus, and the second being he doesn't know how much time he has left before his body is discovered. Anakin continued to shift and pull the force inwards, but was careful in doing so, because he didn't the dark side to completely start corrupting himself. Nihilus was becoming more and more aggressive, knowing that if he didn't defeat the pest before he is done, he could very well be dead himself. He had tried several times now to cut off his connection to the Force, by severing it like he usually did. It was just that here in this hellish dimension, the wounds within the Force easily healed, meaning his severing ability in particular was useless here. Anakin just had to continue his defense and finish in a timely manner, focusing his thoughts into this one objective. Nihilus then started to swing in a manner that near cut off his hand, that was holding one of his sabers. But it was just a feint, when his other hand was cut off, which sent some feedback to his actual living body. It jumped but calmed down soon after, whereas Anakin was now complaining, but still focused and determined to not let this get in his way. Thankfully this isn't my actual body no. Stop. Do you really want to become like me? Nihilus now started to resort to using mental manipulation, something he was used to doing. I don't care, I am in control. Anakin said now fully empowered and having reverse engineered this ability, can now start to siphon the energy off of Nihilus. Death comes to all, I am inevitable. Nihilus had the illusion he was the Grim Reaper. Wrong. Anakin replied, death doesn't come to me, I come to death. Anakin closed the distance between the two within a second, and, hyped up on the unlimited power at his fingertips, he pierced Nihilus's eyes with lightning-coated fingertips. Then he said to Paul, he pulp crushed and destroyed Nihilus's consciousness that was strengthened as a result of his lifetime of experience. His willpower was whittled down to nothing, and his very existence was converted into pure energy within the Force, with which Anakin could use to empower himself even further. He soaked the energy as if it was some sort of juice. It was trying to corrupt as well, slowly blurring his eyes between the ethereal and beautiful glowing violet to the burning yellow. In the end however his control won out, the temporary effects however slightly twisted his mind in a way that further pronounced his inner desires of selfishness. Power. More. This would be what acquainted to what his thoughts are at this moment. This however went away after a few seconds to come down. Damn. That was a rush. He breathed out not taking any time to observe his surroundings. Because he doesn't know whether or not if he has been found yet. If he did take a look however he would be taken aback by the damage that was done. But not only that if he took the time to sense through the force within the immediate area. It was as if it was limited. As if there was no more energy left within this third level. The fourth level of hell was actually an icy tundra. From what he could tell this place acted similar to the first level. An intermediary and gathering of souls within one area safe from the horrors beneath. This time however there were beings and people he was completely unaware of. He knew none of them but they were stronger than those on the first level. They looked primitive as well, as if they were from a time long past. Possibly over millions of years old in fact. These locals however didn't seem to accept his presence, and if he was to guess, they were afraid of him. After all, he was brave enough to pass through the barriers sealing off these people from the first level. From the information he could gather, none of them had actually traversed here, and were instead placed here for some unknown reason. Probably because of age or some other factor, there were some people that had some more advanced looking outfits but no one he had ever heard about. So there were two factors to coming to the fourth level, one was experience or age, and the other seemed to be some unknown requirement based off of power. Anakin was pointed in the direction of the next level, the second to last otherwise known as no man's land, given not one person had tried to go through the barrier in a long, long time. Right, time to face the next challenge. Anakin thought to himself as he once again found himself falling into the abyss even deeper than before. Anakin had some speculation about what the levels of hell were really about, about what they represented, and he could think on the Sith Code as the example. The first level, while nothing much to go on represented peace as a lie, and that there was only passion. This was evident in the way the people interacted with each other there, where there was no peace at all, and only actions brought on by emotion. The second level represented passion as the only way forward, becoming passionate gave someone strength, which was actually fruitless within this level, proving that passion is not always enough to gain enough strength over their situations. The third level was through strength you gain power, and Anakin had done just that through strength he had gained power. 
terrible power, but power nonetheless. Anakin could guess that the undetermined requirement to enter the fourth level was victory through the use of power. Only those that gain victory through power could come down to the fourth level. Now he could only guess that this fifth level had to do with the next line. Through victory, my chains are broken. Anakin thought to himself as he continued to fall through the void. He lands and finds himself face to face with his next obstacle. He was trapped. There it was a chess board at the center of the room he was within. While the room was completely white, in contrast to what he was usually exposed to within hell. No lava lakes, no freezing lava lakes either. Four walls, the ground and a ceiling but no exit, no entrance. And he could only guess as to what he had to do. Play a game of chess. Not something he thought he would be doing. Because chess is not a common game within the Star Wars universe. But it must be a room constructed through his memories. He had after all played and had memories of chess over every other game in his previous and new lives. The thing about chess is that you usually have to face off against another opponent, sometimes you could face yourself, but that is quite boring because it is yourself, and you should know what your next step is. Or do you? Who will my opponent be then? As he was thinking this his opponent made himself known, that's right himself as the person on the other side of the room was actually him. Well, another or exact replica of himself. You must be my opponent then, Anakin said. Yes. Chess, Anakin replied. It is as you have guessed, the pieces of the puzzle have been put together quite well. Only through victory will your chains be broken. Only through defeating me will you be able to leave. Right, Anakin said as he took his own seat. Pick your color. Chess, Anakin said. Doesn't really matter. But I think I will choose black. It contrasts nicely with the room. Anakin said as the board now constructed fully 3D animated version of the chess pieces. What an inane reason to choose a color. Chess, Anakin stated. That's new. This ain't Harry Potter now, is it? Anakin said. No, it is not Harry Potter. Chess, Anakin answered as he started the game by moving the first piece. When it came to a being at Anakin's level, whom could move at very fast speeds while at the same time having the mental capacity and visual perception to keep up with movement, a game of chess would go quickly. So they went back and forth between each other at these intense speeds with no time limit, and this was exactly what led to the game coming to a draw many, many times. Not one time did one or the other get a decisive advantage on the other to have one side win over the other. In fact, even if Chess Anakin won a game, it would just make it so that Anakin had to win one game to draw each other again. This was done in an attempt to slow the process of his escape and liberation of this dimension, but also because it was another mental test. The first level was more physical in nature in relation to the Force, the second level was mental in nature. The third level got physical again, while the fourth level did nothing to challenge him, while this level is another mental test. Anakin thinks that the last level, the lower steps, may be a combination of both physical and mental connections to the Force. On Tatooine, before the girls left on Jabitha they had wanted to acquire some more information. They wanted to know whether or not Anakin had told anyone of where he was going. At the top of the list of candidates that he would trust enough was probably his mother and whoever else here on this planet, but definitely this mother is someone they should go to. The thing is all three were hesitant to do so because of two reasons. One was that the three of them were kind of scared of meeting what would equate to their own mother-in-law, but also because they didn't want to reveal anything that could mean Anakin was in trouble. They didn't want to worry her, because all of them knew of just how much Anakin loved his mother. First however they needed to find a way to stealthily make their way into the palace, which was highly secured by droids. They could bypass the droids because they were, well, droids or at least that was how they all thought about these droids. Isla took into consideration that the droids may be more dangerous than they are usually used to dealing with because it was Anakin's brand of droids after all. Even Barris had to agree with her on this one, because they had experienced how the training droids he had made fought with them. While Shark had limited experience when it came to Anakin's training droids, she at least knew from the other two that they should be cautious. Especially since security measures are properly much more strict even since what had happened a few years ago. All three cloaked themselves within the force and concealed their presence, not that it wouldn't do much when it came to the droids. This ability was mostly useful against those of whom were living. What did help them however was their athleticism and agility which they used to make it past the security before they moved into the palace. The three located the room, they didn't split up because that was too dangerous. What one would wonder however is why are they sneaking around like common thieves, when they could have just officially out in the open meet Shmai. Entering Shmai's through a window because the door was secured and they didn't want to break the property of Anakin's mother, they slowly made their way to Shmai and woke her up. Are we what? Who are you three? Shmai asked. Sorry to disturb your sleep, Empress Skywalker. Shark spoke first being formal. How did you guys get in here? Shmai had a confused look on her face, rather than one of fear, which was strange to the other three within the room. We will get to the point, we are looking for your son. I'll ask it to the point. This got a reaction out of Shmai, as now she was worried without even knowing what was going on. She felt extremely safe within the palace walls, even if someone somehow got into her room, she knew she was protected. Shmai's eyes sharpen as she questions in a commanding tone. What do you want with my son? Please, we mean no harm. We are from the Jedi Temple. Shark replied. Why are you guys here and looking for Ani? I don't think the Jedi would worry all that much about someone disappearing for a few days to a few weeks. Shmai asked. Well Isla was hesitant to say. But that doesn't mean Shark wasn't. We are not here on behalf of the Jedi, we are here for ourselves. Shark said then continued. We believe Arnie may have gotten himself into some trouble. It would seem Shark had a slip of the tongue that Barris and Isla didn't notice. But Shmai did. Arnie, are they that close to him? Shmai thought to herself before saying. I am sorry to say he has not informed me of where he went. But he will be okay. 
I am all too used to not seeing him for a long time. I have faith that he is completely fine. Shmai finished. The three girls didn't know what else to say, debating whether or not to just say that they were all sort of connected to Anakin the sixth level of chaos. The sixth level of hell. After having finally achieving a checkmate against himself, Anakin was thrown into another void where he was falling from a height that felt like it would never end. He had achieved victory, so he had gained freedom. Atlas that was what this dimension may be about in accordance to the Sith Code. For all he knows it could be going according to something else. And he was just trying to insert pieces of the puzzle within the wrong places. Even if Chaz Anakin had said he was correct, could he really trust anything or anyone here? Probably not. When thinking to the Sith Code, the last line was that the Force would set oneself free. Which if Anakin was to follow the theme, this would mean that possibly the last thing he has to deal with would be something to do with the Force. Something within the Force that could supposedly set him free. Whatever that meant, fate, destiny, immortal life or just free from this hellish dimension, he would find out. As he was falling he felt more and more that the force was chaotic. It was the epitome of what the dark side was, pure unadulterated darkness and chaos. For now he could only see nothing. But sooner or later he would be able to perceive his location. Falling quite hard but not taking any real damage except feeling some pain, Anakin can see that the description of very powerful and dangerous divine beings was an understatement. I didn't know I would be seeing some cosmic horrors. He thought to himself. He wasn't exposed to anything else. Atlas there was no boss for him to fight. But going by the levels so far, there should be one at the end of his path. Nwal Tash. Voices were heard as Anakin was making his way towards the things that looked like Thalu. Zwol Shasokan. Chasajunta Chatsadil New Taik. Taikjunta Chatsadil New Midwan. Midwanjunta Chatsadil New Ashar. Ashajunta Kotswan Edit Sunayak. Wanich Kaisik Nun. These voices were not vocalized, but were sent straight to his mind trying to disrupt his thoughts. They spoke into his mind with an unknown language, something he couldn't understand. Can you guys speak to me properly? I do not understand what you are trying to say. Anakin spoke to these beings as he was defending his mind, because those messages they were sending him were quite harmful. It was similar to how when Nihilus spoke and just being in his presence sapped him, but theirs was different. Its intent was not to devour, but to cause confusion, chaos, and be a source of absolute corruption. Stop trying to corrupt me, it is useless. Anakin said in hopes they would listen to reason, but madness doesn't stop because you logically apply yourself. They were started to get agitated. Nwal Tash. Zwol Shasokan. Chasajunta Chatsadil New Taik. Taikjunta Chatsadil New Midwan. Midwanjunta Chatsadil New Ashar. Ashajunta Kotswan Edit Sunayak. Wamich Kaisik Nun. They just said the same thing over and over again, non-stop. Usually when it comes to telepathy it is the ultimate way to transmit your thoughts and feelings to another. But it would seem that these beings purposely kept using another language. The language of the mind is universal. So how these guys could stuff up so badly was beyond Anakin. And he thought this was done on purpose. Or they were just beings of pure madness. Okay then. I guess that I will just have to end you guys. Anakin said using the trick to summon himself his own jewel bladed lightsabers. It would also make sense to drain these guys of their force energies. He though to himself as he leapt off of the ground and into the air. Diving right into the mass of creatures of madness. After a lengthy battle of dealing with these creatures of madness. Anakin continued his journey into the depths. Funnily enough his drop to the sixth level was not the lowest point he could be at. And he could go even deeper. Along the way he had to fight with beings that those above feared. Creatures of madness chaos but strangely enough of passion. They were extremely passionate that knowing a challenger had come down to face them. It would seem that the dark side is, as he thought more than just evil. People who believe that one side is absolute evil from the other is stupid, but but have their wrongs and rights. Most of the time the Sith or those affiliated with the dark side were corrupted by it which lead to devastating decisions or actions. This epitome of selfishness, while the light also corrupted those into an action choices that lead to devastating consequences as well. Not doing anything can be just as bad as doing something. Anakin remembered a saying from his last life, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. The Jedi were meant to be the good, but at many points one could point out their flaws and say they were evil in a lot of their actions, while others would point out the atrocities committed by the Sith as the worst actions possible, without considering that some of their actions created some good. Universally everyone is in the end both good and bad. Everyone has the capacity for evil, it is just whether or not you realize this or not. No one may be born this way, but they could with certainty be made this way. Nwal Tash. Zwol Shasokan. Chasajunta Chatsadil New Taik. Taikjunta Chatsadil New Midwan. Midwanjunta Chatsadil New Ashar. Ashajunta Kotswan Edit Sunayak. Wamich Kaisik Nun. Most the creatures that had some form of telepathy kept chanting within this language. What made it all the more frustrating was that he was unable to decipher this language, but if he had a guess of what it could be, he would guess it as actually the Sith Code. When it was finally all said and done, Anakin had reached a door. An impressively tall and wide door that easily overshadowed him and would probably overshadow those largest beasts behind him as well. He approached and as soon as he did he felt the force shift, and an eerie feeling settled within his corporeal stomach. His instincts went into overdrive, and he hadn't even opened the door yet. His mind was nearly thrown into chaos before he reasserted himself. Opening the door by using the force he enters the dark room and the doors close behind him, telling him he is now all alone with whatever is down here with him. There was a crater and the lighting was dim, but enough for him to make out tendrils of darkness coming out of the hole. He started to back up. I have a bad feeling about this. Anakin started to back up as the room he was within started to rumble. The next moment he knew he was held onto by a hand that came from the abyss. It was also black and looked corrupted covered in shadows and darkness. It dragged him down, deep down into the hole. Everything went dark and as he came to he found himself on the ground. It was rocky and cold. The only source of light came from himself as he conjured up some lightning. 
and coated himself with it which illuminated the dull grey coloured area. It was dark, extremely so, and he couldn't see an end to it. All four corners in the ceiling above was just an abyss, a void of black tar. From the darkness as he rises are dots red in colour that align themselves like eyes. It was horned, it came from the darkness as if was a part of it, and Anakin knew that he was in for a ride. It had fur coating its body, with one arm disproportionate to its other, and in its other arm, it held a large axe. Summoning his lightsaber while coated in lightning, he started to rush towards his new opponent. There is no talking just a beast ready to unleash its wrath upon him, and as he draws closer, it swings with all its might ready to crush him. He dodges the blow as it hits the ground creating a shaking effect in this infinite void-like space. Now behind the beast he sees it also has a tail, his senses then alert him of danger coming from his left, where he sees the creature's arm bend, and twist around itself in an unnatural way swinging right for me. Anakin dodges again while holding his lightsaber, he disengages, and now is using his dual saber in both hands instead of together. It twirled around and continuously tried to jump onto him where he just continued to move out of the way. It was creating waves of pure physically manifestations in the form of its fist taking on a dark shape, smashing and flailing around onto the ground around them. Anakin was on the defensive wrist, sending out some lightning towards the creature every chance he had. The beast's move set was actually something created out of a routine, and Anakin could accurately predict it making this fight all the much easier. As the battle continued and the beast was disoriented by his movement, he continued to keep up the pace, making sure not to slow down because that would just destroy his momentum. It continued to flail around to create a disturbance, and the force was deeply imbued within it which only served to further empower the mindless beast. This thing was the epitome of this void. This chaos with which if one were to dissipate within what would be left behind is nothing, no consciousness and only bodily instincts. It's mind gone and a being of no soul. It was actually strange for Anakin, because he in particular could feel the energy that radiated off of the beast. The beast started to break from its usual patterns, and stayed still for a moment as it lifted its axe into the void, and called forth on the force. It answered and created shadows that came down on the beast and Anakin within its immediate vicinity, forcing Anakin to create distance between the two of them. He had tried to penetrate the beast, but to no avail. It was as if the lightsaber was useless, and only abilities within the Force could harm it. Which reminded him about how within the Sith they believed through the Force, they could free themselves by using it, by becoming its absolute master and servant. So Anakin decided to do just that to completely dominate and control the dark energies within this endless void. He drew on and used the recreated ability he stole from Nihilus but needed to do so with caution. Again, he didn't want to become like Nihilus where he had become dependent on the Force to live for sustenance. The beast continued to pursue him and did a lot of things that was annoying to Anakin, as even though his opponent was stupid, that didn't mean it wasn't hard. It was absolutely mind-boggling hard to defeat this creature, because it absolutely made sure that no damage was done to it. His Force Lightning was the only thing capable of harming it, and he had minimal success. But at this point, it would take a long time to defeat it. He decided that he may need to take a risk here and believe in his capabilities of holding off the corruption. He started to increase the speed of which he drew in the dark side, which started to cause a change within his eyes. Making sure to at least try and maintain a balance one of his eyes became a burning yellow. His other still stayed the same glowing purple, but now he had technically completed the basic three colors. Red plus blue equals purple, while his other eye is yellow. He was slowly twisting the dark energies into himself, that even the mindless beast started to react and started to empower itself. Anakin rid himself of the sabers as they were useless to him in this moment, and he started to formulate another ability within the Force. Something within himself just clicked, and his corporeal form started to enlarge itself, just as the beast was doing so as well. It had now become a veritable battle of titans. But that didn't mean it was to be a fair fight. Anakin was now in what he would the future call his cosmic form. The beast summoned minions to better help it finish off its opponent as it now fully sees him as a threat. It called on its own lair to bring out more of those colossal tentacles, creatures of darkness where they came out. But now Anakin towered over them, where before he was towered over. Both of his eyes now were starting to turn another color, the color of darkness itself. A deep cold dark black, where once was beautiful glowing violet eyes that had a certain allure to them. Here it was as if the abyss was staring into you. His eyes stared directly at the beast as it roared and tried to overpower him with its aid. But Anakin was easily able to absorb them, as he slowly startled to suckle out of the beast its endless darkness. You are no match to me, reveal your identity now. Anakin compelled the mindless beast as if it still retained memories. Deep within the beast's red eyes there was some sort of amalgamation of voices, memories, thoughts and emotions with which Anakin could view through his cosmic form. He started to draw on the beast's power by pinning it down and creating force lightning to chain it. Your name Anakin said before seeing that the abyssal creature had no name. It was nameless. It just simply was, it simply is, it existed without purpose. And if it did have one it was to be trapped down here. Anakin started to assume this may have been some sort of illusion, a fragment of his imagination, before seeing something within the beast. A glimpse of the light side of the Force. It showed Anakin the possible identity of its existence. It was the devil, the veritable king of this underworld. A divine being that had been lost to the annals of time and the corruption of the infinite darkness of the Force. It would seem that not even the devil could survive this hellhole. How cruel. He thought to himself about this dimension and what it did to the people within. Anakin then withdrew himself and decided to purify the energy within the beast, before taking it for himself, and as he did so his body started to return to his normal size. No longer within his cosmic form his eyes also resumed their normal color. 
Because this variation of his cosmic form was of the darkness of the abyss, he would have to test out the next version of this form, which would be in line with the light side. Anakin now was starting to feel something building within the Force. What is this? It wasn't something here to kill him or somehow prevent him from leaving, and in fact felt like something beneficial. He had established a connection to this realm. What this signified didn't matter right now as he had to leave. So this will allow me to return to this dimension and traverse its levels wherever I want. He thought to himself before finishing his thoughts. Great. Returning to the first level Anakin has some unfinished business. He can't just leave someone he is now connected to, to rot down here with the rest of these poor sods. He is after all supposed to be stuck with her now. Everyone one that was here backed away from Anakin because of his presence within the Force, but not only because of this. Word travels fast when there really isn't all that much else going on down in hell, and when a new stranger appears out of nowhere and dives into the depths only to return unscathed, it certainly sets a precedent. They feared him now and there was no going back to how they used to live. Walking through this desolate place, the people here had constructed buildings seemingly out of the earth beneath them, and even though it is really just a manifestation of the Force, it is enough for everyone here to live. There was a form of hierarchy among everyone here, and not everyone had been completely able to dominate over the others, as no matter how strong there would always be someone stronger. Eventually groups or factions had formed. There are more than just one type of Sith, and it was Darth Bane that had started the sect that continued the practice of one master, one apprentice. Xana fully embraced Bane's teachings, and continued to do the same thing as he had set up the rule of two. Anyone the political situation here was weird, and there was no overarching leader of any sort, but a collective of the strong who created the rules. Whatever they may be, of course there was also more than the Sith as there were some Dark Jedi, and those who were simply affiliated with the Dark Side, and don't associate with either Force-related groups. Going back to the topic of Xana, Anakin thought over what would happen when he eventually left, which would be soon, but he needed to investigate and find where Xana had run off to. It would seem she was an isolated person here because rumors about her being unfit for a Sith Master spread around. And since people here rarely change their mindset because there is no reason to, they are inclined to believe this rumor. Using his relatively new connection to her, he manages to find her in the spot he had first met her at. Hello there, Anakin said out loud startling the woman. What are you doing here? Xana replied grumpily before realization settles in on her face. Wait, how are you alive? She rushes over to him and starts to inspect him very closely. What do you mean? Did you want me to die? Anakin questioned her, ignoring her shock. What do you mean? What do you mean? You really must be stupid, just like the first time you came down here. Xana said. I am leaving. Anakin stated to stop more of her nonsense. Oh, you are leaving already. Xana says before stopping herself and then overriding her previous statement. I mean hurry up and leave already. And you are coming with me. He continued. What are you even talking about? You are not making any sense. And who said I was going anywhere with you? Xana was quite aggressive. Just because. Anakin smirked which only annoyed her further. Well, I for one dislike the idea of coming anywhere with you. So dash she was interrupted by Anakin, forcefully grabbing hold of her through the force and pulling her closer. Quiet now, you won't be able to have a body in the living word, because I would need to create one for you. Anakin wanted to take her with him not because she was attractive, but because of the dyad. And while he didn't harbor any romantic feelings as of this moment, that didn't matter because something may happen in the future. The main reason is because he is unsure of whether or not he would be affected in some way, as this bond was formed while she is technically dead. How a dyad works is only because two individuals are alive. How would it work when he was still alive while she is dead? Let me go. Xana tried with all her might, but it was useless pointless because he was just much more powerful now. Then he was before, and he wasn't even gone for that long. Sorry, I have to ensure I will live. Anakin replies in a non-apologetic tone because he wises to live, and he can't just give that up for a stranger. Anakin summoned his new connection to this dimension that enabled him to step upwards, and off he went leaving behind the wastelands of hell, from its lava lakes to its icy tundras. He was gone, and so was Xana. Back within the waking word Anakin awoke. He had done it. He was successful in fighting against his mortal fate, and directly usurped control over his time of death. Not really time, but usurped the ability for time to reap his life. Now he could only die if someone has the capacity to do so. His connection to the Force grew as well. Not in the sense he had gained more midi chlorians, as that was only something that determined his raw potential power and pull within the Force. No, he had gathered up an energy field around himself that was the Force, and was starting to make something of it. A wound in the Force is not what he is. He did not directly correspond with the way Nihilus did things. But he was also not something that went along with the currents, he was something entirely new. Anakin quickly started to withdraw his presence, as even though he had defeated a lot of powerful figures within the dimension of hell, and absorbed a lot of energy as well, it didn't mean it would correlate well in the living world. He could feel it. A certain balance had been achieved within himself, the physical and spiritual had been dealt with, meaning he had created something very hard to achieve. Just because he was successful doesn't mean he doesn't need to put in any effort to keep himself balanced because he still does. Remember, without strife there is no change. Without change there is no improvement, and Anakin still believes he has a long way to go. Hey, what is going on here? A voice within his head spoke to him. This voice was actually the soul and consciousness of Xana. Be quiet, you should rest yourself. Anakin then mentally shut her down, where she would enter a temporary hibernation to rejuvenate the damage done to her soul and consciousness. She had been through the ravages of chaos, and had to still have an imprint of Bane living within her subconscious, before he took care of the problem. Sleep now. 
Anakin sent a telepathic message as she went further into his subconscious protected and healing before her re-emergence. Now thoroughly refreshed, withdrawn from the Force, he still didn't allow himself to be open within the bonds he has, not just yet. He still has one more thing to do. Looking around the world, his perception was increased by a milestone as just like Nihilus. He was able to sense people or even just those who have a connection to the Force on a now planetary scale. He still hasn't absorbed as much Force energy as Nihilus did, even though there was a lot within Hell. The difference was the location and the state of being. Nihilus was already like what he was when he was alive as he was dead. While Anakin wasn't even complete, not even at his full potential yet, and he still has a long way to go. And the only reason he overpowered Nihilus was because his pull within the Force was just that much more powerful. If Nihilus had the limiting value of 10 in the Force, then Anakin had a limiting factor of 100. That is the difference in being conceived by the Force itself, and then going through changes and rituals meant to enhance his actually living Force connection. The Night Sister's magic ritual was meant to influence the physical dark side of his being. The ritual on Island was meant to influence the physical light side of his being. Finally, his journey into Hell was meant to affirm his spiritual duality of the dark and light, with which he had done through the Immortus gland implant and midi chlorium manipulation. Population. Truly a daring concept because the Force itself took on some action itself due to him doing something it didn't like. Not that it could have stopped him. As soon as he was reborn into this universe, he had made it his goal to become more powerful, because as is this galaxy is a dangerous place. Going deep into hell only confirmed to him that he should probably become even stronger than he is now. I guess I need to consider what Force Shmai also told me about Godhood Anakin thought to himself. Or what she didn't tell me. Anakin was enlightened to the fact he could become even greater than he is now, and that there is a path beyond just achieving balance. He had the grand idea to create his own balance, when thinking back to his conception of the spiritual matrix, he didn't much about it at first. It would of course be pretty significant considering its capabilities, but it wouldn't have been the end all be all. Now he believes that the formation of such a dimension may play an important part of discovery to creating his own energy field. Imagine instead of the Force, you refer to the Anakin, okay? That sounds stupid, but the idea still stands. Anakin thought to himself, he could start to generate his own cosmic force, with which would be an extension of himself, and allow him to create an even deeper flow within his capabilities. He also has some wild theories that if he were to do this, his midi-chlorians may evolve as well. In fact, that's a great idea. It was a known fact that having more midi-chlorians in general, meant you have more pushing and pulling power within the Force, but it didn't mean it was all that. So essentially, midi-chlorians and the Force became a numbers game with which your abilities within the Force and your sensitivity was determined by this. But what if he could create a qualitative difference as well? An example of this idea would be the vague magic circuit's quantity and quality idea from the type moon verse. Midi-chlorine count per cell was the quantity, and then the type of midi-chlorine you had determined the quality. This means that even if you only had the average amount of midi-chlorines, you could still be Force-sensitive. If your midi-chlorians were of a higher quality level, Anakin could also take inspiration from the Eastern culture from his previous life, where one could cultivate mystical energy to transform oneself into an immortal being. Generally this would be done by forming a core to store your energy, and all of the other mystical stuff that comes along with it. Not that Anakin needed to gain eternal youth anymore, but it was an option to explore, one that if he did form a core of some kind, it would generate his own energy field, that completely belonged and was a part of him. Anyway, I think it is time to inject myself with the 24th chromosome serum. Anakin had been passed out on the medical bed within the hidden outpost he had set up on Anderwil just for this occasion. He didn't know how long he had been gone for, but he decided not to check and just get on with the next process, because there was no time like the present. Decisively he injected the serum right into himself restricting his nanosuit from interfering and breaking the syringe. In doing so he would go through an even more intense physical and mental pain. It came as no surprise to him that it did exactly just that. His body was morphing around the fact something else was not retroactively rewriting his genetic code and upgrading everything that was a part of the normal human systems. Then the extra chromosome started to touch the implants and increase the efficiency and effectiveness of everything from his two hearts to his three lungs ravaging right throughout his being it made him stronger and faster then he was before and in combination with everything else that had been done it was basically overkill at this point but anakin was not one for crying over spilled milk he wanted to be prepared for anything and this would essentially turn him fully biologically immortal similar to hydras a genus of the knadaria phylum from his previous word that he couldn't discover in his new universe all knadarians can regenerate allowing them to recover from injury hydras were simple freshwater animals possessing radial symmetry and contain postmetodic cells, cells that will never divide again, only in the extremities. All hydra cells continually divide. It has been suggested that hydras do not undergo senescence, and, as such, are biologically immortal. But his was unlike these because when a body part is to be cut off, it wouldn't create another him. It would just disintegrate after a period of time, because it wasn't connected to him anymore. Of course research on this microorganism was limited, and no one could truly tell if it was biologically immortal. But it was the closest thing he could equate himself to at this moment. Results from his nanosuit would read that his cellular and genetic makeup had officially changed and has become a part of him completely. He had not grown in height or anything, but instead everything within him increased its limits to the extreme. In fact he had gotten shorter as a result. He was no longer 2.15 meters tall, but instead he was 1.9 meters in height now. Without the force, if Anakin could crush skulls easily before, now he could easily bend metal, and probably even destroy metal, by forcefully condensing it within his hand, by applying enough pressure. He can apply the full force of his weight, plus the strength within his muscles to achieve something like this. 
If he was to measure his speed without the force, he could probably run about 100 kilometers per hour. But this was just his average speed. And if he pushed it to the limits, again without the force, he could probably reach speeds nearing 400 kilometers per hour. His stamina would probably enable him the ability to go at 100 kilometers per hour for about 5 days straight before he gets tired, which after a 20 minute rest, he would be one at 100%. At 400 kilometers per hour he could probably go on for a little over 24 hours. If he did a test of his actual physical strength levels, without the use of his constructed power armor and the aid of the force, he could probably on average lift about 11 tons, which is the equivalent of nearly 10,000 kilograms. An estimation of his carry capacity would be around 5,000 kilograms seconds, while his pushing force would probably be around 20,000 kilograms seconds. If really pushed his limits, he could probably double all of those estimations again without the force or power armor. This is a lot, Anakin would say he has unlimited power. But that is getting arrogant now. Arnie. A voice was heard from outside and then another. Arnie. And another Arnie is here. Three faces appear before him. And he shouldn't be surprised as he had foreseen that they would have at least tried to look for him. What were you doing? Isla first approached him before hugging him and begins to tear up. We thought you were in trouble. Barris also followed after and hugged Anakin. But Shark was still quite embarrassed by their strange ambiguous relationship. So she was the last to hug him. They all had some mental and emotional relief at knowing he was okay. This just made he feel a little bad. Not that he wouldn't do it again. But it still meant they had all taken some place within his heart. This is my fault. I should have told you guys I was doing something. Anakin said as the day came to an end. It was the year the year the CIS had formed, officially. The CIS is just an acronym for the Confederacy of Independent Systems, officially formed by Count Dooku and Raxus Prime. Shortly afterwards, thousands of planets leave the Republic and align themselves with the CIS, thus beginning the Separatist Crisis. Two assassination attempts happen on Palpatine's life, though they were averted by the Jedi. However, unfortunately, 21 senators were killed in this process. Another event had happened which led to Anakin seeing a now long-time one-sided rival leave the Jedi Order, Ferris Olin. The kid had such a clam and collected atmosphere, but there was some deep resentment within him, which led to this decision, where he would go on to live a relatively normal life. He was such an eager opponent. Anakin reminisced how Ferris had tried to prove to him he was greater. The original would have formed an actual rivalry between the two, while Anakin really had no need to do so, and just let the boy continue in his delusions of grandeur. He was pretty sure he had something to do with him leaving, but those are Ferris's feelings not his own to look after. While this was going on Palpatine had finally reached the end of his rope within the Senate as the Supreme Chancellor, but it would seem that he had some sway. No, it is more appropriate to say he had purposely set up this separatist crisis to further his own agenda, his own goals. Palpatine reached the end of his second term as Supreme Chancellor, but the passage of the Emergency Powers Act allowed him to stay in office until the Separatist crisis is dealt with. He was a sly and deceptive bastard, just imagine if the Jedi hadn't protected him against those assassination attempts, he might have had a chance to die, no matter how slim those chances were. Anakin wasn't just about ready to go up to and confront the last living Sith Lord, because like a hut, the problem was much deeper than the surface. Another would replace him, in response to the growing threat of the Sis. The Military Creation Act, a bill proposing the reformation of the Republic's armed forces, is brought to the Galactic Senate floor for the first time. Of course, this act was never brought into a vote, and the outcome was just as Palpatine had wanted. He would use his emergency powers to veto the decision, and gave a quick response to the supposed separatist crisis. At least for now, the vote while still having not happened delayed instead of immediately going to Palpatine's emergency power. Again, it would still happen, but how would any else know this? In fact this event was the very first problem that Padme had come across within the Senate where she had been against this military act. Of course this was because she was now a part of the Senate just as she had been originally. After serving two terms as Queen is appointed by her successor Jamelia to be Navi's Senator. Obviously she is a woman who promotes peace. But in these drastic times not taking into account the corruption of the Senate, they would have still lost due to the innate nature of living beings. That is right, more than just the nature of humans, but the nature of other alien species as well. Everyone was panicked by sudden emergence of another government, another republic of sorts outside of their power. Greed and selfishness would win out in the end, combining this with other factors throughout the galaxy which weren't exactly peaceful. This would have happened even without Palpatine's emergency powers. Of course, the crisis wouldn't have happened in the first place if Palpatine didn't help create it, or would it? Another fun fact about the CIS was about how Dooku delivered an address. That simply came to be known as the Raxus Address. It was quite motivational and leveraged the hate, anger and despair the people were feeling. The Raxus Address was a speech given by the former Jedi Count Dooku this very year. That was credited with essentially setting the stage for the Separatist movement. Dooku commandeered a whole at relay station in the Raxus system, and denounced the Galactic Republic as a futile enterprise. That was hopelessly burdened by corruption and favoritism toward the core worlds. Following the address, Dooku founded the Confederacy of Independent Systems, and the ensuing Separatist Crisis. One final event however before the end of this year was the beginning of the Vigilian Civil War. Not anything of too much importance. But with a keen eye for things like this, one could see the absolute chaos within the Senate. Hey kid. Anakin was cloaked and approached a child around the age of five. The child looked up to the figure of whom had approached him, he was actually quite curious but had been down in the slumps. A orphan with no home to call his own, no food to feed his stomach, and only with the skills of a common street rat to get by. You shouldn't do that. Anakin gestured to where the boy was going. Tell me your name. Strangely enough, the boy was compelled to do so, 
he didn't even feel like resisting. My name is Han. No last name. And I can ask him still disguised. No. According to the two versions of both alternates, there are two versions of Han. One where he was five years of age at this point of time, and the other is he is three. Going by his looks and getting a sample stealthily Anakin tested the kid. Results. Midi chlorine count per cell, 5000. Biological age, 5. His nanosuit gave him some results through his interface, as he had moved so fast, and gathered a small skin sample without him even knowing. There were only two things he was interested in, his force sensitivity and his age. The boy was an orphan at this point, whether it be from the canon or legends timeline, and within each he had joined the White Worms as a scumrat. Anakin had other plans for the boy, after all this kid could be his future son-in-law, so it's better to keep him under his control if that was what would happen. Of course, his main reason isn't because he is worried about a future daughter that hadn't even been born yet, and may not even be the same, but that is besides the point. Han had an extremely potent destiny and fate, so to speak. You could say this is evidenced by his false sensitivity. He does have above average reflexes for a human, and an even greater insight, but nothing to grant him supernatural powers. He decided that he might as well bring in this kid as his own, because why not? He could become a problem for him in the future, or he could become a great ally, because he is well aware of Han's talents. His piloting abilities may even match his, okay? Maybe not match his, but a close second, okay? Maybe not a close second, but it is definitely good. Anakin doubted at this point anyone could be as good as him, but only time would tell just how far the boy would go. At this point, he is unable to raise the boy himself, because he is still connected to the Order. But that doesn't mean he would be unable to bring him to a proper family to raise him. Or I could get my mother to help me raise the boy, saying something along the lines that I had somehow had a child with some random woman Anakin thought to himself before also thinking, okay, that may be a bad idea. Why do you care? Han had grown a distinct lack of those above him, those in authority, due to not receiving any actual help from people around him. No help came from those in higher positions of power, and he knew this from a young age. His father had died after all, and those memories are still fresh, given it had only been about a year since his death. At least this was what he told himself. In fact, what had actually happened was that Han's father had abandoned him, but Han would never admit to it. That was just who he was, and there was no way he would talk to anyone about his personal stuff. He wouldn't even talk about his past in an alternate timeline with his wife. That was how hurt the man or boy in this case was. Anakin, deciding that being crass with the boy wouldn't help him persuade the boy said calmly, I am here to take you with me. Huh? Are you some kind of slaver? Here to sell me off are you? Han was incredibly suspicious of everyone. Or are you a part of the police here? A bounty hunter to come and collect an award on a common street rat? Who has been stealing to survive? It would seem he has a lot of pent up emotions Anakin thought to himself. Han, I will not lie to you. But that doesn't mean I'm going to tell you everything. I will bring you back to my home planet, and you can either be raised as my son, or you can also come back to my planet and be raised within a loving family. Anakin tried to phrase it as easy as he could see a child to understand what he was saying. Really. Again, Han was strangely accepting of what he said even though he was a highly untrusting individual. Yes, I am only here to give you these two options. Of course you could pick your third option. The one you were originally going to go with. While Han had trust issues, it would seem that Anakin had a way with children. This was not what the original had. In fact, he had committed quite the vicious acts against children. Well, do you wish to live a life out on the streets? Or do you want a roof over your head, food to quell your stomach and drink to satiate your thirst? Anakin continued because he didn't want to waste any more of his time here. Even though he is immortal now, that doesn't mean he couldn't put his time into other things. Han was hesitant to answer, but knew deep within that even if he joined the White Worms, it would not be an easy lifestyle, and it may not necessarily bring him the things he would need or want. In fact, it would be dangerous. Who exactly are you anyway? Han asked Anakin. Smiling beneath his hood, Anakin replied, Just your friendly neighborhood prince. Prince. Han was confused as he thought. Why would a prince be here? I am here for my own reasons that cannot be exposed to you. But in the future you will come to understand the significance of who I am. So do you accept? Which of these options are you going to take? Anakin continued. I dash hand started boo stopped. Leaning forward Anakin coaxed him. Yes. I dash hand was still undetermined. Get on with it lad. Don't keep me here all day. Anakin said to get the boy to hurry up because even though children should be given choices, that doesn't mean restrictions still shouldn't be applied. I choose the first option. Han blurted out forgetting that there was two options from Anakin, and he believed he chose the second option of getting into another family. Unfortunately, Anakin, even if he knows this, decided to just mess around with the boy. He couldn't or wouldn't actually make the boy become a part of his family, because the Jedi may scold him. Not that he cared all too much, but because it wouldn't do him any good. Especially if he revealed he has a child out of nowhere, especially so that it wouldn't make much sense. Where could he possibly find enough time, exactly three years ago while he was basically quarantined to the Jedi Temple to impregnate a woman on another world? You surprise me, how bold of you to want to become my son? Anakin said before continuing, Come now, we best be off. You won't be needing anything you currently have, you will outfit it in stuff that is better than this. Anakin started to walk off as Han followed behind him. Wait, I didn't mean I want to become your son. Don't worry kid, you're too old to be my child anyway. Anakin replied, And your words quite harm me. Would I not make a good father? No, that wasn't what I meant. It was just that Han stammered, confused about Anakin's act because he did it quite well. I am just joking with you. You have no need to worry. It is just that the temperature on the planet I am taking you to may be a bit hot. 
But then again the biodome should regulate that. Anakin stated out loud not really talking to Han. After a while of walking, they come across the spaceport of the planet and Anakin boards his invisible ship, which completely amazes Han. Whoa, cool right? Come on, we need to get going. Anakin said as he revealed a path for Han to follow. Can I have a ship like this? Han had stars in his eyes. Don't worry. If you want a ship, I am sure you can work towards having your own in the future. It just might not be like mine, but I am sure it would be great. Anakin replied. What? Aren't you some kind of prince though? Han asked back a little disappointed. I may have money. But that doesn't mean I am just going to give you something for free. Everything had a price, well nearly everything. Anakin said trying to make sure Han knew some basic knowledge about the world. I already know that. Han replied. I am sure you do. Anakin left off as they were both on board, and Anakin mentally told Jabitha to take them back to Tatooine. Anakin then went on to give Anakin a home, not with his mother or anything like that, but under a household that just so happened to have the last name of Solo, and were in fact a semi-wealthy family on Tatooine. They even had someone from their family within the officials that was a part of his mother's council. Han Solo, I will be sure to make you a great addition to my future army. Anakin thought to himself about his plans of having Han join as an agent, not some commander as that was not where his talents were. Han was always meant to be a pilot, and not just any pilot but a smuggler, a thief capable of getting himself into and out of sticky situations. If guided in the right direction Anakin would have a very strong agent within his retinue in the future. He may even open up a division of secret agents himself. For now most of the military affairs were taken care of by Grievous, because he had become quite skilled in doing so. Another thing about Grievous was about Anakin's training of him. He had upgraded his systems to become even better and trained him in lightsaber combat. Of course most of Grievous' lightsabers couldn't just be gotten from anywhere. Anakin had secretly procured some extra crystals from Ilum. He was now verifiably as close to the original Grievous without being the same. On Tatooine, Sue you're telling me that the three of you have met my mother. Anakin said to the three girls as they had all stayed on Tatooine after Anakin had finished up with his own progress. He had just come back from dropping of hand to his new family family, and was now here to confront the three about meeting his mother. Shark was the least nervous, while Barris and Isla seemed to be just as nervous as each other, deciding to test just what their real feelings were. Anakin connected to Barris and Isla to confirm they were actually nervous and they were. Anakin knows that Shark is probably the worst when being forthcoming with her feelings, so he connected to her bond with him as well, and he was able to tell she was actually just as nervous as the other two. Well, don't get us wrong here Arnie, we were worried, Barris said, raising an eyebrow, he replied, worried, eh, I get that, but bringing this information to my mother, it's your fault, Isla blurted out before going silent, I guess it is that's enough of that, what exactly did you guys talk to my mother about anyway, Anakin asked, then the three went on to explain that they had not really gone into why they were trying to find him to his mother, and only said it was a part of Jedi business, but of course she saw right through them, Anakin knew this because when he went to see Shmai again, she was interested in knowing about the three pretty girls, that had come to her looking for him. Now not only is a force playing matchmaker, it would seem his actual mother was as well. Not that he didn't like being paired up with females he finds attractive, and have grown a close attachment to. No, it was just that when it came to matters of the heart he liked discovering these things for himself. Outside influence is not all that appreciated most of the time. You girls have gotten my mother thinking about the future already. He sighs before saying, Come on, I think we should all just return back to Coruscant. I have heard that a lot of things are happening. The three just agree with him, and don't say anything because now they have been exposed to his mother, it basically made it all the more complicated. Boarding Jabitha, before then left Tatooine to go back to the Jedi. But now the three girls have been exposed to another side of Anakin. His embarrassment over introducing them to his mother was quite cute to view, even when he was physically imposing. Barris, Isla and Shark would catalogue this within their memories for a later date. There was something else however that they were all curious about but didn't ask him, another connection of sorts. While the three knew of what the Force diet is, they were only connected to him while he was connected to all of them, and through this they could feel things. Feel things that they would not feel without Anakin being the intermediary between everyone, and while they were directly connected to him, they were also indirectly connected to each other. They could accurately identify those who are linked to Anakin. It was easy to tell when they delved into it, and they could all feel a new one. None of them brought it up however because it was strange. This fourth link came from within Anakin, and they distinctly feel it was different from theirs. Well at least different in the alignment to the Force. It was connected to someone steep within the dark side of the Force, but they didn't question him. They would inevitably come to someone wanting to know, but for now they would wait until he says anything. There was the tiny little problem of Xana living within his mind, and Anakin didn't have an immediate solution. There was the Kaminans and how he could commission them to create a body where he would transplant her consciousness into but they don't have the correct facilities for what he wanted. He wanted to make sure she is returned to her actual body, fully complete, and is completely the same as the one she was born in. The thing is, he has no idea about what her genetic code or structure was, so there was no way to tell if he could recreate it. There are no samples of some a thousand years old cells from her, and it certainly would have been decayed and destroyed by now. He could grab multiple various samples of women that are around her features, and compare these various genetics, 
then pieced together a combination of cells to replicate a body for her. He could use what he remembered of her physical features to much easier create her body, and it wasn't like there wasn't an abundance of genetic variation he could use. Another problem he had to consider was whether or not she would be accepted into her new body, whether or not the new body's midichlorians wouldn't reject her, and she would be able to merge completely with them. Given that she isn't supposed to be alive however it may not work, but taking into consideration her connection to him, of which he is both alive, connected to her through a dyad and is practically immortal, there should be a chance of her returning to life. Even more so because he could actually control midichlorians to some extent, and he had the techniques that can transfer one's essence into another. Yet another problem was the growth period. How fast would her body develop if he tried? This was something the Kaminans and himself wanted to get rid of, as it would start to affect her life expectancy. Not that it would matter all too much because he planned to try and give those connected to him through a diet immortality and eternal youth. He had to do something though. So knowing of the Kaminans' methods and his control midichlorian manipulation, he started the process of creating a new body for her. He selected all of the right genetic factors that would be taken into account when generating a new body. Genetic code for melanin levels and hair color, from chromosome types making the new body female, and the modification of other factors, from natural height and even genetics of human women considered beautiful. Her soul should be able to do the rest as he transfers her consciousness into it. Anakin created her body in vitro just like he had done for his sky seed implants, because this was the best way instead of the natural process. Where would he find a willing participant for something like this? He could accelerate her growth, and as the body developed he did. Her soul was starting to slowly manipulate how her new form shaped, becoming more and more alike herself from before. Through midichlorian manipulation, Anakin is able to stop her rapid physical development. That took only a few months to come into full form, and of course, he made sure that the Force didn't try and interfere with the process. Plagueis and Sidious had tried manipulating the Force similar to how he was doing so, and it reacted negatively by inadvertently creating him. After a few months, she was complete, and her physical aging slowed to a halt because of him intervening and making sure that with a new body, would not immediately age up too quickly. In fact, by doing this, Anakin has basically given Xana eternal youth for free. He has a feeling she may not appreciate this process as much as she should. Finally, within the tube, she kind of reminded him of a scene from the Resident Evil movies, where Alive was all hooked up naked and floating within a large tube. This was near exactly like that, but the circumstances were different. Gasping as she exited the tube she was in and trying to catch her breath before looking around, seeing that it was only Anakin within this specialized room. What the hell did you do to me? Xana questioned him as Anakin had manipulated the situation a bit. I have given you life. Anakin said and then started to cackle like a mad scientist. She just gives him a pointed stare before getting up. But while her body was brand new and developed, that didn't mean she actually had proper muscle control. She actually had barely any muscle at all, because she had no time to develop this body properly. She would need to retrain herself physically and mentally to fully get used to her new situation. Something to take note of however was the lack of the corruption within the dark side present within her eyes. They were blue. It would seem that my experiment was a success and that you are the first to receive my blessing of immortality, Anakin said. What do you mean? Xana tried her best to cover herself up, but Anakin had seen it all already, because he needed to keep an eye on the development process. In fact, he now held very intimate knowledge of her new form, because he was the creator of course. I mean what I mean, you have immortal. I had to somehow stop the rather quick development of your body, so as to make sure you didn't age so quickly you would die within the next year or two. Anakin replied, You have forcefully brought me from chaos and decided to give me life again. Just what are you? Xana questioned him. Just your everyday friendly neighborhood space Jesus. Anakin said with a smile and pose. What the hell is a space Jesus? She questioned him. I am not surprised you are not cultured enough to know, but welcome. Welcome to being alive again. He replied before continuing. I think we should get you dressed. You will be exited about the prospects of your new life. She just glared at Anakin. I will never be under your command. Who said you were going to be under me? Anakin replied turning around and starting to walk out of the room, gesturing her to follow him. I also suggest you don't try and pull on the dark side. It has quite the corrupting effects. You can't tell me what to do. She simply stated but nonetheless followed after him, because she didn't want to stay on the cold hard ground while naked. They continued through the hallways before coming to an area where Anakin had some people already recreate the clothing he had seen her with while in the hell dimension. You really pay attention don't you? Xana was a bit weirded out that he was so accurate. It is easy to remember and even reverse calculate everything when you have perfect memory, recall and even accelerated intelligence. Anakin stated as she got changed. What exactly are you going to have me do exactly? Xana was still weak, so she had to play her cards right. Her connection to the Force was acting all weird, and she felt a strange sensation within herself connecting to Anakin. She was also physically still needed practice. She had no muscle to help her even more, so this is harder because of the Force being weird. Anakin had practically defied the known laws created by the Force, but if the Force didn't want him to take her from hell, it shouldn't have connected her to him. Nothing really, but because of extenuating circumstance, it would seem you are stuck with me. Well, maybe not completely stuck to me, but connected in a very intimate way. He stated while smirking. What are you implying? She asked. Have you not felt the special bond between the two of us? He questioned. I she left off before deciding not to lie she said. Yes. Then that should be all the reason you need to know that there is something strange going on. Anakin said. Yeah. 
You're that something strange. Xana snapped back still confused. For now you will stay here on Tatooine. Or you could go off and do your own thing. I am not restricting your freedom or anything. I just wanted to let you know that. Anakin ignored her outburst. So I can just leave. Xana questioned having a small thought in the back of her mind telling her to stay with him. I would advise against that and would advise you to get back to your feet. But if you are planning on leaving... I have to inform you that this connection we have with each other now is quite special. Anakin repeated. You told me that already, Xana stated. Yes, but I haven't said what the effects were, now did I? Anakin replied. Then then went on to explain how the Force died worked, its supposed origins, and how the idea originated from the Sith, and was probably the reason behind the idea that the Rule of Two even existed in the first place. It wasn't just an idea that came out of nowhere, and it was entirely possible that Darth Bane, her master, didn't inform her of this because either he didn't want to or that even he didn't know the reason why he wanted to do so. Of course they had their own reasons, but the core of the matter was that the concept of the rule of two existed even before the Sith, and had been within the annals of history, just left there to be explored, but was never given any thought. Not until recently, there was Anakin, where his very existence broke what was previously known about false diets, and the fact that it was usually only between two people was what confused Xana. Anakin informed her that he believes there are two versions, one between soulmates so to speak, while the other is the version from the Sith. Purely a means to make sure they become more powerful with each successive generation, by killing their master, which would transfer their power onto their successor. So we are soulmates I think that is a load of bullshit. Xana said convinced all he was saying was bullcrap even if there was some semblance of truth if she thought about it. It made sense that the Sith would mistake a bond between two people, meant to be precious as something to use to their advantage. Well you may believe what you want, but you and I became connected ever since I had touched you back within hell. Anakin replied knowing she would be in disbelief. Whatever, I will agree to your suggestion of staying here for a while. I need to get my weapon back on my face anyway, and need to retrain myself. Xana said more to herself than Anakin. That is great. Anakin can smile before continuing. I will give you something to ponder on. I am going to create an order of my own, and I would need someone as experienced as yourself to help teach my students. I don't really have time to personally teach. You're giving me a job already. What happened to yous being soulmates? Xana said sarcastically. You're not just going to live on my planet, my empire for free now, do you? I am giving you a lot of freedom here. You shouldn't try to ask for more. Anakin said. You're the one who brought me here. Xana responded. I wanted to live. Anakin replied. Xana felt something within the force, and within the back of her mind tell her something she couldn't quite make out. But she heard the distinct thumping of a heart. No, she heard the strange beating of drums that resembled hearts. What she heard was the distinct drum of Anakin's heartbeats. Another year had passed and it was quite boring. But Anakin had officially become 18 years of age. Well, not like that mattered all too much because he had already reached his peak physical age a long time ago. His abilities and powers had come to a still. And it looks like it would take even more time for him to build himself up. If he was to continue and drain the force out of people or object with force energy. It could lead to him gaining too much power too fast. It is sometimes better to slow oneself down and take your time. Within his secret order, he had a few members, and the current person he had placed in charge was Xana as she had nothing else better to do. While he didn't want her corrupting those already within, that didn't mean he was going to keep them from the dark side. Renala, Lorana and Allison all were learning from her, of course he gave Xana a revised version of her code. He gave his own that they would all come to know of and accept within his order, and they were developing quite nicely. Even Xana herself was improving within the force, because once you have hit rock bottom, the only thing left for you to go is up. Fortunately even after a year, she had not left and seemed quite reluctant to leave as well. If only he could know why of course he knows why. It's because she has started to develop proper feelings for him, and she hasn't been fully corrupted by the dark side. But there was a problem though. Even though she was developing these feelings she was becoming possessive and in fact, had started to be somewhat cruel to Renala, who was also similar to her. Renala and Xana were quite similar in nature, especially when it came to how the dark side influenced their emotions. Not that they weren't in control, but because they saw each other as enemies. Romantic rivals if you will, even though Xana technically held the upper hand above her, because of the dive with him. Thankfully it didn't seem to interfere much, if at all with the learning process, and she had adhered to what he wanted. Whatever they do with their personal time is none of his business, maybe a little but still. If Anakin wanted wanted to get any stronger, he would have to start feeding on those with very strong connection to the Force. Whether this people, objects, planets or an environment. In fact he was considering absorbing the virgins underneath the Coruscant Jedi Temple as this would give the Jedi a heads up. But it would go against what the Force wanted. Anakin had already set up plans to slowly siphon those within the temple to become a part of his own order, so it would be best to go with this plan. Trying to change it up so late in the game could make something go wrong. His carefully placed pawns could be found and destroyed. It wasn't only the Sith, meaning Palpatine that he was cautious of, it was also the Jedi. What would their reaction be to him leaving and creating an order of his own? Would they deem him just as dangerous as the Sith and try to take him down? He doubts it. But it certainly wouldn't be a favorable relationship. On Coruscant, underneath the Jedi Temple. It had taken a year. But it was well worth it. Anakin believed it was time to show Shuck some more of his secrets. And reveal to her some more things. And he had also decided to bring Ahsoka in on what everyone else knew. It would be unfair to the girl given by how much she is attached to him. And may even feel like a betrayal. Because he didn't trust her with this. 
Anakin knew of Ahsoka's circumstances, and why exactly she had come to like him so quickly, and he wasn't worried about her revealing anything thinking she had enough maturity and control over herself and her mind. Now that he had the four closest people within the Jedi exposed to some of his secrets, he had decided to try and start convincing them of what he was planning, what he wanted to do and his future plans giving them the opportunity to not participate in anything he was going to do. It was incredibly unlikely that they would reject what he wanted. Even Ahsoka who wasn't even connected to him through a dyad, would leave the Jedi in a heartbeat to stay with him, but not only with the other girls as well. They had become sort of a family of sorts. Of course a very weird family of sorts but a family nonetheless. Having brought everyone down to his base underneath the Jedi Temple, Anakin started to talk about things. He was going to leave out some details and edit the truth of the matter somewhat, but he decided that it would be better if they knew about what he was doing. Their mental defenses have grown because of his instruction not taking into account their connection to him making himself and them stronger, and with every person connected to him he gets stronger, which creates a chain reaction with the others as well. The diet even though had some severe consequences if someone within the bond were to die, and a lot of benefits that in general outweighed those disadvantages. Anakin talked about how he was going to leave the order in the future to the modification done to his body, and he even went on to explain that he had gained immortality. This was the reason he had gone off the grid so to speak, and why they couldn't feel him because of this process. They all got mad even Ahsoka who was just brought into the fold, because who would want their loved one to go through a process that could kill them. Even more so they didn't want to lose him now, especially Isla who was the only one to have officially started a secret relationship with him. Of course those within the group had finally figured out that they were together, and some jealously was of course present, but what could they do when it is meant to be this way? Or at least it was decided to be this way according to the will of the Force. Not that they didn't all feel some type of way about Anakin, excluding Ahsoka who was still a child 13, but still too young for stuff like that. This prompted Barris and Shark to start going out with him more and more, because they too wanted to advance their relationship with him even if they were too shy about it. Anakin had some struggle trying to juggle being a Jedi, hiding his developing relationships with the girls from most of everyone, and further building up his empire. That was another thing to talk about, the progress and his role within the Emperor. Soon Anakin would leave the Order, and in fact he was planning to do so, and try and convince both Qui-Gon and Mace to follow him. They would probably both not accept. He even wanted to try and get Obi-Wan to follow him as well. But Obi-Wan is worse than Qui-Gon when it came to traditions, so that would probably be a no-go, if even Qui-Gon wouldn't accept. What Anakin was interested in though was his eventually meet up with Padme. He had not seen her, and she had not seen him, but he has a sneaking suspicion she has been keeping tabs on him. It wouldn't surprise him, but it would certainly be a little weird. Maybe it was the way of the Force trying to get them to pair up together again, like the original. The thing is Anakin doesn't plan to stay with the Jedi, and in fact, would be in an even better position to get closer to her after the fact. The Emperor while has grown to be in control of two star systems, it wasn't enough for Anakin. On Tatooine the population had increased, but so had it increased on Anduil, meaning that he may sooner or later want to start looking to expansion. The will of the people is a powerful thing, and it would seem their loyalty to the Empire was incredibly strong. This only meant Anakin had been able to keep up with the demand and supply of the economy, the political situation where those who would seek some sort of reforms were also not present. His military and intelligence departments had grown as well. While droids made up a good part of his standing armies, that didn't mean they were the best even when he tried to make them the best. Anduil handling his food and water resources was going good. Tatooine handling his technology and energy production is going good as well. And when thinking about everything he would need more materials. The metals industry was lacking, and while there was a lot of deposits on Tatooine, they wouldn't be enough to keep up with the expansion. The health industry would be booming soon, because Anakin had successful come up with a version of the bioengineered 24th chromosome, and had been experimenting with creating other version for other species. Of course this 24th chromosome was only to be used on humans and near humans, because it's specifically for them. But other species that have a different genetic makeup and chromosome count would need modification. The point of this serum was meant to make the best of your parts. Anakin had seen this with himself because even though he would be unique in the fact that there would be no one else with the same genetic structure and modifications, because that was just how it would be, it didn't mean others would be unable to benefit somewhat. His citizens would become smarter, stronger, faster, and whatever else was important to their quality of life. They would not get sick as often, if at all, meaning that within the health industry, all you would need to take is this serum. Anakin knew that people would want to try and discover the secrets behind this. That is why he would be using Sith alchemy, to make sure people are unable to figure out the process. It may have been dangerous to do so if he wasn't knowledgeable, but he wasn't he had a thorough and in-depth power within the Force, allowing him a wide degree of error. There wouldn't be any error however because there was none. What was interesting however was where he would strike next. Being right next to Geonosis, Tatrine was in a prime position to attack, but obviously his mother and himself will reject any requests sent by the Republic or the Jedi. Looking back on his options to expand the amount of space he can gain control over, there was something new that had popped up. Kemal Station. Kemal Station served as an informal borderline between the Regency worlds, which were primarily connected economically to commerce along the Corellian run hyperlane, and the worlds that were located spinward along the Treeless Trade route, and whose economies were dominated by members of the Hut species. As a result, Kemal Station serviced both legitimate merchants and smugglers. During the Galactic Civil War, the wealthy entrepreneur Mason Kaysen owned several properties on the moon. Now 
now Anakin would be the one to own this moon, because how could he not take advantage of such a lucrative trade route? He was already starting to build up his own space within the galaxy, and start his expansion even further out from his starting point of Tatooine. Owning hyperspace lanes is great. Anakin thought to himself about the value of these small trade routes, because they helped to increase the value of his empire's currency system. It had been going incredibly well which helped to further elevate the people's financial situation. Unfortunately Geonosis does get in his way to other areas where he would have to go the long way around to conquer. Anakin decided that he would just take control over the star systems still connected to the trade routes leading into Tatrine. This way he would have good buffer between his current capital and the other worlds in case of people coming to knock on his door. Geonosis would have to stay off limits for now though. Even more annoying however was that Geonosis had taken into their coalition star systems. He may have wanted to slowly work his way towards himself. He would take Kemal Station to increase his ability to trade Uotimu for its special ability to plant and grow special trees, which would help contribute to his developing construction-based economy. The star system of Utarun would become his secondary agriculture-based world, and would help him produce and mass more food. This would then help him save and increase capital and value. It would also create more jobs for the people as well, meaning more production and development as well. As long as Anakin plays his cards right, he would be able to continue this stability. The Abana system was just an asteroid belt, and had no proper uses to him other than becoming an outpost with which he could station and train up his secret intelligence. Deploying and creating many bases around this asteroid belt while storing some ships here would be great. He could create a military-based academy here in the future, but for now his intelligence could station on and around the asteroid belt. Going past the asteroid belt however is open space before coming across a star system. That would allow Anakin to open up even more of the hyperspace lanes to his control. Because it wouldn't take long to take over Abana, and considering there was nothing of great importance there, Anakin could skip over to the next star system. Vordio? Vordio was a terrestrial planet located in the Vordio system, a part of the Arcanist sector in the slice portion of the Outer Rim territories. Vordio was located on the old Corellian run hyperlane, and on the tip of the Crane and Excarga route. This would connect his Emperor into other trade routes, allowing even better control of the space surrounding Tatooine, the current seat of his power. Overall, it is a good decision to just gobble all of this up because there is enough resources and military might to hold on to these places. There is unrest in the Galactic Senate. Several thousand solar systems have declared their intentions to leave the Republic. This separatist movement under the leadership of the mysterious Count Dooku has made it difficult for the limited number of Jedi Knights to maintain peace and order in the galaxy. Senator Amidala the former Queen of Naboo is returning to the Galactic Senate to vote on the critical issue of creating an army of the Republic to assist the overwhelmed Jedi. There is unrest in the Galactic Senate. Several thousand solar systems have declared their intentions to leave the Republic. This separatist movement under the leadership of the mysterious Count Dooku has made it difficult for the limited number of Jedi Knights to maintain peace and order in the galaxy. Senator Amidala the former Queen of Naboo is returning to the Galactic Senate to vote on the critical issue of creating an army of the Republic to assist the overwhelmed Jedi. The year Anakin had turned 18 was a boring one, but now the plot was starting to pick up again, and this would be the beginning of the Clone Wars. This year he was officially 19 years of age, not that it makes any difference, but it does set the stage for a long but short series of events to come. Barris had finally been promoted to a Jedi Knight, and now Anakin was free from his responsibilities as a teacher, well not really because Barris still hung out with him most if not all the time. His time would come as he has spoken with the Council, and convinced him that if there was any mission concerning the former Queen of Naboo, he would be tasked to do so. Of course they were not suspicious at all. At least he didn't sense their suspicion, and they might have hidden it well. But that doesn't matter anyway. My time has come. He thought to himself as he was within a meditative state reaffirming himself within the Force. It took a lot of effort to make sure he was still in balance. It wasn't something he could just achieve and then leave at the back of his mind. Patience was a key factor, but just because he needed patience, that doesn't mean he was going to be patient all the time. Sometimes you just had to rely on your instincts instead of thinking things over. He does a lot of thinking anyway when it comes to the safety of himself, his mother, his people and his girls. Within a ship above Coruscant, its silver shine was especially prominent. It was guarded by several other smaller ships, ensuring its safe arrival as it goes in for a landing. Senator, we are making a final approach onto Coruscant. Within the ship a guardsman had approached a woman and said this as she too was also guarded by others behind her. Very good lieutenant. The woman says as the lieutenant nods back with his own aide a little behind and beside him. The lieutenant and the other turns around as the woman follows after them with some other cloaked figures surrounding her. The ship was coming down during the day cycle of Coruscant as it didn't need to dock while during the night. Still guarded by other ships. It hovers above the large and tall buildings as high or even higher than the clouds. The ship was slowly moving in to dock itself and started to bring out its landing gear. It lands and so does the smaller ships as well. There was a new guardsman who had an eye patch covering his left eye alongside someone else. And the enigmatic astromech droid, R2-D2. We made it. The unidentified eye patch person says to the other pilot, as someone was coming off of the greater silver ship. I guess I was wrong. There was no danger at all. As there were people coming off of the ship, it explodes in a blaze of fire, and the two people that safely landed rushed over to the woman wearing an ornate white dress. Surprisingly enough, the other pilot that was next to the eye patch pilot was actually Padme. Padme seemed panicked as she took off her helmet and got on her knees to better see the lady in the ornate dress. Cord. Melody, I'm so sorry. 
The woman now identified as Cord said, I failed you, Senator. Padme distraught replies, No, the woman dies in her arms. The eye patched man comes from behind Padme and says, Melody, you are still in danger here. Padme slowly and reluctantly gets up as she stares at the woman. I shouldn't have come back. She says, This vote is very important. You did your duty. Cord did hers. Now, come. The man says as Padme is still in shock over what had just happened. Padme stands frozen as she tries to grapple with the situation. Senator Amidala, please. The man says with urgency. They start to leave the area, and as they do another smaller explosion goes off as an after effect of the first. Both of them hurriedly leave the area with the Astromech R2 following closely behind them. After this event we meet back up with the Jedi who are actually within a meeting with the Supreme Chancellor. Only some of the Jedi Masters of the Council and a few others were present chief among these people were Yoda, Mace, Mundi and Plo Koon. I don't know how much longer I can hold off the vote my friends. Palpatine said to the Jedi, more and more star systems are joining the Separatists. If they do break away, Mace said before Palpatine interrupted him, I will not let this Republic that has stood for a thousand years be split in two. Palpatine said with certainty, my negotiations will not fail. So blinded with a Jedi they could not see their enemy right in front of them, not even after all the effort Anakin had put into trying to change their way of thinking. Mace says, if they do, you must realize there aren't enough Jedis to protect the Republic. We're keepers of the peace, not soldiers. Master Yoda, do you think it would really come to war? Inside Palpatine was chuckling with glee, but on the outside he was calm, composed, and had a slight look of sadness on his face as he asked this. The dark side clouds everything, impossible to see the future is. Yoda said not really giving an answer, because he heavily relied on the Force to tell him everything. This would be a part of their downfall. Their over-reliance on the Force was quite pitiful, and Anakin had made sure to at least teach those he could of the importance of critical thinking. Also the importance of seeing a situation as a whole to fully determine what may happen. The Loyalist Committee has arrived, Your Honor. A hologram came through as they were talking, and the alien spoke in his native tongue. But everyone here could fully understand him. Good. Palpatine replies to the hologram. Send them in. He gets up from his seat as he wishes to talk with this delegation. We will discuss this matter more later. He said to the Jedi as they all got up to leave. Yoda seeing Padme says, Senator Amidala, your tragedy on the landing platform, terrible. Seeing you alive brings warm feelings to my heart. Padme unfazed by Yoda questions him. Do you have any idea who was behind this attack? She would be lying if she said she wasn't angry. But she kept herself in check because lashing out on others for no reason. But your own feelings is childish. Our intelligence points to disgruntled spice miners on the moon of Naboo. Mace says as he walks over. I think that Count Dooku was behind it. Padme had been having her suspicions about Dooku for a while now. He is a political idealist, not a murderer. Mundi had to add in defense of Dooku. You know Melody. That Count Dooku was once a Jedi. He couldn't assassinate anyone. It's not in his character. Mace replied as well in defense of Dooku's character. But, for certain Senator, in grave danger you are. Yoda says to Padme in a ominous tone. Master Jedi, may I suggest this Senator be placed under the protection of your graces. Palpatine adds having heard the entire conversation, scheming to add in his own twist to what is to happen. Do you really think that's a wise decision under these stressful times? A man behind Padme said before Padme continued herself. Chancellor, if I may comment, I do not believe Dash Padme continues but is interrupted as Palpatine says the exact same thing as her at the exact same time. The situation, is it that serious? Palpatine then continues looking very convincing. No, but I do, Senator. I realize all too well that additional security might be disruptive for you, but perhaps someone you're familiar with. An old friend like Master Skywalker. Palpatine continued with a smile on his face. That's possible, he isn't currently on any missions right now, and wouldn't be on in the near future, at least from what I've seen. Mace said, agreeing with Palpatine's suggestion. Do it for me, Melody, please. Palpatine says with a sad look on his face. While Yoda was suspicious of why exactly Palpatine would suggest such a thing as Skywalker had at one point been near forcefully betrothed and married off to the Senator. Of course, Palpatine would say he had nothing to do with it, but he surely did. The thought of losing you is unbearable. He finishes as the room seemingly in agreement doesn't dispute what the Chancellor said. Don't worry, I will have my former apprentice report to you immediately, Melody. Mace says. Padme replies actually quite relived and a little excited at the prospect of meeting Anakin again. Thank you Master Windu. Of course she has trained her poker face over the years, so this is not outwardly shown, but those who are force sensitive can sense this subtle change. They may not be able to know what this change was, but it was still felt. Anakin had been tasked as Padme's protector. Originally it would have been both himself and Obi-Wan here to work on this together, but because of various events happening throughout what would now be considered history, it was just himself. He didn't have a Padawan learner of his own at this point, because Barris had graduated from under him. If one would take a thorough look at him his looks would be deemed very handsome, very charming or a whole host of other things. He never needed stuff like plastic surgery or anything to modify the attractiveness of his face. The original looked good, and he looked even better. It helps that he has completed his power armor, and instead of a bulky design getting in his way, it was merged into his nano suit, and now doesn't look like some fancy high-tech armor. Nowadays he has it on all the time, simply because he doesn't need to hide it anymore, and it simply looks too good to not leave on as it accentuates his looks. 
Arriving at his destination, the elevator stops, and as the doors open, he is greeted to the side of Jar Jar. Hello, Jar Jar. Anakin greeted the Gungan politely. Who are you? It would seem that Jar Jar didn't recognize him, but that both made and did not make sense. Jar Jar should have seen how famous he is by now. He hasn't exactly become a household name. But at least within the Senate, he should be a subject of interest. It is me Jar Jar, Anakin. Anakin Skywalker, I am here to guard the Senator Anakin. Anakin Jar Jar now seems to have picked up that he was the one and the same. Yalsa looks so different. Yalsa have darker hair and purple eyes. But I see the resemblance. Yalsa are bigger. Then Messer now, so big. Glad to know you recognize me, Anakin says as he exits the elevator dodging Jar Jar's hug. Please no, I don't accept your hug, Senator Padme. Jar Jar called out as Anakin followed behind the Gungan. Mesa Palace here, looky, looky, Senator. D's a Jedi Revan. Padme walks over with her small entourage. Arnie, you have grown quite tall. Padme had been keeping a close eye on Anakin for the last few years but she was unaware of just how tall he had gotten. Standing at 1.9 meters, she was only tall enough to reach his chest and hear his heartbeat. Not that she would do that of course, she was just making a judgment within her mind. Anakin knew that the original at this part was actually quite smooth. At least he delivered the complimentary lines quite well, only to stuff it up later. You have grown as well, grown more beautiful, I mean. His words put a blush to her already smiling face, as he is just as bold as the original, but wouldn't stumble on his words and backtrack his statement about her looks. Why thank you? Padme replies. It would seem that you aren't the little boy I knew on Tatooine. You have become much more it would seem. Padme says looking him up and down subtlety. Anakin follows after everyone as they move over to sit down. I'm Captain Tifo of Her Majesty's Security Service. Queen Jamilia has been informed of your assignment. Tifo said as Anakin took a seat on the opposite side of Padme. I am grateful you are here Master Skywalker. The situation is more dangerous than the Senator will admit. Tifo continued. I don't need more security even though I like Arnie's presence. I need answers. Padme says showing her favorability for Anakin as she looks at Anakin. She questions him. I want to know who is trying to kill me. While my job is just to protect you, I would not mind finding out just who wants to assassinate you. I am afraid however that most of my time will be spent by your side. Anakin says smoothly making sure to let her know that he agreeing with her, but saying that it would be remiss of him to just leave on an investigation. Perhaps with merely your presence here, the mystery surrounding these attempts will be revealed. Padme says looking directly into Anakin's eyes mesmerized, now if you will excuse me, I will retire. She stands up and heads in another direction seemingly tired, but is unable to keep her eyes off of Anakin until she reluctantly has to turn her head. No one else in the room notices this however as Padme is good at motions and movements like this. It is quite possible however, that Anakin is the only one to see this blatant interest. I know I will feel better having you here. Tifo says as Anakin goes in the other direction followed by Jar Jar. I'll have an officer stationed on every floor, and I'll be in the control center downstairs. Tifo's goes his own way as Anakin is left with Jar Jar. Mesa Bustin with happiness seeing Yasa again, Ani. I would appreciate it if you wouldn't call me by that nickname. Anakin replies. Curious, Jar Jar asks why. Yasa don't like a Mesa using nickname Ani. Let's just say it is used in a more intimate context, and while I think of you as a friend Jar Jar, I don't think it is all that appropriate. Anakin gives his answer. Okie dokie, what does Yasa say? Jar Jar, then continues. It seems she's so happy about Yasa appearance. Happier than Mesa seeing her in a longo time. Jar Jar says. Do you mean Padme? Anakin asks. Yes. Jar Jar confirms. That is good to hear Jar Jar. I do believe I best be checking on the security here. Anakin starts to go off and start covering ground as he is by himself with no Obi-Wan to help him check everything. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.